Biscuits, Breakfast Cakes, and Shortcakes by Fanny Farmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Batters, Sponges, and Doughs. Batter is a mixture of flour and some liquid, usually combined with other ingredients as sugar, salt, eggs, etc., of consistency to pour easily or to drop from a spoon. Batters are termed thin or thick according to their consistency. Sponge is a batter to which yeast is added. Dough differs from batter inasmuch as it is stiff enough to be handled. Cream scones. Two cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, two teaspoons sugar, one half teaspoon salt, four tablespoons butter, two eggs, one third cup cream. Mix and sift together flour, baking powder, sugar, and salt. Rub in butter with tips of fingers. Add eggs well beaten and cream. Toss on a floured board, pat and roll to three-fourths inch in thickness. Cut in squares. Brush with white of egg, sprinkle with sugar, and bake in a hot oven 15 minutes. Baking powder biscuit one. Two cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one teaspoon salt one tablespoon lard, three-fourths cup milk and water in equal parts, one tablespoon butter. Mix dry ingredients and sift twice. Work in butter and lard with tips of fingers. Add gradually the liquid, mixing with knife to a soft dough. It is impossible to determine the exact amount of liquid owing to differences in flour. Toss on a floured board, pat and roll lightly to one-half inch in thickness. Shape with a biscuit cutter. Place on buttered pan and bake in hot oven 12 to 15 minutes. If baked in too slow an oven, the gas will escape before it has done its work. Many obtain better results by using bread flour. Baking powder biscuit 2. 2 cups flour, 4 teaspoons baking powder, 2 tablespoons butter, 3 quarter cup milk, 1 half teaspoon salt. Mix and bake as baking powder biscuit 1. Emergency biscuit. Use recipe for baking powder biscuit one or two with the addition of more milk. That mixture may be dropped from spoon without spreading. Drop by spoonfuls on a buttered pan one half inch apart. Brush over with milk and bake in hot oven eight minutes. Fruit rolls. Pinwheel biscuit. Two cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, two tablespoons sugar, two tablespoons butter, two thirds cup milk, one third cup stoned raisins finely chopped, two tablespoons citron finely chopped, one third teaspoon cinnamon. Mix as baking powder biscuit two. Roll to one fourth inch thickness, brush over with melted butter, and sprinkle with fruit, sugar, and cinnamon. Roll like a jelly roll, cut off pieces three fourths inch in thickness, place on buttered tin, and bake in hot oven 15 minutes. Currants may be used in place of raisins and citron. Twin Mountain Muffins One quarter cup butter, one quarter cup sugar, one egg, three quarter cup milk, two cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder. Cream the butter, add sugar and egg well beaten. Sift baking powder with flour and add to the first mixture. Alternating with milk. Bake in butter tin gem pans 25 minutes. One egg muffins, one. Three and a half cups flour, six teaspoons baking powder, one teaspoon salt. One and one third cups milk, three tablespoons melted butter, one egg, three tablespoons sugar. Mix and sift dry ingredients. Add gradually milk, egg, well beaten, and melted butter. Bake in buttered gem pans 25 minutes. If iron pans are used, they must be previously heated. This recipe makes 30 muffins. Use half the proportions given and a small egg if half the number is required. One egg muffins, two. Two cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, two tablespoons sugar, one cup milk, two tablespoons melted butter, one egg. Mix and bake as one egg muffin, one. Berry muffins, one, without eggs. Two cups flour, one quarter cup sugar, four teaspoons baking powder. 2 tablespoons butter, 1 cup milk, scant, 1 cup berries, 1 half teaspoon salt. Mix and sift dry ingredients, 
Work in butter with tips of fingers, add milk and berries. Berry muffins two. One quarter cup butter, one third cup sugar, one egg, two and two thirds cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, one cup milk, one cup berries. Cream the butter, add gradually sugar and egg well beaten. Mix and sift flour, baking powder and salt, reserving one fourth cup flour to be mixed with berries and added last, the remainder alternately with milk. Queen of Muffins one fourth cup butter, one third cup sugar, one egg, one half cup milk, scant, one and one half cups flour, two and one half teaspoons baking powder. Mix and bake same as twin mountain muffins. Rice muffins, two and one quarter cups flour, three quarter cup hot cooked rice, five teaspoons baking powder, two tablespoons sugar, one cup milk, one egg, two tablespoons melted butter, one half teaspoon salt. Mix and sift flour, sugar, salt, and baking powder. Add one half milk, egg well beaten, the remainder of the milk mixed with rice and beat thoroughly. Then add butter. Bake in buttered muffin rings placed in buttered pan or buttered gem pans. Oatmeal muffins. One cup cooked oatmeal, one and one half cups flour, two tablespoons sugar, four teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, one half cup milk, one egg, two tablespoons melted butter. Mix and bake as rice muffins. Graham muffins, one. One and one quarter cups graham flour, one cup flour, one cup sour milk. One third cup molasses, three quarter teaspoon soda, one teaspoon salt. Mix and sift dry ingredients, add milk to molasses and combine mixtures. Graham muffins, two. One cup graham or entire wheat flour, one cup flour, one quarter cup sugar one teaspoon salt, one cup milk, one egg, one to three tablespoons melted butter, four teaspoons baking powder. Mix and sift dry ingredients, add milk gradually, egg well beaten and melted butter. Bake in hot oven in buttered gem pans, 25 minutes. Rye muffins one. Make as graham muffins two, substituting rye meal for graham flour. Rye muffins two one and one quarter cups rye meal, one and one quarter cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one teaspoon salt, one fourth cup molasses, one and one quarter cups milk, one egg, one tablespoon melted butter. Mix and bake as graham muffins too, adding molasses with milk. Rye gems, one and two thirds cups rye flour, one and one third cups flour, four teaspoons baking powder, one teaspoon salt, one quarter cup molasses, one and one quarter cups milk, two eggs, three tablespoons melted butter. Mix and sift dry ingredients, add molasses, milk, eggs well beaten, and butter. Bake in hot oven in buttered gem pans, 25 minutes. Cornmeal gems, one half cup cornmeal, one cup flour, three teaspoons baking powder, one tablespoon sugar, one tablespoon melted butter, one half teaspoon salt, three-quarter cup milk, one egg. Mix and bake as graham muffins, two. Hominy gems. One-quarter cup hominy, one-half teaspoon salt, one-half cup boiling water, one cup scalded milk, one cup cornmeal, three tablespoons sugar, three tablespoons butter, two eggs, three teaspoons baking powder. Add hominy mixed with salt to boiling water and let stand until hominy absorbs water. Add scalded milk to cornmeal, then add sugar and butter. Combine mixtures, cool slightly, add yolks of eggs beaten until thick and whites of eggs beaten until stiff. Sift in baking powder and beat thoroughly. Bake in hot buttered gem pans. Berkshire muffins. One half cup cornmeal, one half cup flour, one half cup cooked rice, two tablespoons sugar, one half teaspoon salt, two-thirds cup scalded milk, scant, one egg, one tablespoon melted butter, three teaspoons baking powder. Turn scalded milk on meal, let stand five minutes. Add rice and flour mixed and sifted with remaining dry ingredients. Add yolk of egg well beaten, butter and white of egg beaten stiff and dry. Golden corn cake, three-quarter cup cornmeal, one and one-quarter cups flour, one-quarter cup sugar, five teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, one cup milk, 
one egg one or two tablespoons melted butter mix and sift dry ingredients add milk egg well beaten and butter bake in shallow buttered pan in hot oven 20 minutes corn cake sweetened with molasses one cup cornmeal three quarter cup flour three and a half teaspoons baking powder one teaspoon salt one quarter cup molasses three quarter cup milk one egg one tablespoon melted butter mix and bake as golden corn cake adding molasses to milk white corn cake one quarter cup butter one half cup sugar one and one third cups milk whites of three eggs one and one quarter cups white corn meal one and one quarter cups flour four teaspoons baking powder one teaspoon salt cream the butter add sugar gradually add milk alternating with dry ingredients mixed and sifted beat thoroughly add whites of eggs beaten stiff bake in buttered cake pan 30 minutes rich corn cake one cup cornmeal one cup white flour four teaspoons baking powder one quarter cup sugar one half teaspoon salt seven eighths cup milk two eggs one quarter cup melted butter mix and sift dry ingredients add milk gradually eggs well beaten and butter bake in a buttered shallow pan in a hot oven susie's spider corn cake one and one quarter cups cornmeal two cups sour milk one teaspoon soda one teaspoon salt two eggs two tablespoons butter mix salt soda and cornmeal gradually add eggs well beaten and milk heat frying pan grease sides and bottom of pan with butter turn in the mixture place on middle grate in hot oven and cook 20 minutes white cornmeal cake one cup scalded milk one half cup white cornmeal one teaspoon salt add salt to cornmeal and pour on gradually milk turn into a buttered shallow pan to the depth of one fourth inch bake in a moderate oven until crisp split and spread with butter popovers one cup flour one fourth teaspoon salt seven eighths cup milk two eggs one half teaspoon melted butter mix salt and flour add milk gradually in order to obtain a smooth batter add egg beaten until light and butter beat two minutes using dover egg beater turn into hissing hot buttered iron gem pans and bake 30 to 35 minutes in a hot oven they may be baked in buttered earthen cups when the bottom will have a glazed appearance small round iron gem pans are best for popovers graham popovers two-thirds cup entire wheat flour one-third cup flour one quarter teaspoon salt seven-eighths cup milk one egg one half teaspoon melted butter prepare and bake as popovers breakfast puffs one cup flour one half cup milk one half cup water mix milk and water add gradually to flour and beat with dover egg beater until very light bake same as popovers fadges one cup entire wheat flour one cup cold water add water gradually to flour and beat with dover egg beater until very light bake same as popovers sante muffins one half cup butter three quarter cup sugar three eggs one and one half cups milk two cups cornmeal one cup flour one teaspoon salt five teaspoons baking powder one half cup currants cream the butter add sugar gradually eggs well beaten and milk then add dry ingredients mixed and sifted and currants bake in buttered individual tins maryland biscuit one pint flour one third cup lard one teaspoon salt milk and water in equal quantities southern pupil mix and sift flour and salt work in lard with tips of fingers and moisten to a stiff dough toss on slightly floured board and beat with rolling pin 30 minutes continually folding over the dough roll one-third inch in thickness shape with round cutter two inches in diameter prick with fork and place on a buttered tin bake 20 minutes in hot oven griddle cakes sour milk griddle cakes two and one half cups flour one half teaspoon salt two cups sour milk one and one quarter teaspoon soda one egg mix and sift flour salt and soda add sour milk and egg well beaten drop by spoonfuls on a greased hot griddle cook on one side 
when puffed full of bubbles and cooked on edges turn and cook other side serve with butter and maple syrup sweet milk griddle cakes three cups flour one and one half tablespoons baking powder one teaspoon salt one quarter cup sugar two cups milk one egg two tablespoons melted butter mix and sift dry ingredients beat egg add milk and pour slowly on first mixture beat thoroughly and add butter cook same as sour milk griddle cakes begin cooking cakes at once or more baking powder will be required entire wheat griddle cakes one half cup entire wheat flour one cup flour three teaspoons baking powder one half teaspoon salt three tablespoons sugar one egg one and one quarter cups milk one tablespoon melted butter prepare and cook same as sweet milk griddle cakes corn griddle cakes two cups flour one half cup corn meal one and one half tablespoons baking powder one and one half teaspoons salt one third cup sugar one and one half cups boiling water one and one quarter cups milk one egg two tablespoons melted butter add meal to boiling water and boil five minutes turn into bowl add milk and remaining dry ingredients mixed and sifted then the egg well beaten and butter cook same as other griddle cakes rice griddle cakes one two and one half cups flour one half cup cold cooked rice one tablespoon baking powder one half teaspoon salt one quarter cup sugar one and a half cups milk one egg two tablespoons melted butter mix and sift dry ingredients work in rice with tips of fingers add egg well beaten milk and butter cook same as other griddle cakes rice griddle cakes two one cup milk one cup warm boiled rice one half teaspoon salt yolks two eggs whites two eggs one tablespoon melted butter seven eighths cup flour pour milk over rice and salt add yolks of eggs beaten until thick and lemon color butter flour and fold in whites of eggs beaten until stiff and dry bread griddle cakes one and one half cups fine stale bread crumbs one and one half cups scalded milk two tablespoons butter two eggs one half cup flour one half teaspoon salt four teaspoons baking powder add milk and butter to crumbs and soak until crumbs are soft add eggs well beaten then flour salt and baking powder mixed and sifted cook same as other griddle cakes buckwheat cakes one third cup fine bread crumbs two cups scalded milk one half teaspoon salt one quarter yeast cake one half cup lukewarm water one and three quarter cups buckwheat flour one tablespoon molasses pour milk over crumbs and soak 30 minutes add salt yeast cake dissolved in lukewarm water and buckwheat to make a batter thin enough to pour let rise overnight in the morning stir well add molasses one fourth teaspoon soda dissolved in one fourth cup lukewarm water and cook same as griddle cakes save enough batter to raise another mixing instead of using yeast cake it will require one half cup waffles one and three quarter cups flour three teaspoons baking powder one half teaspoon salt one cup milk yolks two eggs whites two eggs one tablespoon melted butter mix and sift dry ingredients add milk gradually yolks of eggs well beaten butter and whites of eggs beaten stiff cook on a greased hot waffle iron serve with maple syrup a waffle iron should fit closely on range be well heated on one side turned heated on other side and thoroughly greased before iron is filled in filling put a tablespoonful of mixture in each compartment near center of iron cover and mixture will spread to just fill iron if sufficiently heated it should be turned almost as soon as filled and covered in using a new iron special care must be taken in greasing or waffles will stick waffles with boiled cider follow directions for making waffles serve with boiled cider allow twice as much cider as sugar and let boil until of a syrup consistency rice waffles one and three quarter cups flour two-thirds cup cold cooked rice one and one half cups milk two tablespoons sugar four teaspoons baking powder one quarter teaspoon salt one tablespoon melted butter one egg 
mix and sift dry ingredients work in rice with tips of fingers add milk yolk of egg well beaten butter and white of egg beaten stiff cook same as waffles virginia waffles one and one half cups boiling water one half cup white corn meal one and one half cups milk three cups flour three tablespoons sugar one and one quarter tablespoons baking powder one and one half teaspoons salt yolks two eggs whites two eggs two tablespoons melted butter cook meal in boiling water twenty minutes add milk dry ingredients mixed and sifted yolks of eggs well beaten butter and whites of eggs beaten stiff cook same as waffles raised waffles one and three quarter cups milk one teaspoon salt one tablespoon butter one quarter yeast cake one quarter cup lukewarm water two cups flour yolks two eggs whites two eggs scald milk add salt and butter and when lukewarm add yeast cake dissolved in water and flour beat well let rise overnight add yolks of eggs well beaten and whites of eggs beaten stiff cook same as waffles by using a whole yeast cake the mixture will rise in one and one half hours fried drop cakes one and one third cup flour two and a half teaspoons baking powder one quarter teaspoon salt one third cup sugar one half cup milk one egg one teaspoon melted butter beat egg until light add milk dry ingredients mixed and sifted and melted butter drop by spoonfuls in hot new deep fat fry until light brown and cook through which must at first be determined by piercing with a skewer or breaking apart remove with a skimmer and drain on brown paper rye drop cakes two-thirds cup rye meal two-thirds cup flour two and one half teaspoons baking powder one half teaspoon salt two tablespoons molasses one half cup milk one egg mix and sift dry ingredients add milk gradually molasses and egg well beaten cook same as fried drop cakes raised doughnuts one cup milk one quarter yeast cake one quarter cup lukewarm water one teaspoon salt one third cup butter and lard mixed one cup light brown sugar two eggs one half grated nutmeg flour scald and cool milk when lukewarm add the yeast cake dissolved in water salt and flour enough to make a stiff batter let rise overnight in morning add shortening melted sugar eggs well beaten nutmeg and enough flour to make a stiff dough let rise again and if too soft to handle add more flour toss on floured board pat and roll to three-fourths inch thickness shape with cutter and work between hands until round place on floured board let rise one hour turn and let rise again fry in deep fat and drain on brown paper cool and roll in powdered sugar doughnuts one one cup sugar two and one half tablespoons butter three eggs one cup milk four teaspoons baking powder one quarter teaspoon cinnamon one quarter teaspoon grated nutmeg one and one half teaspoon salt flour to roll cream the butter and add one half sugar beat egg until light add remaining sugar and combine mixtures add three and one half cups flour mixed and sifted with baking powder salt and spices then enough more flour to make dough stiff enough to roll toss one-third of mixture on floured board knead slightly pat and roll out to one-fourth inch thickness shape with a doughnut cutter fry in deep fat take up on a skewer and drain on brown paper add trimmings to one-half remaining mixture roll shape and fry as before repeat doughnuts should come quickly to top of fat brown on one side then be turned to brown on the other avoid turning more than once the fat must be kept at a uniform temperature if too cold doughnuts will absorb fat if too hot doughnuts will brown before sufficiently risen see rule for testing fat doughnuts two four cups flour one and one half teaspoons salt one and three quarter teaspoons soda one and three quarter teaspoons cream of tartar one quarter teaspoon grated nutmeg one quarter teaspoon cinnamon one half tablespoon butter one cup sugar one cup sour milk one egg put flour in shallow pan add salt soda cream of tartar and spices 
work in butter with tips of fingers add sugar egg well beaten and sour milk stir thoroughly and toss on board thickly dredged with flour knead slightly using more flour if necessary pat and roll out to one-fourth inch thickness shape fry and drain sour milk doughnuts may be turned as soon as they come to top of fat and frequently afterwards doughnuts three two cups sugar four eggs one and one-third cups sour milk four tablespoons melted butter two teaspoons soda two teaspoons salt two teaspoons baking powder one teaspoon grated nutmeg flour mix ingredients in order given shape fry and drain crullers one-fourth cup butter one cup sugar yolks two eggs whites two eggs four cups flour one quarter teaspoon grated nutmeg three and a half teaspoons baking powder one cup milk powdered sugar and cinnamon cream the butter add sugar gradually yolks of eggs well beaten and whites of eggs beaten stiff mix flour nutmeg and baking powder add alternately with milk to first mixture toss on floured board roll thin and cut in pieces three inches long by two inches wide make four one inch parallel gashes crosswise at equal intervals take up by running finger in and out of gashes and lower into deep fat fry same as doughnuts one strawberry shortcake one two cups flour four teaspoons baking powder one half teaspoon salt two teaspoons sugar three quarter cup milk one quarter cup butter mix dry ingredients sift twice work in butter with tips of fingers and add milk gradually toss on floured board divide in two parts pat roll out and bake 12 minutes in a hot oven in buttered washington pie or round layer cake tins split and spread with butter sweeten strawberries to taste place on back of range until warmed crush slightly and put between and on top of shortcakes cover top with cream sauce one strawberry shortcake two two cups flour four teaspoons baking powder one half teaspoon salt one tablespoon sugar one third cup butter three quarter cup milk mix same as strawberry shortcake one toss and roll on floured board put in round butter tin and shape with back of hand to fit pan rich strawberry shortcake two cups flour one quarter cup sugar four teaspoons baking powder one half teaspoon salt few grains nutmeg one egg one third cup butter one and one quarter tablespoons lard one third cup milk mix dry ingredients and sift twice work in shortening with tips of fingers an egg well beaten and milk bake same as strawberry shortcake two split cake and spread under layer with cream sauce two cover with strawberries which have been sprinkled with powdered sugar again spread with sauce and cover with upper layer fruit shortcake one quarter cup batter one half cup sugar one egg one quarter cup milk one cup flour two teaspoons baking powder one quarter teaspoon salt cream the butter add sugar gradually an egg well beaten mix and sift flour baking powder and salt adding alternately with milk to first mixture beat thoroughly and bake in a buttered round tin cool spread thickly with sweetened fruit and cover with cream sauce one or two fresh strawberries peaches apricots raspberries or canned quince or pineapple may be used when canned goods are used drain fruit from syrup and cut in pieces dilute cream for cream sauce with fruit syrup in place of milk any shortcake mixture may be made for individual service by shaping with a large biscuit cutter or mixture may be baked in a shallow cake pan center removed and filled with fruit and pieces baked separately to introduce to represent handles end of breakfast cakes biscuits and shortcakes by fanny farmer read by betty b part one of the counter reformation in scandinavia and poland by martin philipson from the history of all nations from earliest times volume twelve the religious wars translated under the supervision of john henry wright this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by piotr natter 
the reform movement had swept like a rushing flood over all the nations of the west and it seemed for a while as if nothing could withstand its course but in the midst of the long stagnant waters of the old faith there arose a counter-current which grew more and more rapid and powerful until it met the other with strength equal to its own the struggle which resulted fills the history of the latter half of the sixteenth century it required a mighty and costly contest before two hostile elements neither of which could subdue the other suddenly gave up the effort and took each its separate course in august fifteen sixty gustavus vaza the founder of sweden's greatness and of its protestantism was succeeded on the throne by his eldest son eric the fourteenth the new king was a dignified man twenty-six years of age and a good orator poet musician painter and linguist but all these advantages that would have adorned a private gentleman did not make him a good ruler he lacked discretion and was now passionate and impulsive and then weak and discouraged without strength or steadiness of resolution gustavus had observed this disposition of his eldest born with profound concern but the measures to which he had resorted to correct the evil had only made it worse he had assigned to each of his younger sons a separate duchy to john finland to magnus east gotland to charles sudermanland these districts held ambiguous relations to the crown in internal affairs they were independent of the king but in general they were still subject to him and to the diet these uncertain conditions inevitably led to conflicts between eric and his younger brothers the prospect of this was doubly discouraging at a time when the peace of the realm was at best precarious divided as it was between the still numerous and devoted adherents of catholicism and the imperfectly organized protestants eric first sought and with success a counterpoise to his brothers in the nobles whom he set himself to win by all sorts of favors he established the dignities of count and baron hitherto unknown in sweden and by this means founded that higher nobility which later on was to become so dangerous to royalty he confirmed the protestant character of the religious constitution of the realm the restless character of this unfortunate prince who had a decided tendency to insanity soon manifested itself at great cost he sent emissaries to scotland england and numerous german courts to woo him a wife with inadequate resources he contended with the russians and the poles for the possession of the baltic provinces and in fifteen sixty one succeeded in gaining the city of reval and estonia this was the first conquest of sweden beyond the baltic and the beginning of a struggle that extended over a century and a half then he began to quarrel with his brothers he caused the oldest of them john of finland to be condemned to death for high treason and imprisoned him and his wife in fifteen sixty three in the strong castle of gripsholm magnus of east gotland whom eric had compelled to assist him against john went mad with excitement and regret charles of sudermanland was saved from a similar fate only by his extreme youth he was only in his thirteenth year rid of the fear of his brethren the king now gave full course to his tyrannical and cruel temper urged thereto by the ambitious and bloodthirsty Guren person he was constantly surrounded by spies who supplied him with victims within five years two hundred and thirty-two persons were executed for political offences many of them on absurd charges brought against them by person as public prosecutor eric the fourteenth considering himself now firmly established on his throne renewed the war against denmark in fifteen sixty three where king frederick the second fifteen fifty nine to fifteen eighty eight with the aid of his minister peter oxe was giving the people an excellent administration affording wise and generous protection to commerce and industry and managing public finance with great skill numerous fugitives from the netherlands had settled among the danes and brought them an increase of industrial prosperity and of trained ability frederick the second a peaceable and not very forcible prince was hardly able to cope on equal terms with warlike sweden and her excellent fleet but eric insisted on conducting the campaign in person 
and proved to be equally cowardly and incompetent, so that the war degenerated into a series of ruthless plundering expeditions, in which Norway and the frontier districts of Sweden suffered terribly. The discontent already existing in this country was increased by the insane cruelty with which the king, who thought himself constantly beset by conspirators, proceeded against suspects of high and low degree. In May 1567 he caused the first lords of the realm, and among them the patriotic Sture family, to be cast into prison and there murdered. He showed ever-increasing signs of insanity. Soon afterward he liberated his brother John from the captivity in Gripsholm on certain conditions, one of which was that he should recognize Eric's mistress, Catherine Mansdochter, as queen, and her children as legitimate. In 1568 he actually married this woman, the daughter of a corporal. Such a misalliance, together with the disgraceful defeats Eric had suffered at the hands of the Danes, roused the Swedish people to open rebellion. Dukes John and Charles put themselves at the head of malcontents, and in September 1568 Eric, abandoned by nearly all his servants, had to surrender. The estates of the realm, in the beginning of the year 1569, deposed him and condemned him to be kept for life in royal imprisonment. His children, as base-born, were excluded from the succession. John cruelly misused his authority. The unfortunate Eric was kept in the harshest captivity, separated from his wife and children, and in the case of a rising in his favor, threatened with immediate death. No wonder that Eric, whose mind had long been diseased, had frequent attacks of delirium. Finally, John had him poisoned, February 1577, in the forty-fourth years of his age. Contrary to his agreement with his brother, Charles of Sudermanland, John received homage as sole king, John III, and his son Sigismund was acknowledged as his heir and successor in 1569. Like Eric at the beginning of his reign, he sought to lean upon the nobles, whose authority over the peasants he considerably enlarged, giving the higher nobility complete jurisdiction over their subjects. As the Russians were threatening war, John concluded, at Stettin in 1570, a peace with the Danes, which imposed considerable money burdens on Sweden. Hostilities with Russia were carried on without definite results. John attempted to bring Sweden back to Catholicism. Many circumstances favoured this undertaking. Gustavus had never expressly severed his connection with the Catholic Church, and he had retained the episcopal organisation and much of the old ceremonial. Great confusion had arisen out of this ambiguous attitude. Church estates had been plundered, the priesthood had been recruited in part from unworthy elements, and preaching and the care of souls had been greatly neglected. Many might properly ask themselves whether the change of religion were really for the better. John was urged also to oppose Lutheranism by his Polish wife Catherine, of the Jagiellon family, who had been brought up a Catholic, and who, as she had voluntarily shared her husband's captivity, exercised considerable influence over him. She corresponded regularly with the Polish cardinal Stanislaus Hosius, a learned, pious, and zealous prelate, who had done much to win back the nobles of his country to Catholicism, and who desired to render a like service in Sweden. He showed the Queen how, under the pretense of giving instruction in Lutheranism, they might gradually bring back clergy and people to the Orthodox fold. He sent her the Jesuit, Stanislaus Varsevich, who, in 1574, reached Stockholm in disguise, and afterward two more who had been trained in Louvain, one a Netherlander and other a Norwegian, who stole into Sweden as evangelical preachers. The year before, 1575, Laurentius Petrigothus, a pliable man, had been appointed Archbishop of Uppsala, and had declared himself in favour of the restoration of convents, the worship of saints, and the resumption of the old ceremonial. They proceeded step by step in this reactionary work, for it did not seem prudent, considering the temper of the people, to try to accomplish it at one stroke. Under the guidance of his Jesuits, John and his ministers prepared a liturgy in Latin side by side with Swedish, based as a whole on the Missal of the Council of Trent. Finally, when an embassy was sent to Rome, the Pope sent to Sweden, under the protecting title of Imperial Legate, 
the Mantuan Jesuit Antonio Possevin, one of the most talented and learned members of the order. It was about the time of Eric's murder. Possevin seized upon this and impressed upon John's mind that only by a penitent profession of the faith of the only true church could he escape eternal damnation for that fratricide. Therefore John secretly embraced Catholicism at Vachtena in 1578. After this the counter-reformation went on at a more rapid rate. Favoured by the king, the Jesuits obtained many pupils, and Catholicism made startling progress among the clergy. Those who resisted were deprived of their places. Canon law was declared to be binding on the Swedish church. John mourned over the fate of his father Gustavus, condemned to eternal woe because of his recreancy. Still he had deemed certain concessions advisable, such as allowing priests to marry, administering the communion in both kinds, the celebration of public worship in the national tongue. They had to do with forms merely, not at all with the doctrines of the church. To obtain the Pope's sanction for them, Possevin went to Rome. He was entrusted by John, besides, with messages to the most powerful sovereigns of Europe. A few months later, the Jesuit returned, clothed with the dignity of apostolic vicar for Scandinavia and the adjoining countries. He was authorized, on behalf of Philip II, to make to John the most brilliant promises, if he would publicly acknowledge Catholicism as his religion and that of his realm. On the other hand, Possevin was to report to the king that the Pope could not, under any circumstances, agree to the concessions he had proposed. John, who looked upon these as necessary to gain Sweden, was not a little displeased by this. Political difficulties were added to his troubles. He had hoped, by the aid of the Pope, to make good the claims of his wife to certain domains in South Italy. He had also, a matter of much more consequence, requested the Pope's intercession on behalf of Sweden at the conclusion of a peace between Russia and Poland. But now he learned that the Italian duchies were out of the question, and Possevin himself brought about, in 1582, a peace between Russia and Poland, in which the latter renewed her claims even to the Swedish possessions in Estonia. When the Jesuit returned to Stockholm, he was received in a friendly way at first, but the wind had shifted. With the death of the Queen, in 1583, the Jesuits lost their last support as well as their most influential protector, and were banished from the kingdom. Yet John, like Henry VIII of England, wished to hold an intermediate ground, and sturdily retained his Catholicizing liturgy in the face of all opposition. He quarrelled, moreover, with his brother, Charles of Sudermanland, once John had been the zealous defender of ducal rights. Now that he was king, he sought to limit Charles's independence as much as possible. Charles assumed the part of champion of orthodox Lutheranism against John's counter-reformation, and declared himself intensely opposed to the king's red book, as he called the new liturgy. His duchy became the refuge of all loyal Protestants who fled from John's persecution. The clergymen deposed by the king were sure to find good positions with the duke. The sympathies of the majority in Sweden were undoubtedly on Charles's side. Uprisings against the king's religious measures had already taken place in Stockholm. These things induced John to proceed more guardedly. Meanwhile, the house of Vasa was called to ascend one more step to power and greatness, the Poles offered their royal crown to Sigismund, John's son. This meant, it must be acknowledged, but little real authority. In the second half of the 15th century, the power of the nobles had so increased in Poland as to leave the crown only a personal influence. The Diet of Piotrków, in 1496, had completed the humiliation of the crown by excluding commoners altogether from the higher ecclesiastical dignities and reducing all non-noble countrymen to actual serfdom. The king was bound in every political decision by the advice of the council of 146 dignitaries who made up the senate. The former general meetings of the nobility had been replaced by a representative diet. But what in other countries had had a most beneficial influence was to Poland only a source of new evils. For every palatinate, district, in its special diet, Diatine, enjoined upon its nuncios or representatives an imperative mandate 
for the faithful carrying out of which they were to render strict account on their return from the national diet. The federal character of the Polish state was kept up until its downfall, especially as Prussia and Lithuania kept aloof from the Polish diet. A policy of compromise, conciliation, and a fair consideration of the rights of the minority was made altogether impossible by this mandate system. The minority, therefore, helped itself by assuming the right of confederation, that is, of banding together to resist the Diet and its decisions. Force, in the form of civil war, had then to decide. The Confederates did not consider themselves as rebels, nor were they so considered by others. The Crown lost the right to decide on peace or war. This caricature of a constitution was to have results the more disastrous as the Turks on the south and the Muscovites under Ivan the Third and Fourth on the east were pressing upon Poland. Nothing but the wild valour of the Polish nobles could temporarily heal or conceal the deep wounds which their unlimited lawlessness inflicted upon their native country. In the year 1506, Sigismund I had ascended the throne. He was a wise, clear-minded, active, and just ruler, and a valiant warrior, the very king needed by Poland, threatened as she was by numerous enemies. The name of great bestowed upon him is certainly not undeserved. At the outset he was involved in a war with Russia, a war which, with occasional interruptions, was to last two centuries. He also had to repulse the Tartars, who made a devastating raid into Poland. He held his own against both his foes. The Tartars he defeated so completely at Wisniewiec in 1512 that they are said to have left 24,000 on the battlefield. Over the Russians he won a brilliant victory at Orsha in 1514. A new antagonist arose in the Teutonic order, eager to free itself from the burden of Polish suzerainty. But the knights were unsuccessful, and their Grand Master, Albert of Brandenburg was glad to conclude with Sigismund the Peace of Krakow in 1525, by which East Prussia became a temporal duchy, a fief of the Polish crown, and Albert, as its hereditary duke, was given the foremost place among the Polish senators. The same year Sigismund obtained still another advantage. The Piast branch of the Dukes of Mazovia became extinct, and their important territory, embracing Warsaw, Płock, Pułtusk, was united to the Polish kingdom, of which it had hitherto been independent. Poland was rid of the Tartars by the pressure of the Turks upon them, and the treaty which Sigismund concluded with the latter ensured him security against those robbers, in 1546. With the Russians, in spite of occasional armistices, the struggle was continued, but on the whole it resulted favorably to the Poles. In the midst of all these military enterprises, Sigismund found time to foster learning, to encourage agriculture and industry, to free the navigable streams of tolls, and to redeem numerous royal estates and sources of income that his predecessors had pawned. It was he who gave a permanent organization to the Zaporozhian Cossacks along the rapids of the Dnieper, and made of these bold warriors an excellent defense against the Tartars. It must be said, however, that the peasantry, the Kmiets, were more completely enslaved under his reign than before, and deprived even of the right to send their children to school or to have them taught a trade. In his old age, he died at eighty-two, he fell entirely under the influence of his wife, Bona Sforza, a daughter of the ducal house of Milan, who provoked many uprisings by her intrigues and her fierce attacks against the rights of the nobles. Sigismund I died on April the 1st, 1548, in the midst of general discontent. His only son, Sigismund II, increased the dissatisfaction of the nobility by ratifying publicly a secret marriage he had contracted with Barbara Radziwiłł, and thus, in appearance at least, assigning to her family a position far above that of the other nobles. By this time, the Great Reformation movement had reached Poland. It had won adherents among the German burghers of West Prussia immediately after Luther's first open declarations. In Danzig, as early as 1524, there had been an uprising of the Lutherans, who had driven out the old city council and forcibly suppressed the Catholic worship. For this conduct, they had been cruelly punished by Sigismund I. 
but this prince had not otherwise interfered with the evangelicals whose number was steadily increasing he was rather indifferent in matters of religion satisfying himself with the mere show of zealous orthodoxy i am he used to say king of the sheep as well as of the goats the hussite ideas that had taken firm hold of many polish minds the abuses of which the catholic clergy were guilty in poland no less than elsewhere the universal intellectual movement which since the latter half of the fifteenth century had from italy spread all over europe the desire of a numerous and greedy nobility to possess themselves of the estates of the church and the dream of a national polish church had all contributed to forward the reformation movement sigismund i gave his consent to the establishment of a protestant university in konigsberg in fifteen forty four and it soon flooded poland with bibles and polemical writings in the national tongue luther's works were openly sold in the university of cracow and everywhere greedily read the confessor of queen bonasforza lismanini took pains to circulate all anti-papal books published in europe other foreign clergymen became apostles of the new faith and of even bolder doctrines which found ready acceptance among the impressionable slavs a netherlander pastoris by name taught quite independently of lelio and fausto sozzini Socinus, the rejection of the trinity and a community of unitarians was secretly formed in cracow numerous students went to the german universities and returned confirmed lutherans even polish priests and theological professors in the university of cracow preached under the protection of the nobles against catholic dogmas the moravian brethren driven out of their country won over to their doctrine a considerable portion of greater poland including the most distinguished noble families such was the situation of affairs at the death of sigismund i transylvania also poland's neighbor had almost wholly ceased to be catholic its inhabitants were either lutherans or anti-trinitarians the reform found its way even into russia not in moscow alone but far beyond this capital along the volga and in distant north it found ardent adherents this religious movement was quickly suppressed in russia proper but in poland it grew more and more powerful sigismund the second augustus a brilliant and accomplished sovereign was openly inclined to protestantism lismanini brought him a copy of calvin's institution which the king and his friend francis krasinski bishop of cracow set themselves eagerly to study together with the works of luther and melancton sigismund even corresponded with the genevese reformer but he was too politic and not sufficiently devout to declare himself outright for protestantism before the majority of his people had done so his attitude however encouraged the innovators and in the first years of his reign noblemen banished catholic priests monks and nuns from their estates and established the protestant worship such a state of things was extremely unwelcome to the polish clergy in fifteen fifty one they assembled together as a national council under the presidency of the archbishop of gnezen as primate of poland here for the first time appeared prominently the man that was to be the stay of catholicism in the east nicholas hosius son of a burgher of cracow who after a brilliant course of study at padua had been appointed bishop of ermeland and had succeeded in keeping his see free from the inroads of heresy he was a man of great learning spotless life profound convictions and judicious moderation at the synod of 1551 he introduced a confession of faith to which all clergymen were required to subscribe under the influence of the papal court the synod determined to assume an aggressive course and to cite before ecclesiastical courts all heretical noblemen and clergymen such violent measures only provoked the spirit of independence from the nobles whose representatives at the national diet of fifteen fifty two appeared with the sharpest arraignment of the higher clergy a pronounced and zealous favourer of the reform rafael leszczyński was elected president of the diet the king and he agreed that henceforth all authority to impose any kind of temporal penalties should be withheld from the clergy the cause of the reformation found two prominent champions in the highest circles of the state john waski and nicholas radziwill the former a nephew of the primate of poland 
had formed intimate relations with Erasmus and the reformers during his journeys in Europe, and, when once won over to the new doctrines, had renounced the most brilliant prospects of ecclesiastical preferment to devote himself to evangelical work in England and Germany. He loved, above all, the moderate views and the noble ritual of Anglicanism, and sought to found in his native land and national church after its pattern. Nicholas Radziwiu, cousin of the Queen, was Chancellor of Lithuania, Palatine of Vilna, and a man of enormous wealth. His conversion exercised a most powerful influence on the Lithuanian nobility, so that they, almost without exception, left the Church of Rome. His early death, in 1565, alone saved the old faith from total extinction in that province. A measure intended by Pope Paul IV to bring Poland back to Romanism had exactly the contrary effect. He sent thither as nuncio one of the most virulent church zealots, Lippomani, who was, above all, to prevent the convening of the impartial national council which the Polish nation so much desired. This blow in the face of public opinion embittered the Polish nobility to such a degree that the nuncio was received at the Diet with insulting remarks. Some bloody persecutions, initiated by Lippomani with the aid of some fanatical grandees, increased the wrath against him to such a pitch that his life was in danger and he had to leave the kingdom in 1556. It is evident that if Sigismund II had placed himself at the head of the reform movement, he could easily have established a Polish national church after the pattern of that of England, and thus given his people and his state increased firmness and stability. But he did not possess the required strength of character to take so important a step. With his philosophic scepticism, he let things have their course, and allied himself to the party which seemed for the moment to offer him the greatest advantages. Then Paul's successor, Pius IV, fulfilled at last the wish of all devout Catholics by reassembling the Council of Trent. In 1563, the year of the final closing of the Council of Trent, the Polish Diet renewed its request for an impartial Polish National Synod, and the Primate, the Archbishop of Gnezen, Uchański, a favorer of the Reformation, was inclined to concede that demand. But then came the shrewd Commandone as papal nuncio, and in private conversations depicted to the king the dangers that would arise from the meeting of a synod at which the most various and opposite sects would have a hearing. It could lead to nothing short of general confusion. He called his attention to the steadiness and uniformity that prevailed in the Catholic Church, to the principle of authority that controlled it. Sigismund had another reason still to court favor with Rome. His second marriage had been barren, as well as his first, and threatened the Jagiellon dynasty with extinction. He wished to obtain a divorce from Barbara Radziwiu so as to contract a third marriage. To this end he needed the Pope hence his sudden return to Catholicism. How like in selfish lack of principle and conscience to his contemporary Maximilian II! He and Commendone secured official recognition in Poland for the decrees of the Council of Trent. At first this was simply on paper. In reality, perfect religious liberty still prevailed. Sigismund, however, reaped the fruits of his subserviency to the nuncio. The church granted him a divorce from Barbara, and he contracted a third marriage with Catherine, widow of the Duke of Mantua. The Protestants were not dismayed by this change on the part of the king, but sought safety in closer union. In 1555 the Moravian brethren, or Valdenses in Greater Poland, who differed from the Calvinists only with regard to the consecration of priests, had united at Kozminek with the Reformed, to the great joy of the Genovese reformer and his principal disciples in Europe. Then these two sects, now acting in common, sought to effect a compromise with the Lutherans, who were numerous, especially in the German portions of West Prussia and in Greater Poland. The Lutherans, with their bigoted literalness and complacency, resisted a long time, but finally yielded in 1570. Then, on April the 14th, the representatives of the three Protestant confessions, the foremost ecclesiastics and most influential nobles, came to an agreement at Sandomir, the so-called Consensus Sandomiriensis, which, by allowing each one his special form of faith 
and only aiming at embracing all Protestants in a spiritual communion, doubled the power and influence of the reformers. Several bishops now openly expressed their adherence, a matter of very great importance, as the bishops had a seat in the Senate, the Diet of Poland, where already most secular members were either Reformed or Greek Catholics. This epoch is the climax of Polish Protestantism. It had then two thousand churches. Most of the nobility belonged to it. Its schools and printing presses spread far and wide its doctrines, besides an abundance of information on other subjects. Numerous foreign religious fugitives from Germany, France, Italy, and even Scotland settled in this promised land of freedom. The final victory of the new faith in Poland appeared almost certain, even to its opponents. While the religious parties were fighting their quarrels, Sigismund II had obtained important diplomatic and military successes, which make his reign one of the most memorable in Polish annals. He won brilliant victories over the Hospodar of Wallachia, and forced him to surrender considerable parts of his territory. His conquests in Livonia, on the Baltic Sea, were far more valuable. The Teutonic Order, at the beginning of the 16th century, held the former possessions of the Order of the Sword, Livonia, Estonia, and Kurland, which it entrusted to the administration of a special commander. At the time of the Reformation, this commander was the heroic Walter of Plattenburg, who, on the secularization of the order in Prussia, separated from Prussia, and, in spite of the inroads of Protestantism into his territory, remained loyal to the old faith. He succeeded in repelling the attacks of external foes, but with his death the prosperity of the order passed away. In 1554, freedom of worship had to be conceded to the Protestants, and by this act, the connection with the rest of the order in Germany was sundered. In the states of the order, the ruling caste of Germans was but a small minority in the midst of a mass of Finns and Lithuanians who lived in servile degradation. The knights were far from really controlling the whole country. The Archbishop of Riga and his four suffragan bishops enjoyed virtual independence in their sees. The important cities of Dorpat, Riga and Reval, members of the Hanseatic League, constituted little republics of a pronounced Protestant type. Moreover, the country gentry in each of the three lands formed a corporation of their own, which still further curtailed the power of the nominal masters. Such a loose structure must break down at the first serious attack. In the year 1558, Tsar Ivan IV the Terrible attacked and defeated the forces of the order and overran their territory. It seemed as if it was to remain a prey for the Muscovites. The Grand Master, Godard Kettler, tried to save for himself what could still be saved from the general wreck, and following the example of Albert of Brandenburg, concluded at Vilna a treaty with Sigismund Augustus, which surrendered Livonia to the Poles. The master himself laid aside the habit of the order and became, as a Protestant, Duke of Kurland and Semgallen, under the suzerainty of Poland, in 1568. But the Lithuanian nobles of Estonia, who would have nothing to do with the Catholic Poles, transferred their allegiance to Sweden, together with the town of Reval. Sigismund dreaded these adversaries far less than he did the Tsar, whom he had robbed of his expected prey. To guard against him and retain his new conquests, he created a standing army which was called the Quartians, because it was maintained and paid by means of one-fourth part of the royal revenues. The war with Russia broke out immediately, but in spite of a few losses, the Poles maintained themselves in their new conquests till 1568, when an armistice put an end to hostilities for a while. Sigismund had thus made the largest addition to the Polish territory which it had ever received. It extended from the shores of the Gulf of Finland to the Dniester, and from the mouth of the Netze in the west to the Desna in the east. Sigismund Augustus, whose third marriage was also childless, and who looked forward with dread to the dangers to which the extinction of his dynasty must expose his vast empire, sought to provide against them as far as possible by strengthening it internally. Till then, the two great divisions of his realm, Poland and Lithuania, had been bound together only by personal union. He laboured with laudable zeal to bring about between them a real union, 
and also to induce the Prussian nobility to attend the Diet. He met with decided opposition in this endeavour. Prussia was unwilling to surrender the independence which the treaties ensured to her in all internal affairs. Neither the Catholic nor the Protestant Lithuanians were disposed to renounce a glorious record of national existence extending back over centuries, and the numerous Russians in the Grand Principality, who were members of the Greek Church, were reluctant to accede to the king's wishes on account of the important question of religion. The king succeeded in overcoming the opposition of the Lithuanians only by a skilful mixture of cunning, intrigue, and disguised force. The Diet of Lublin, 1569, is one of the most glorious in Polish history, for there the permanent union of the two countries was declared. This made it sure that, after the death of Sigismund, the same person would be elected as king by Poles and Lithuanians. The two diets were also united. The Lithuanian Senate, consisting of bishops, vaivodes, palatines, and the great crown dignitaries, was merged with that of Poland. Beyond this, the Union did not go. In what concerned military matters, administration, and justice, the two countries remained distinct. There were as many Lithuanian dignitaries as there were Polish. If we consider that these high officials and commanders, though appointed by the king, were appointed for life, and were irremovable, that they enjoyed, therefore, complete independence within their sphere, and, once appointed, paid absolutely no attention to the crown, it will be seen that out of the new order of things there must result even greater confusion than existed before. What availed resolutions in common, if afterwards the Lithuanian high treasurer, or the Lithuanian commander-in-chief, had the power to pursue an entirely different course from that of his Polish colleague? It was from a sense of this that attempts were made at the Lublin Diet to strengthen Poland proper, which was vastly smaller than the Grand Principality, by separating from this latter the provinces of Volhynia and Podolia, and adding them to the crown. At any rate, by the Lublin Union, Sigismund had secured external unity for his kingdom, and thereby rendered Poland an immense service. One cannot fairly deny him the glory of a brilliant and useful reign, marked, moreover, by a considerable growth of learning and letters, and forming a striking contrast to the disastrous times that followed. He died on July the 14th, 1572, and with him passed away the prosperity which Poland owed to the Jagiellon dynasty. The unfortunate country fell a prey to the disorders and uncertainties of an elective monarchy. A special meeting of the Diet was convoked to prepare for an election. The Protestant nobility attended it with all the influence of its numbers, its wealth, and the unity that the Sandomir Agreement had secured. It was through its agency that a law was passed, in 1573, that no one should be either harmed or slighted on account of his religion. The dissidents, to use the official Latin designation, were to be put in every respect on a par with the Catholics. This was the first formal authoritative recognition of the equality of the different confessions in Poland, the first legal breach in the religious unity of the realm but the Catholics had not remained idle. Bishop Hosius of Ermeland, clad with increased authority on account of his efficient services as one of the presidents of the Council of Trent, and adorned with the dignity of cardinal, had, in 1565, brought Jesuits into Poland. They began at once to work in their energetic yet prudent manner. About this time, Cardinal Comendone returned to Poland under the pretext of urging on the war against the Turks, but really to participate in the forthcoming royal election. He became the rallying centre of the Catholics, and directed their choice to a member of the Orthodox House of Habsburg, Ernest, son of Maximilian II. The Reformed, on their part, wished to place on the throne a native nobleman of their own faith, John Firley, Grand Marshal of the Crown. Thereby, they not only excited the jealousy of the other great families, but also that of the Lutherans, who were not willing to concede preeminence to the Calvinists. Here, then, as we have already seen so often, 
and as we shall see again the lamentable divisions between lutherans and calvinists crippled the progress of the reformation prevented its victory and paved the way most effectively for the catholic reaction the opposition of the protestants to the candidature of archduke ernest was so universal and pronounced that the catholics became convinced of the impossibility of his election they and Comendone, therefore, began to turn to a claimant for whom the French ambassador had long been actively at work, Henry of Anjou, brother of Charles the Ninth of France. It is true that the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve seemed to make him quite unacceptable by the Polish Protestants, but the Duke's friends so positively asserted that the massacre had had purely political causes and the duke himself declared so solemnly that he had taken no share at all in it that the protestants yielded at last on the condition that they should be allowed to enjoy full religious liberty and joined with the catholics in electing henry of anjou to the throne of poland on may the ninth fifteen seventy three he reached his new kingdom early the following year the protestant nobles forced him by direct threats to confirm by oath the religious liberties of the land yet he had already begun to favour the intrigues of the catholic clergy when the death of his brother called him back to france where he ascended the throne as henry the third in fifteen seventy four for over one year the poles waited in vain for the return of their king then they proceeded to a new election this time the protestants seemed to obtain a complete victory the choice fell on stephen bathory prince of transylvania an able warrior and a well-known friend of the reformation among the twelve magnates that were sent to him to announce his election there were eleven protestants but they had made a double mistake in imposing upon the newly elected prince too burdensome an election agreement pacta conventa and in imposing upon him also the obligation of marrying the sister of sigismund augustus anna jagiellonska then fifty-two years of age the sole catholic member of the embassy solikowski promised bathory the assistance of his brethren in setting aside the burdensome conditions and called his attention to the fact that anna a zealous catholic would never marry a heretic these representations prevailed and it was as a catholic that stephen bathory came to poland to the great disappointment of the protestants it is true that during the eleven years of his reign fifteen seventy five to fifteen eighty six he never persecuted them but he allowed himself to be entirely won over by the jesuits who represented themselves to him as they had done to emperor ferdinand i as zealous friends of learning of general culture and especially of the intellectual and moral elevation of the clergy under his reign the jesuits penetrated into poland proper and soon a close network of their colleges extended over the whole realm as everywhere else they neglected the education of the common people but took extreme pains to draw the sons of the nobility to their establishments and successfully these establishments were munificently endowed by stephen as was also the university which he founded at vilna in the midst of a population partly of the protestant partly of the russian greek faith they penetrated into lutheran livonia also and founded colleges at riga and dorpat in spite of the opposition of the inhabitants at the suggestion of the jesuits stephen allowed the papal nuncio to summon before his tribunal protestant bishops to condemn them as heretics and to depose them catholic bishops were appointed in their places and thus the whole ecclesiastical portion of the senate was assured to the old church and there were no more protestant bishops in poland lithuania yet neither the disfavour of the king on the whole a prudent and moderate man nor the efforts of the jesuits would have proved fatal to the protestants if troubles had not arisen in their own midst the lutheran clergy tired already of the sandomir compact had begun anew their attacks against the calvinists and the moravian brethren declaring outright that these sacramentists were worse than jesuits and that to join them was worse than to go back to catholicism these quarrels proceeding as nearly always from the blind arrogance of the lutherans had for one of their results the return of a large number of noble families among them a son of black Radziwiłł, to the bosom of romanism many more felt themselves inclined to such a step by the ever-increasing radicalism of certain sects 
As early as 1546 the first Unitarians who denied the Trinity had met in Cracow. Later the Siamese noblemen, Lelio Sozzini, Socinus, after whom the whole sect are often called Socinians, came to the same city and gave them increased stability. A Polish scholar, Peter Gonionski, or Gonesius, boldly acknowledged himself an adherent to his doctrine before the reformed synod, and founded a regular anti-Trinitarian church, which soon had many disciples among both nobility and commoners, possessed numerous churches and schools, and organized a synod of its own. Its confession, in 1574, declared Christ to be the highest and most perfect of prophets, and the Holy Spirit a gift which God had made to this prophet. Baptism was to be conferred only on adults. The Lord's Supper was explained symbolically, as in the Calvinistic Church. This Unitarian community taught and practiced, besides, the greatest tolerance and abstention from all sorts of violence. The progress of Unitarian sentiment in Poland, and the religious liberty that prevailed there, attracted thither the nephew of Lelio, Fausto Sozzini, a man equally learned, lovable, and conscientious. For twelve years he had been a favorite of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, but in order to be free to follow his religious convictions, he left his fatherland and, after many wanderings, settled in Poland, where he remained and worked until his death in 1607. At the Synod of Brześć in Lithuania, in the year 1588, he gave the Unitarian Church of Poland its final shape. It cannot be denied that the maintenance of doctrines that were then considered as godless and criminal all over the Western world offended many of the weaker minds among the Protestants and led to their rejoining the Catholic Church. Meanwhile, Stephen Bathory had obtained important successes in his foreign policy. With the aid of German mercenaries, he drove the Russians out of Livonia and took from them the entire principality of Powotsk. Hard-pressed, the cunning Ivan IV applied to the Jesuit Antonio Possevin, who was then in Poland on behalf of the Pope, giving him to understand that if he would use his influence in Ivan's interest, he would open Russia to the order and favor the conversion of his people to Catholicism. Possevin was prevailed upon by this promise, and under the influence of the Jesuits, peace was concluded in 1582. It was decidedly advantageous to Poland, which was secured in the possession of Livonia, though it had to surrender its conquests in Russia proper. Possevin betook himself to Moscow, with some other members of the order, to reap there the fruits of his mediation, but his great expectations were speedily dispelled. Ivan refused to allow the Jesuits to remain in Russia, but did agree that the German noblemen and burghers, whom he had taken prisoners in Livonia, should not be allowed to return. Then there would be so many heretics the less in Livonia, and its conversion to Catholicism would be easier. These prisoners founded the German Slobode, suburb of Moscow, which was afterwards to have so great an influence on the destinies of Russia. In his attempt to free the crown from the control of the great families, and thus restore to it its former independence and power, Stephen was wholly unsuccessful. Worn out by this fruitless effort, Stephen Bathory died on December twelfth, 1586, at the age of 54. He left no direct heirs. The question of the succession arose again. In the last decade, the Catholics had made such gains that only Catholic candidates were mentioned. There were two, Archduke Maximilian, brother of Rudolf II, and the Crown Prince of Sweden, Sigismund, whose mother was a Jagiellon, and therefore a zealous friend of the Jesuits. Sigismund himself was a loyal pupil of the fathers, and his election was favoured by the Pope, who expected through him to recover Sweden and Poland to Catholicism. Public opinion also in Poland was favourable to the descendants of the Jagiellons, so Sigismund obtained a majority of the votes. The minority, however, would not yield, and a civil war ensued. It was not until Maximilian had suffered a defeat at Pichen in 1588, and had been taken prisoner by Zamoyski, that Sigismund was universally acknowledged as king. This prince surrendered himself entirely to the control of the Jesuits. Though as a ruler he had little to do with the kingdom as a whole, his personal influence was very great. 
he not only made appointments to all great offices and dignities but he had also to assign the domains the starostes to nobles who kept them for life and paid to the crown a very slight rent for them in all he had twenty thousand positions to bestow the king entrusted all these bribes and baits to the jesuits father scarga distributed dignities revenues and starosties at his own good pleasure and it is to such means that pope clement the eighth himself attributed the progress of catholicism in poland and he was right in order not to lose the advantages held out by the king and a seat in the senate polish and lithuanian noblemen went back in crowds to the roman catholic church their example was contagious and secession from protestantism became almost universal every great nobleman drew after him the numerous lesser nobles who were dependent upon him on his estates protestant churches were restored to catholic worship protestant pastors were expelled and the peasantry and small burghers were obliged to submit to the change the Radziwill family was one of the first to adopt this course therefore one of its members was rewarded with a cardinal's hat everywhere jesuit colleges were erected and the children of the nobles imbibed in them the most bitter hatred for all heretics in the cities the decisions of partial judges robbed the protestants of their parish churches and gave them to the catholics jesuit missionaries surrounded by great pomp and protected by the cossacks of the great nobles travelled all over the land winning souls by persuasion or by terror by such means protestantism was almost entirely eradicated in poland proper and in lithuania not by direct persecution be it remembered but by the skill of the jesuits and the base greed of the nobles with whom material interests counted more than moral and spiritual a short time since wrote a papal nuncio in 1598 it did seem as if heresy would entirely supplant catholicism now catholicism is driving heresy to its grave and with the new religious doctrines the culture and intellectual life of poland declined the fate of the greek church to which most of lithuania together with the dependent provinces of little russia and white russia belonged was like that of the protestant confessions the old lithuanian princely families of chartoryskis and sanguskos the russian families of note the oginskis the wielchurskis the sapiechas and even descendants of rurik himself like the princes ostrogski and vishniewiecki forsook their inherited faith for the religion of the polish court and thus they became renegades not to their religion alone but also to their race for they assumed the polish nationality and polish speech together with the faith of the latin church soon however the jesuits succeeded in inflicting a still more serious blow on the greek church of lithuania by inducing the king to threaten that he would henceforth admit to the senate only such great prelates as had made their submission to rome at the synod of Przeszlitewski, therefore in fifteen ninety four most of the lithuanian bishops expressed their assent to the union formulated by the council of florence in fourteen thirty eight they recognized among other dogmas purgatory and the supremacy of the pope but they retained the slavic tongue for public service as well as the rights and hierarchy of the greek church they were received into the communion of western christendom under the name of greek united church this was one of the most signal victories of rome in the sixteenth century after so many irrevocable losses it had at last one new conquest to show nowhere else did the counter-reformation and the jesuits work so quickly and so comprehensively as in poland lithuania in the reign of sigismund the third the policy of religious restoration adopted by sigismund had the most pernicious consequences for the power and greatness of poland it can be said that this reign spread the seed of all the destructive agencies that were with such startling rapidity to cause the complete dissolution and ruin of the kingdom the venality which had been encouraged in the nobles was soon to serve the purposes of foreign and even of hostile powers as readily as it had served those of rome the nobleman who had begun to serve the church for pay was easily persuaded to become the paid servant of austria or russia the suppression of protestantism alienated the population of east prussia and paved the way for the loss of that important baltic province 
The Poles proceeded by violent measures to introduce Catholicism into Livonia, installing Catholic priests and bishops, handing over the schools to the Jesuits, and doing their best to do away with the German element. Is it a wonder that the Livonians turned longingly to Sweden for help? Finally, the union of the larger part of the Lithuanian Church with Rome excited the wrath of the Cossacks, who were intensely attached to the Greek Church. These plundering hordes of the Middle and Lower Dnieper had been organized by King Stephen Battery as a barrier against the Turks and the Muscovites, and their country had for this reason received the name of Ukraine, borderland. Their numbers had increased rapidly, and they now formed an army of 40,000 warriors, distributed into 20 regiments. When an attempt was made to force them into the United Church, they rebelled, and though quieted for a while by the concessions of the government, they remained dissatisfied and hostile to the Poles, a state of things which later had disastrous consequences for the kingdom. The Polish policy of Sigismund caused intense dissatisfaction in Sweden, and thus the accession of the Vazas to the Polish throne, which was to have effected the union of the two great monarchies, was the very thing that led to permanent hostility between them. Before leaving Sweden, Sigismund and his father King John III subscribed the so-called Statues of Kalmar, September 1587. These provided for a perpetual union between Sweden and Poland, but with a distinct national government and administration for each of the two countries. However strongly these statues endeavored to ensure Sweden's independence, it soon appeared that the country was threatened with becoming a mere appendage to the larger Polish realm, when hostilities broke out between the Poles and Russians, King John also declared war against the Tsar in 1590. This campaign was exceedingly burdensome for Sweden, which was then suffering from a failure of crops and from pestilence, and impoverished by the extravagant expenditures of John. The war proved unfortunate, so that already in John's reign the Swedes were dissatisfied with the Polish Union. John died on November the 17th, 1592, and Sigismund, then twenty-six years old, inherited the throne. The Catholics were triumphant, expecting that in Sweden, as in Poland, heretics would be forced to submit. Considering the temper of the Swedish people at this time, it is scarcely conceivable that a violent attempt at reaction could have succeeded. It would probably have led to the deposition of the Vasa dynasty, had there not been a scion of it willing and able to keep the nation in the way traced by Gustavus. Charles of Södermanland, then forty-two years of age, had, with some trifling exceptions, and bearing their different religious opinions, been a faithful vassal of his older brother. He was already the preferred favourite of the people. While John was half Catholic, and his son wholly so, Charles had remained true to his inherited Protestantism. While John ruled tyrannically and incapably, Foolishly wasting the resources of his realm, Charles managed his dukedom and its finances with admirable order, and was a mild, though firm ruler. Why should the nursling of the Jesuits leave Warsaw to come to Sweden? Did not the Swedes already have a genuine son of Vasa among them, one who had remained true to his ancestors' ways? Charles at first behaved with great circumspection, adopted moderate and safe measures, and conducted the government by the authority and with the full assent of Sigismund. But the latter could not help being jealous of his uncle. To weaken his influence he appointed noblemen devoted to his own cause, who were independent of Charles's authority as governors and commanders in Estonia and Finland. This gave serious offence to the duke, and led him to take the first step toward a rupture with the king. He entered into a covenant with the council to conduct the administration without prejudice to their fealty to Sigismund, under conjoint responsibility, each for all and all for each. He gave his opposition to the king a still more pronounced character by convoking a diet, and at the same time a church synod at Uppsala in 1593. Religion and liberty, he said to those assembled there, are my father's gifts to our country. It is our duty to preserve them, now that we have a foreign king whose conscience is under thraldom to the Pope. He stirred up all the patriotic and religious sentiments of the Swedes. Well could the Protestant bishop Petrus Jona say joyfully, Now Sweden has become one man, and we all have one God. 
All of John's religious innovations, the Red Book included, were abolished, and Luther's doctrine restored in its purity. All accepted this step voluntarily. There was no violent reaction and no persecution to mar the national victory. This Uppsala Assembly of 1593 rendered impossible any future attempt to Catholicize the country. It established Protestantism in Sweden on an immovable foundation, and it prepared the way for the great work of Gustavus Adolphus. Charles had proceeded with great prudence. He had simply set things in motion, and as soon as he saw they were moving as he wished, he had stepped aside, merely subscribing to the decisions of the Diet and Assembly. Thus, without making himself prominent, or assuming an attitude of direct opposition to the king, he had become the leader of the national Protestant movement, which carried with it the overwhelming majority of the Swedish people. A few months later, in September 1593, Sigismund arrived in Sweden to be crowned. He was received with great distrust, and as he refused to ratify the Uppsala resolutions, matters soon reached a crisis and blows were exchanged between his polish followers and the burghers of stockholm charles kept himself in his duchy but when the estates refused to acknowledge sigismund unless he first ratified the resolutions of fifteen ninety three the duke came to upsala with three thousand soldiers and put himself and his force at the disposal of the estates sigismund had to yield in appearance at least and was thereupon crowned as king but he at once proceeded to violate his pledge in hundreds of instances he favoured the catholics everywhere he set up catholic worship and when on his return to poland he had to appoint charles as his vice-regent he bestowed such extensive powers on provincial governors as to make centralization impossible the governors acted as they pleased and openly resisted the commands of the duke charles resorted once more to the means that had succeeded so well before he summoned the estates before they began their deliberations he addressed the people in the public square and they enthusiastically promised him their aid in the maintenance of the resolutions passed and to be passed under his guidance the estates were forced to follow the popular opinion though the nobility had shown an inclination to side with the distant king rather than with the near duke thinking that they might thus be freer to do their own pleasure but the enthusiasm of the people and the clearly expressed opinions of both burghers and peasants in the diet prevailed over such selfish calculations the statutes of suderkoping confirmed and strengthened those of upsala an end was to be put to the last remnants of catholic worship all catholic clergymen and in fact all sectaries opposed to the evangelical church were to leave the land within six weeks even the ancient and renowned monastery at Vatstena was suppressed sigismund was beside himself at the revolutionary conduct of his uncle he forbade the people to pay the taxes imposed by charles urged the council to withstand the duke and promised protection to all who should rise against the resolution of suderkoping but the people were well pleased with the duke's course and stood faithfully by him charles offered to resign the regency but summoned another meeting of the estates in fifteen ninety seven this time at arboga there the higher and more conservative classes the nobility and the clergy separated from him but the peasants brandishing their clubs and axes exclaimed that they would defend the duke as long as their blood was warm the nobles who opposed him had to leave the country the bishops who refused to acknowledge him were deposed and in some cases imprisoned under the pressure of the excited multitude the decisions of the diet were wholly in accord with the duke's desire his enemies were declared to be enemies of the country a civil war ensued but ended soon in the complete triumph of charles several of the king's adherents were executed in accordance with the decrees of arboga Sigismund, fearing that he might lose even the semblance of authority in Sweden, appeared in that country in the summer of 1598 with a force of 5,000 Polish soldiers. The moment was a critical one. The royal name had clearly not lost all its power, and many disapproved of the duke's revolutionary proceedings, so that nearly the whole of southern Sweden, including Stockholm, declared for the king but the north out of which the vasa dynasty had arisen eight years before remained true to charles a decisive battle was fought at linköping southwest of stockholm in which sigismund was completely routed september twenty fifth fifteen ninety eight 
Three days later he concluded a treaty with his victorious uncle, in which he basely betrayed his most devoted partisans, but according to which he was to administer the government himself and promised to convoke the national diet within four months. Instead of fulfilling his pledges, he placed Polish garrisons in a few cities and sailed for Danzig. He still hoped to be able to make a more successful effort to recover his hereditary kingdom. But he had underestimated the opposition of Protestant Sweden. As it had been agreed in the Treaty of Linköping that the Estates should have the right to oppose any party that violated the treaty, the Diet of Stockholm, on July 24, 1599, deposed Sigismund and transferred the government to Charles. This was the end of Sigismund's rule in Sweden. It was also the final triumph of Protestantism in that country, an event of the greatest significance not only for the destinies of the Swedish people, but also for the general religious history of Europe, for it was on the Swedish rock that the mighty waves of the counter-reformation broke and were driven back. The difficulties in the way of the new ruler were many. He did not venture at once, though repeatedly urged by the estates, to assume the royal title. Sigismund's party was not yet powerless in Sweden. It still held Kalmar and other fortresses. Charles proceeded with great vigor, and it must be confessed with severity. The Finns, who strongly supported Sigismund, were beaten, their strongholds destroyed, and the royalist leaders were executed. Nearly all the adult members of the higher nobility fell by the executioner's sword or were driven into exile, while their property was confiscated. Meanwhile, Sigismund had induced the Poles to declare war against the usurper. But the weak and cowardly king was no match for Charles of, of Sudermanland, any more than the disorganized and selfish Polish nobles were a match for the Swedish people, filled as they were with religious and patriotic ardor. In the summer of 1600, Charles conquered nearly the whole of Livonia. On his return, he set himself to work with consummate skill to secure still more completely the people's favor. He repeatedly offered his resignation to the estates. He consulted them frequently in the choice of his counselors. His opposition to his brother Eric and to his nephew Sigismund proceeded not so much from personal ambition as from a desire to preserve for the house of Vaza a kingdom which their madness threatened to destroy. He repeatedly offered the crown to Sigismund's younger brother John, who as often refused it. As late as 1604, when, in answer to the persistent request of the estates, he finally accepted, as Charles IX, the kingdom for himself and his descendants, he still offered to resign his dignity in John's favor. He labored earnestly to improve the judicial system of Sweden, which had as yet no code. He reorganized local administration and the levying of taxes. He favored commerce and industry with all his power, especially mining and ironworking. In his reign, Sweden exported a considerable quantity of cannon and cannonballs. Just at this time, the Polish-Swedish contest was complicated by Sigismund's interference in the affairs of Russia and by the adventures of the pseudo-Demetrius. End of part one of The Counter-Reformation in Scandinavia and Poland by Martin Philipson Part two of The Counter-Reformation in Scandinavia and Poland by Martin Philipson from The History of All Nations from Earliest Times, Volume 12, The Religious Wars, translated under the supervision of John Henry Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. At the close of the Middle Ages, Ivan III had inaugurated a new epoch for the Russian Empire. This remarkable man, with his cool, refined cruelty, without a single sympathetic trait in his character, was the creator of modern Russia. He put an end forever to Tartar rule and brought to a close the destructive wars against the small, half-independent princes, thus securing the independence and unity of Russia. But he did more. He asserted his claim to all lands that had once been Russian, a claim that was to lead to the destruction of the Lithuanian kingdom, and he declared himself the protector of the Greek Orthodox Church in foreign lands, a step that forced Russia to assume an aggressive policy against Turkey and Poland. This same prince built up a strong absolutism within his dominions, secured quiet and order to his subjects, 
framed laws and founded a standing army, he was a Peter the Great at the close of the 15th century. He was succeeded by Vasily IV Ivanovich, 1505 to 1533. As his father had put an end to the independence that the great Novgorod had enjoyed for several hundred years, Vasily deprived Pskov of its liberty and at the same time of its prosperity. He conquered Smolensk, then a city of Polish Lithuania. His father had entertained close relations with the German Empire. Vasily kept up this friendship, and Maximilian I sent as envoy to Moscow the Baron of Herberstein, author of the extremely interesting Rerum Moscoviticarum Commentarii. Vasily's son, Ivan IV, surnamed the Terrible, 1533 to 1585, was a prince of far greater ability and power than his father. To understand and appreciate justly his reign, we must take into consideration the state of affairs in Russia after Vasily's death. Grand Prince Ivan was only three years of age when he nominally succeeded to the throne. His near relatives perished in the struggle for the regency, and the boyars, the nobility of office in Russia, seized control of the government and treated the young prince with insolence. They were unable, however, to establish their rule firmly. Disorder, intrigue, murder, and all sorts of violence prevailed all over the land. There were even risings among the common people, long-suffering and submissive as are the Russians of the lower classes. Such was the school in which Ivan grew up. He learned in it dissimulation, hardness, and cruelty. These seemed to him the only means by which to maintain the power of the crown and the unity of the empire. When fourteen years of age, he seized with a firm hand the reins of government, remorselessly put to death all the leaders of the nobility, and assumed, first of all Russian princes, the title of Tsar, in 1584. Full of contempt for the rudeness, barbarism, and ignorance of his people, he strove to attract to his country foreign scholars, artisans, and mechanics, and by their means to secure for Russia the advantages, wealth, and power of Western civilization. An English merchant fleet having found its way to the White Sea, Ivan gave them a ready welcome and entered into friendly relations with their country. He published the first systematic Russian code of law. By the side of the irregular levies of the lesser nobility and their retainers, he organized a permanent guard, the Strelzi. To remedy the evil of varying religious views and practices, he convoked at Moscow in 1551 a council, the decrees of which, the Stolavnie, or Book of the Hundred Chapters, form to this day the basis of the Russian ecclesiastical polity. They bear upon the discipline and elementary instructions of the clergy, deal with superstitions and crimes, and present Russian faith and Russian morals in a definite and intended contrast to those of the West. This did not interfere with the civilizing efforts of the Tsar and his advisers. Ivan had a printing press set up in Moscow, and the first book printed in Russia appeared there in 1564. He had been reigning long and wisely when he fell severely ill, and the boyars, who thought him near his death, turned openly against him and went back to their old practices. This awakened in Ivan memories of his sad childhood. He became a prey to incessant suspicions and vindictive rage, and determined to crush the least show of independence. He decimated the higher nobility, and even his very best friends, killing many of them with his own hand. Whole cities were ruined. On the calumnious charge of a worthless knave, Novgorod was almost wholly destroyed, and thousands of its inhabitants were tortured to death. In a fit of frenzy he slew his eldest son, who resembled him in many ways. In short, he suffered from that tyrannical mania that affected so many Roman emperors. The Roman people rid themselves of such monsters by assassination. The Russians, more servile, submitted and suffered, but they called him Ivan the Terrible. Meanwhile, however, the Tsar was prosecuting his wars, but fortune had forsaken him. Neither against the Poles nor against the Krim Tatars was he successful. The former, and also the Swedes, drove him out of the Baltic provinces. The latter came and burned down Moscow, the Kremlin alone escaping. On the other hand, some Russian adventurers, unsupported by their government, made the beginning of a very important conquest. Two brothers named Stroganov, large dealers in salt and peltries, determined to seek the market beyond the Ural Mountains, which at that time bounded the geographical knowledge of the Russian people. 
they entrusted the leadership of the expedition to a cossack yermak who collected a number of companions and crossed the mountains in fifteen seventy nine they took an active part in the quarrels of the transuralian princes and possessed themselves of the land of khan kushtum and his capital sibir situated on the irtish from this city the whole territory beyond the mountains was called siberia yermak went back to russia and the two stroganovs hastened to convey their unexpected conquest to ivan and to extend their discoveries farther and farther eastward such were the insignificant beginnings of the vast asiatic empire of russia worn out by excesses of all kinds ivan the fourth died in fifteen eighty five in the fifty-fifth year of his age his son and successor fyodor was weak in body and mind his father had for that reason appointed a council of regency consisting of five boyars foremost among whom were nikita romanovich brother of the young tsar's mother and boris godunov brother of fyodor's wife but these regents quarrelled at last boris godunov treacherously seized the supreme authority by overthrowing his opponents putting some to death and banishing others it was then that siberia began to serve as a place of exile godunov was now virtual master though he left fyodor the title of tsar as the latter was childless boris conceived the bold plan of exterminating the relatives of the legitimate ruler and securing the crown for himself and his descendants fyodor's younger half-brother dmitri demetrius was secretly murdered and his mother shut up in a convent the few relatives of the tsar disappeared one after another in a way that could scarcely be called accidental godunov then set himself to secure the favour of the clergy he made the russian church independent of the patriarch of constantinople by declaring the metropolitan of moscow patriarch of the whole north he won the nobles by depriving the russian peasants of their right of migrating freely thus making them real serfs bound to the soil in fifteen ninety two the influential classes having thus been secured the way to the throne was prepared for him when fyodor died childless in fifteen ninety eight and the ruling house of muscovy ended with him no one thought of offering the crown to some other one of the numerous descendants of rurik it was an easy thing for the grateful clergy to induce the people to call for the coronation of boris godunov the great national assembly duma of bishops boyars princes and representatives of the city merchant guilds approved the choice for some time boris for form's sake refused to accept the proffered crown at length however he submitted to god's will and was solemnly crowned in september fifteen ninety eight he had reached his goal but as is wont to be the case with usurpers he met with great difficulties as soon as the people had had time to take a calm view of the situation the peasants could not forget or forgive the loss of their liberty of migrating the boyars would not forget that boris had been one of their number the usurper full of suspicion dealt harshly with both classes the romanov family that had once stood so near the throne were deprived of their possessions and banished their chief prince fyodor nikitich was shorn and shut up in a monastery as a monk under the name of philaretus all the higher nobility were soon embittered against the new tsar but his worst foes were the very clergy whom he had lately so favoured the cause of their estrangement was boris's endeavour to encourage intercourse with foreign nations to attract strangers to russia and last and worst to found in moscow a university after the western plan and invite to it learned men from other parts of europe a terrible famine added to the universal discontent under these circumstances there suddenly appeared a youth claiming to be dmitri fyodor's younger brother who he really was no one could tell but his speech and general appearance rendered it probable that he was a pole a tool of the jesuits who wished with his aid to establish catholicism in russia no one now doubts that dmitri was an impostor it is an established fact that a groom of the polish prince vishnyevetsky in an alleged severe sickness asserted while confessing to a jesuit that he was the real dmitri he said that someone else had been slain under his name and to prove his identity he showed a gold cross adorned with diamonds and various papers in sixteen o three his master and his master's family believed his assertion the jesuits were naturally much interested in him and had him enter a jesuit college to be taught the truths of the catholic religion 
King Sigismund III, as a dutiful pupil of his father's, at once acknowledged him as Tsar Dmitri, gave him a pension of 20,000 marks, and granted permission to all Poles to join the great prince in his attempt to recover his empire. Dmitri solemnly pledged himself to make Catholicism the state religion of Russia, to marry Marina Mniczech, daughter of the voivode of Sandomir, and to surrender various provinces to the Republic of Poland. He then started on his expedition in August 1604, accompanied by many thousand Polish nobles. As soon as the invading army reached Russian soil, the general dissatisfaction with Boris, the veneration entertained for the old legitimate dynasty, and besides the force of example, brought multitudes of Russians over to the pretender. Boris died suddenly on April 13, 1605, having, it is supposed, poisoned himself in his despair. His widow and his son Fyodor were strangled by the populace. On June the 20th, 1605, the false Dmitri made his solemn entrance into Moscow in the midst of rapturous manifestations of joy. The mother of the real Dmitri was released from her imprisonment in a convent, and full of a vindictiveness against the Godunovs, did nothing to expose the impostor, though she did not formally acknowledge him as her son. The banished families, especially the Romanovs and the Shuiskis, returned, and the new Tsar began his reign wisely and mildly, but his past rose threateningly against him. He had to reward the greedy Poles who had accompanied him with Russian gold and Russian estates. Polish customs and Polish influence prevailed at his court. He entertained close relations with the hated West and allowed the Jesuits to hold Catholic worship in the Kremlin. Finally, Dmitri wished to organize a standing army of foreigners, which was to be maintained, in large measure, at the expense of the church. Marina, a Polish woman and a Catholic, was betrothed to Dmitri, and, a thing never done before, solemnly crowned as Tsarina. The fanatical hatred of the Russians against everything foreign, and especially against the Roman Catholic Church, now broke out in all its intensity. They, the only Orthodox believers, saw themselves delivered over to heretics and to their hated Polish neighbors. Prince Vasily Shuisky, whom Dmitri had unwisely pardoned for a former conspiracy, gave able leadership to the general discontent and strengthened it with his armed retainers. On May 17, 1606, a terrible riot broke out in Moscow, in which the pretender and his most prominent adherents, many Germans among them, were slain by the enraged mob. Other Poles, the Tsarina, the Mniczechs, and the Vishnevetskis included, were arrested and distributed among various Russian cities. Thus ended the reign of the impostor Dmitri after less than a year's duration. The throne was now vacant, and no legitimate climate was on hand. As an attack on the part of Poland was expected, the boyars, with the approval of the people, made Vasily Shuisky, leader of the insurrection, Tsar. He at once did away with all of Dmitri's innovations, made important concessions to the boyars, and, to prevent the imitation of the impostor's attempt, caused the body of the true Dmitri to be disinterred and publicly exposed. It began at once to work miracles, and Dmitri was added to the saints of the Greek calendar. It was unavoidable that the elevation of Shuisky should excite the envy and jealousy of many great nobles. They sent to Poland to secure there a new false Dmitri, and the Poles were quite ready to encourage civil war in Russia, and thus weaken a rival at whose expense Poland might grow rich. The new adventurer, as to whose origin nothing certain is known, maintained that he was Dmitri, and that he had escaped from the May massacre in Moscow. Accompanied by numerous Polish volunteers, he entered Russia in June 1607, and penetrated as far as the gates of Moscow, where he entrenched himself in the hamlet of Tushino. Hence he is known to Russian tradition as the Thief of Tushino. Many Russians joined him, and Marina, having escaped from confinement, shamelessly acknowledged him as her husband. Shuisky, threatened by danger so near, turned for assistance to Sigismund's enemy, Charles the Ninth of Sweden. Five thousand Swedes, under the able generals de la Gardie and Horn, came to his relief, and easily routed the undisciplined mob of rebels in 1608. When Sigismund saw that the thief of Tushino was making no headway, he deemed it best to turn the civil troubles of Russia wholly to his own advantage, declared war against that empire in 1609, and after a long and heroic resistance took the important fortress of Smolensk. 
The second false Dimitri and Marina withdrew to Kaluga, where they carried on a plundering warfare till he was assassinated in December 1610. These disturbances gave rise to a profound dissatisfaction with Shuisky's rule. The discontent broke out in open rebellion when, in June 1610, a Polish army under Stanisław Żółkiewski won a brilliant victory over the Tsar at Moshaisk. The Moscovites rose against their ruler and forced him to submit to the tonsure and enter a monastery. The rapid approach of the Poles forced the Council of Boyars to acknowledge Władysław, son of Sigismund, as Tsar, but not before he had pledged himself to protect the Greek Church, indeed to join it, as well as to admit the cooperation of the Boyars in legislation and in levying the taxes. The newly elected Tsar did not abide in Russia long, but soon returned to Poland. His father seemed disposed to make use of his son's new dignity for the purpose of plundering and robbing Russia, and a Polish garrison kept Moscow in order by fire and sword. Complete anarchy now prevailed in 1611. Marina Mniczech proclaimed as Tsar her son by the Tushino thief. A third pseudo Dmitri arose in the person of the deacon Isidore, who found adherents in Pskov. De La Gardi and his Swedes seized the fortress of Kexholm in Russian Finland and forced Novgorod the Great to recognize a Swedish prince, Charles Philip, as Tsar. Russia seemed lost, a helpless prey to foreigners. She was saved by the patriotism, the courage, the resolution of the common people, that multitude which the worthless and selfish nobles loved to consider and to treat as slaves. A butcher of Nizhny Novgorod, Kozma Minin, summoned first his fellow citizens and then when these had readily answered his call all true russians to deliver their country from polish heretics crowds came together to accomplish this task the inhabitants of great novgorod were easily induced to renounce their swedish prince the citizens of pskov likewise drove out the priest isidore the Russians, once more united attacked the poles near moscow and after a fierce battle lasting four days august twenty to August 23, 1612, won a complete victory. Two months later, the Polish garrison of the Kremlin surrendered after a brave defense, and, with the exception of Smolensk, all Russia was now rid of foreigners. The question of supreme moment was now to place the nation under the rule of an able and legitimate chief. The nobles, the higher clergy, and representatives of the cities and circles met together. After long deliberations, Michael, the son of that Fyodor Romanov whom Godunov had thrust into a monastery, was elected Tsar on February 21, 1613, because he was the youngest and least powerful of the candidates, and had, moreover, formally acknowledged the right of the boyars to cooperate in the government. During the following years, the Romanov dynasty established itself more and more firmly on the throne, and the year 1613 may be considered as having put a final stop to the confusion that had prevailed in Russian politics. The Romanovs are today the ruling dynasty of Russia. Charles IX had been unable to do anything to maintain the claims of his son, Charles Philip, to the Russian throne. He already had on his hands hostilities with Poland and with Denmark. In 1611. In this latter country, the peaceable Frederick II had, in the year 1588, been succeeded by Christian IV, then only eleven years of age. As soon as this prince became his own master, in 1569, he manifested a most ambitious spirit. He wished to acquire military fame, and turned upon Sweden, which he thought occupied in the Baltic provinces, and whose king he deemed weak and sickly. He found a pretext for war in certain disputes about the Lapland boundaries. His plan was at first successful. He defeated the Swedish king and took the important fortress of Kalmar. Before Charles IX could make that loss good, he died, October the 30th, 1611, at the age of 60. A strong, energetic, and even passionate man of great sagacity and with deep and lofty feelings, he had succeeded in directing the destinies of his people according to his purpose, because he understood that people, recognized their needs and desires, and helped them to realize them. He was succeeded by his son Gustavus II Adolphus, who was born on December ninth, 1594. This young prince had been most carefully educated by his father. 
he spoke latin german dutch and french fluently and had a fair knowledge of greek polish and russian when yet a lad he had taken part in state affairs as a listener mostly but now and then called upon for advice in the campaign of sixteen eleven he had played a not inglorious part for a youth of seventeen the situation presented great difficulties charles with his peculiar conscientiousness had left to the estates the choice between sigismund's brother duke john and his own son gustavus adolphus the choice fell on gustavus but john as compensation received all of east and west gotland as an almost independent duchy the young king's brother charles philip obtained sudermanland together with norike and vermland thus the unity of the nation was once more broken Besides, the nobles took advantage of the youth and insecure position of the new prince to impose upon him their cooperation by means of the royal council. The young king's chancellor was Axel Oxenstern, only twenty-eight years of age, but already an experienced statesman and an indefatigable worker. Bloody and costly wars were part of the inheritance which Charles the Ninth had left to his son, and one of the first cares of Gustavus was to put a measurably satisfactory end to them. It was clear that, in spite of their heroic valor, the Swedes could not face their foes on both the east and the west. It was fortunate for Sweden that the Danish nobles did not look favorably on their king's military successes, fearing lest he might grow proud thereby and destroy them and their liberties so christian the fourth was disposed to listen to overtures of peace though the terms he granted the swedes were quite severe by the treaty of knerot january sixteen thirteen gustavus renounced his sovereignty over lapland and redeemed elfsborg the only swedish port on the north sea at a cost of a million rexthalers not inconsiderable sum for the times to guard against the return of such humiliations, Gustavus contracted an alliance of fifteen years with the States-General of the Netherlands, but with a keen eye to the future stipulated that it should in no wise affect the supremacy and control of the Baltic Sea. The Dutch envoys described the young king as slender in figure, shapely, with a pale complexion, somewhat long features, light hair, and a pointed blond beard great things were even then expected of him and men praised his kindliness his prudence and his eloquence gustavus having no longer anything to fear on the side of denmark determined to profit by the confusion prevailing in russia and met with some successes though he failed to retake pskov in february sixteen seventeen a peace was concluded at stolbova by which sweden obtained possession of ingermanland and karelia this was an acquisition of the greatest importance as russia was now shut out from the baltic sea ingermanland and karelia were bulwarks not only for finland but for sweden herself how wisely the king had judged was shown a hundred years later when those provinces were restored to russia i hope to god gustavus said as the treaty was passed that the russians will not now find it easy to cross this brook the baltic gustavus made it one of the first aims of his reign to secure for sweden the baltic sea and its shores a good beginning was the setting aside of his russian rivals sweden now stood forth bold and powerful full of protestant zeal and faith the shield of the reformation in europe and especially in germany the efforts of the catholics had proved utterly unavailing they had resulted in utterly eradicating from the people's hearts all attachment to the old doctrines and intensifying their hatred of catholicism for a few years longer, Rome flattered itself that, with the aid of Poland, it might win Russia to the Catholic faith. To this end, the Jesuits had applied all the means of deceit, falsehood, and violence so characteristic of their order. But the Russian people, grown conscious of their own strength, had broken the net woven about them, and Poland and Jesuits had been ingloriously driven out of the land. The counter-reformation in the northeast retained only one of its conquests, Poland. This was a misfortune for that noble country. Catholic bigotry worked the same ruin for the Poles that it wrought in Spain and in Italy. The lands where Rome prevailed were doomed to decay and sometimes utter ruin, while Protestant countries grew more and more powerful and enterprising. Whether one looks upon it with joy or with regret, it cannot be gainsaid at the beginning of the seventeenth century protestant nations were steadily growing in power greatness and prosperity 
the nations over which jesuitism and romanism had control were showing signs of rapid and apparently irretrievable decay to revert to poland how successfully how smoothly had the transition seemed to be made from the old dynasty to the new order whilst neighbouring russia after the extinction of its hereditary house sank into apparently hopeless confusion and yet the heroic firmness of the russian people had extricated them out of this confusion and had laid the foundations of a mightier and larger development whilst in poland the germ of decay that lay in its very vitals was rapidly destroying the body politic the clergy kept the lower classes in subjection whilst themselves serving the interests of a rude selfish and dissolute nobility but in germany the momentous question was into which of the two camps that of protestantism or that of the counter-reformation the nation would pass not the german people alone but the whole west was profoundly interested in the issue end of part two of the counter-reformation in scandinavia and poland by martin philipson the crisis nihilism and the idea of recurrence by friedrich nietzsche eighteen forty four to nineteen hundred from the will to power book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the crisis nihilism and the idea of recurrence extreme positions are not relieved by more moderate ones but by extreme opposite positions and thus the belief in the utter immorality of nature and in the absence of all purpose and sense are psychologically necessary attitudes when the belief in god and in an essentially moral order of things is no longer tenable nihilism now appears not because the sorrows of existence are greater than they were formerly but because in a general way people have grown suspicious of the meaning which might be given to evil and even to existence one interpretation has been overthrown but since it was held to be the interpretation it seems as though there were no meaning in existence at all as though everything were in vain it yet remains to be shown that this in vain is the character of present nihilism the mistrust of our former valuations has increased to such an extent that it has led to the question are not all values merely allurements prolonging the duration of the comedy without however bringing the unravelling any closer the long period of time which has culminated in an in vain without either goal or purpose is the most paralyzing of thoughts more particularly when one sees that one is duped without however being able to resist being duped let us imagine this thought in its worst form existence as it is without either a purpose or a goal but inevitably recurring without an end in non-entity eternal recurrence this is the extremest form of nihilism nothing purposelessness eternal european form of buddhism the energy of knowledge and of strength drives us to such a belief it is the most scientific of all hypotheses we deny final purposes if existence had a final purpose it would have reached it it should be understood that what is being aimed at here is a contradiction of pantheism for everything perfect divine eternal also leads to the belief in eternal recurrence question has this pantheistic and affirmative attitude to all things also been made possible by morality at bottom only the moral god has been overcome is there any sense in imagining a god beyond good and evil would pantheism in this sense be possible 
do we withdraw the idea of purpose from the process and affirm the process notwithstanding this were so if within that process something were attained every moment and always the same thing spinoza won an affirmative position of this sort in the sense that every moment according to him has a logical necessity and he triumphed by means of his fundamentally logical instinct over a like confirmation of the world but his case is exceptional if every fundamental trait of character which lies beneath every act and which finds expression in every act were recognized by the individual as his fundamental trait of character this individual would be driven to regard every moment of his existence in general triumphantly as good it would simply be necessary for that fundamental trait of character to be felt in oneself as something good valuable and pleasurable now in the case of those men and classes of men who were treated with violence and oppressed by their fellows morality saved life from despair and from the leap into nonentity for impotence in relation to mankind and not in relation to nature is what generates the most desperate bitterness towards existence morality treated the powerful the violent and the masters in general as enemies against whom the common man must be protected that is to say emboldened strengthened morality has therefore always taught the most profound hatred and contempt of the fundamental trait of character of all rulers i e their will to power to suppress to deny and to decompose this morality would mean to regard this most thoroughly detested instinct with the reverse of the old feeling and valuation if the sufferer and the oppressed man were to lose his belief in his right to contemn the will to power his position would be desperate this would be so if the trait above mentioned were essential to life in which case it would follow that even that will to morality was only a cloak to this will to power as are also even that hatred and contempt the oppressed man would then perceive that he stands on the same platform with the oppressor and that he has no individual privilege nor any higher rank than the latter on the contrary there is nothing on earth which can have any value if it have not a modicum of power granted of course that life itself is the will to power morality protected the botched and bungled against nihilism in that it gave every one of them infinite worth metaphysical worth and classed them all together in one order which did not correspond with that of worldly power and order of rank it taught submission humility etc admitting that the belief in this morality be destroyed the botched and the bungled would no longer have any comfort and would perish this perishing seems like self-annihilation like an instinctive selection of that which must be destroyed the symptoms of this self-destruction of the botched and the bungled self-vivisection poisoning intoxication romanticism and above all the instinctive constraint to acts whereby the powerful are made into mortal enemies training so to speak one's own hangmen the will to destruction as the will to a still deeper instinct of the instinct of self-destruction the will to non-entity nihilism is a sign that the botched and bungled in order to be destroyed that having been deprived of morality they no longer have any reason to resign themselves that they take up their stand on the territory of the opposite principle and will also exercise power themselves by compelling the powerful to become their hangmen this is the european form of buddhism that active negation 
after all existence has lost its meaning it must not be supposed that poverty has grown more acute on the contrary god morality resignation were remedies in the very deepest stages of misery active nihilism made its appearance in circumstances which were relatively much more favorable the fact alone that morality is regarded as overcome presupposes a certain degree of intellectual culture while this very culture for its part bears evidence to a certain relative well-being a certain intellectual fatigue brought on by the long struggle concerning philosophical opinions and carried to hopeless scepticism against philosophy shows moreover that the level of these nihilists is by no means a low one only think of the conditions in which buddha appeared the teaching of the eternal recurrence would have learned principles to go upon just as buddha's teaching for instance had the notion of causality etc what do we mean today by the words botched and bungled in the first place they are used physiologically and not politically the unhealthiest kind of man all over europe in all classes is the soil out of which nihilism grows this species of man will regard eternal recurrence as damnation once he is bitten by the thought he can no longer recoil before any action he would not extirpate passively but would cause everything to be extirpated which is meaningless and without a goal to this extent although it is only a spasm or sort of blind rage in the presence of the fact that everything has existed again and again for an eternity even this period of nihilism and destruction the value of such a crisis is that it purifies that it unites similar elements and makes them mutually destructive that it assigns common duties to men of opposite persuasions and brings the weaker and more uncertain among them to the light thus taking the first step towards a new order of rank among forces from the standpoint of health recognizing commanders as commanders subordinates as subordinates naturally irrespective of all the present forms of society what class of men will prove they are strongest in this new order of things the most moderate they who do not require any extreme forms of belief they who not only admit of but actually like a certain modicum of chance and nonsense they who can think of man with a very moderate view of his value without becoming weak and small on that account the most rich in health who are able to withstand a maximum amount of sorrow and who are therefore not so very much afraid of sorrow men who are certain of their power and who represent with conscious pride the state of strength to which man has attained how could such a man think of eternal recurrence the periods of european nihilism the period of obscurity all kinds of groping measures devised to preserve old institutions and not to arrest the progress of new ones the period of light men see that old and new are fundamental contraries that the old values are born of descending life and that the new ones are born of ascending life that all old ideals are unfriendly to life born of decadence and determining it however much they may be decked out in the sunday finery of morality we understand the old but are far from being sufficiently strong for the new the periods of the three great passions contempt pity destruction the periods of catastrophes the rise of a teaching which will sift mankind which drives the weak to some decision and the strong also End of 
the crisis nihilism and the idea of recurrence by friedrich nietzsche from the will to power book one eternal recurrence by friedrich nietzsche eighteen forty four to nineteen hundred from the will to power book four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org eternal recurrence my philosophy reveals the triumphant thought through which all other systems of thought must ultimately perish it is the great disciplinary thought those races that cannot bear it are doomed those which regard it as the greatest blessing are destined to rule the greatest of all fights for this purpose a new weapon is required a hammer a terrible alternative must be created europe must be brought face to face with the logic of facts and confronted with the question whether its will for ruin is really earnest general levelling down to mediocrity must be avoided rather than this it would be preferable to perish a pessimistic attitude of mind and a pessimistic doctrine and ecstatic nihilism may in certain circumstances even prove indispensable to the philosopher that is to say as a mighty form of pressure or hammer with which he can smash up degenerate perishing races and put them out of existence with which he can beat a track to a new order of life or instill a longing for non-entity in those who are degenerate and who desire to perish i wish to teach the thought which gives unto many the right to cancel their existences the great disciplinary thought eternal recurrence a prophecy one the exposition of the doctrine and its theoretical first principles and results two the proof of the doctrine three probable results which will follow from its being believed it makes everything break open a the means of enduring it b the means of ignoring it four its place in history is a means the period of greatest danger the foundation of an oligarchy above peoples and their interests education directed at establishing a political policy for humanity in general a counterpart of jesuitism the two greatest philosophical points of view both discovered by germans a that of becoming and that of evolution b that based upon the values of existence but the wretched form of german pessimism must first be overcome both points of view reconciled by me in a decisive manner everything becomes and returns forever escape is impossible granted that we could appraise the value of existence what would be the result of it the thought of recurrence is a principle of selection in the service of power and barbarity the ripeness of man for this thought one the thought of eternal recurrence its first principles which must necessarily be true if it were true what its result is two it is the most oppressive thought its probable results provided it be not prevented that is to say provided all values be not transvalued three the means of enduring it the transvaluation of all values pleasure no longer to be found in certainty but in uncertainty no longer cause and effect but continual creativeness no longer the will to self-preservation but to power no longer the modest expression it is all only subjective but it is all our work let us be proud of it
in order to endure the thought of recurrence freedom from morality is necessary new means against the fact pain pain regarded as the instrument as the father of pleasure there is no accretive consciousness of pain pleasure derived from all kinds of uncertainty and tentativeness as a counterpoise to extreme fatalism suppression of the concept necessity suppression of the will suppression of absolute knowledge greatest elevation of man's consciousness of strength as that which creates superman the two extremes of thought the materialistic and the platonic are reconciled in eternal recurrence both are regarded as ideals if the universe had a goal that goal would have been reached by now if any sort of unforeseen final state existed that state also would have been reached if it were capable of any halting or stability of any being it would only have possessed this capability of becoming stable for one instant in its development and again becoming would have been at an end for ages and with it all thinking and all spirit the fact of intellects being in a state of development proves that the universe can have no goal no final state and is incapable of being but the old habit of thinking of some purpose in regard to all phenomena and of thinking of a directing and creating deity in regard to the universe is so powerful that the thinker has to go to great pains in order to avoid thinking of the very aimlessness of the world as intended the idea that the universe intentionally evades a goal and even knows artificial means wherewith it prevents itself from falling into a circular movement must occur to all those who would fain attribute to the universe the capacity of eternally regenerating itself that is to say they would fain impose upon a finite definite force which is invariable in quantity like the universe the miraculous gift of renewing its forms and its conditions for all eternity although the universe is no longer a god it must still be capable of the divine power of creating and transforming it must forbid itself to relapse into any one of its previous forms it must not only have the intention but also the means of avoiding any sort of repetition every second of its existence even it must control every single one of its movements with a view of avoiding goals final states and repetition and all the other results of such an unpardonable and insane method of thought and desire all this is nothing more than the old religious mode of thought and desire which in spite of all longs to believe that in some way or other the universe resembles the old beloved infinite and infinitely creative god that in some way or other the old god still lives that longing of spinoza's which is expressed in the words dies siva natura what he really felt was natura siva dies which then is the proposition and belief in which the decisive change the present preponderance of the scientific spirit over the religious and god fancying spirit is best formulated ought it not to be the universe as force must not be thought of as unlimited because it cannot be thought of in this way we forbid ourselves the concept infinite force because it is incompatible with the idea of force whence it follows that the universe lacks the power of eternal renewal the principle of the conservation of energy inevitably involves eternal recurrence that a state of equilibrium has never been reached proves that it is impossible but in infinite space it must have been reached likewise in spherical space 
the form of space must be the cause of the eternal movement and ultimately of all imperfection that energy and stability and immutability are contradictory the measure of energy dimensionally is fixed though it is essentially fluid that which is timeless must be refuted any given moment of energy the absolute conditions for a new distribution of all forces are present it cannot remain stationary change is part of its essence therefore time is as well by this means however the necessity of change has only been established once more in theory a certain emperor always bore the fleeting nature of all things in his mind in order not to value them too seriously and to be able to live quietly in their midst conversely everything seems to me much too important for it to be so fleeting i seek an eternity for everything ought one to pour the most precious salves and wines into the sea my consolation is that everything that has been is eternal the sea will wash it up again the new concept of the universe the universe exists it is nothing that grows into existence and that passes out of existence or better still it develops it passes away but it never began to develop and has never ceased from passing away it maintains itself in both states it lives on itself its excrements are its nourishment we need not concern ourselves for one instant with the hypothesis of a created world the concept create is today utterly indefinable and unrealizable it is but a word which hails from superstitious ages nothing can be explained with a word the last attempt that was made to conceive of a world that began occurred quite recently in many cases with the help of logical reasoning generally too as you will guess with an ulterior theological motive several attempts have been made lately to show that the concept that the universe has an infinite past regresses in infinitum is contradictory it was even demonstrated it is true at the price of confounding the head with the tail nothing can prevent me from calculating backwards from this moment of time and of saying i shall never reach the end just as i can calculate without end in a forward direction from the same moment it is only when i wish to commit the air i shall be careful to avoid it of reconciling this correct concept of a regressus in infinitum with the absolutely unrealizable concept of a finite progressus up to the present only when i consider the direction forwards or backwards as logically indifferent that i take hold of the head this very moment and think i hold the tail this pleasure i leave to you mr during i have come across this thought in other thinkers before me and every time i found that it was determined by other ulterior motives chiefly theological in favor of a creator spiritus if the universe were in any way able to congeal to dry up to perish or if it were capable of attaining to a state of equilibrium or if it had any kind of goal at all which a long lapse of time immutability and finality reserved for it in short to speak metaphysically if becoming could resolve itself into being or into non-entity this state ought already to have been reached but it has not been reached it therefore follows this is the only certainty we can grasp which can serve as a corrective to a host of cosmic hypotheses possible in themselves if for instance materialism cannot consistently escape the conclusion of a finite state which william thompson has traced out for it then materialism is thereby refuted 
if the universe may be conceived as a definite quantity of energy as a definite number of centers of energy and every other concept remains indefinite and therefore useless it follows therefrom that the universe must go through a calculable number of combinations in the great game of chance which constitutes its existence in infinity at some moment or other every possible combination must once have been realized not only this but it must have been realized an infinite number of times and inasmuch as between every one of these combinations and its next recurrence every other possible combination would necessarily have been undergone and since every one of these combinations would determine the whole series in the same order a circular movement of absolutely identical series is thus demonstrated the universe is thus shown to be a circular movement which has already repeated itself an infinite number of times and which plays its game for all eternity this conception is not simply materialistic for if it were this it would not involve an infinite recurrence of identical cases but a finite state owing to the fact that the universe has not reached this finite state materialism shows itself to be but an imperfect and provisional hypothesis and do ye know what the universe is to my mind shall i show it to you in my mirror this universe is a monster of energy without beginning or end a fixed and brazen quantity of energy which grows neither bigger nor smaller which does not consume itself but only alters its face as a whole its bulk is immutable it is a household without either losses or gains but likewise without increase and without sources of revenue surrounded by non-entity as by a frontier it is nothing vague or wasteful it does not stretch into infinity but it is a definite quantum of energy located in limited space and not in space which would be anywhere empty it is rather energy everywhere the play of forces and force waves at the same time one and many agglomerating here and diminishing there a sea of forces storming and raging in itself forever changing forever rolling back over incalculable ages of recurrence with an ebb and flow of its forms producing the most complicated things out of the most simple structures producing the most ardent most savage and most contradictory things out of the quietest most rigid and most frozen material and then returning from multifariousness to uniformity from the play of contradictions back into the delight of consonance saying yea unto itself even in this homogeneity of its courses and ages forever blessing itself as something which recurs for all eternity a becoming which knows not satiety or disgust or weariness this my dionysian world of eternal self-creation of eternal self-destruction this mysterious world of twofold voluptuousness this my beyond good and evil without aim unless there is an aim in the bliss of the circle without will unless a ring must by nature keep good will to itself would you have a name for my world a solution to all your riddles do ye also want a light ye most concealed strongest and most undaunted men of the blackest midnight this world is the will to power and nothing else and even ye yourselves are this will to power and nothing besides end of 
eternal recurrence by friedrich nietzsche from the will to power book four james wilson lined biographer seventeen seventy five eighteen forty five wilson's introduction to the eighteen thirty five edition of his biography of the blind or lives of such as have distinguished themselves as poets philosophers artists etc as well as a few particulars of the life of the author this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org introduction the branch of biography which the following pages exhibit has not until now been entered on as a distinct subject in all preceding works the lives of the blind have been classed and confounded with those of others and though the individuals have been pointed out as objects of admiration and astonishment yet no work has appeared in which they have been considered in a proper point of view as a class of men seemingly separated from society cut off as it were from the whole visible world and deprived of the most valuable faculty that man can possess yet in many instances overcoming all those difficulties which would have been thought insurmountable had not experience proved the contrary in the pursuit of knowledge the blind have been very successful and many of them have acquired the first literary honors that their own or foreign universities could confer in the different branches of philosophy if they have not excelled they have been equal to many of their contemporaries but more particularly in the science of mathematics many of them having been able to solve the most abstruse problems in algebra in poetry they have been equally distinguished two of the greatest men that ever courted the muses labored under the deprivation of sight homer the venerable father of epic poetry and the inimitable author of paradise lost these two illustrious bards will live in the minds of every true lover of poetry as long as learning and learned men shall have a place in the page of history in philosophy saunderson and euler appear in the most conspicuous point of view the former lost his sight when only twelve months old but was enabled by the strength of his comprehensive genius to delineate the phenomena of the rainbow with all the variegated beauty of colors and to clear up several dark and mysterious passages which appeared in newton's principia and though the latter did not lose his sight until he arrived at the years of manhood yet from that period he was able to astonish the world by his labors in the rich fields of science where he earned those laurels which still continue to flourish in unfaded bloom he had the honor of settling that dispute which has so long divided the opinions of the philosophers of europe respecting the newtonian and cartesian systems by deciding in favor of newton to the satisfaction of all parties the treasures of his fertile genius still enriched the academies of paris basel berlin and st petersburg in mechanics the blind have gone to considerable length almost to surpass the bounds of probability were not the facts supported by evidence of unquestionable authority here we find architects building bridges drawing plans of new roads and executing them to the satisfaction of the commissioners these roads are still to be seen through the counties of york and lancaster where they have been carried through the most difficult parts of the country over bogs and mountains indeed there are few branches of mechanics in which the blind have not excelled it was of trifling importance to me at what time of life or by what cause the subjects of these memoirs lost their sight 
provided they distinguished themselves after they became blind my principal object was to exemplify the powers of the human mind under one of the greatest privations to which man is exposed in this life it was partly with a view of rescuing my fellow sufferers from the neglect and obscurity in which many of them were involved that induced me to undertake the present work an undertaking attended with immense toil and laborious research this will readily be allowed when it is considered that i had often to depend on the kindness of strangers for the loan of such books as were requisite for my purpose and even to supply the place of a reader or amanuensis however after surmounting the various difficulties with which i had to contend in eighteen twenty the work made its appearance in one volume twelve m o the reception it met with from the public was gratifying to my feelings and far exceeded my expectations the present edition is very much improved and enlarged many new and interesting subjects being added which i hope will meet with the approbation of my kind friends and generous subscribers james wilson a few particulars of the life of the author i was born may the twenty fourth seventeen seventy nine in richmond state of virginia north america my father john wilson was a native of scotland his family was originally of queen's ferry a small village in fifeshire about eleven miles from edinburgh he had an uncle who emigrated to america when a young man as a mechanic where by honest industry and prudent economy he soon amassed a considerable property he wrote for my father who was then about eighteen years of age and promised to make him his heir in case he would come to america my grandfather hesitated for some time but at length consented and preparations were accordingly made for my father's departure who sailed from greenock and arrived safe at norfolk from whence he was forwarded by a merchant of that place and soon reached richmond where he was gladly received by his uncle this man being in the decline of life without a family and bowed down by infirmities now looked upon his nephew as the comfort of his life and the support of his declining years and therefore entrusted him with the entire management of his affairs which he had the happiness of conducting to the old man's satisfaction thus he continued to act till the death of his uncle in seventeen seventy five when he found himself in possession of three thousand pounds value in money and landed property prior to this event my father on a visit to baltimore got acquainted with my mother elizabeth johnson to her he was introduced by an intimate friend a mr freeman whom i may have occasion to mention hereafter his uncle on hearing this could not bear the idea of a matrimonial connection during his life and so stood as a grand barrier to the completion of his wishes but after the decease of the old man being left to think and act for himself as soon as his affairs were settled he hastened to baltimore where the long wished for union took place shortly after his marriage he returned again to virginia his whole mind was now bent to the improvement of his plantation and the acquiring of a paternal inheritance for his offspring flushed with the hope of spending the eve of life on a fertile estate that amply rewarded the hand of industry of spending it in the bosom of his family and of tasting the pleasures which domestic retirement affords he followed his avocation with alacrity and could say in the midst of his enjoyments the winter's night and summer's day glide imperceptibly away but alas how uncertain are human prospects and worldly possessions how often do they wither in the bud or bloom like the rose to be blasted when full-blown how repeatedly do they sicken even in enjoyment 
and what appears at a distance like a beautiful verdant hill degenerates on a close survey into a rugged barren rock this moment the sky is bright the air is serene and the sun of our prosperity beams forth in unclouded splendor and in the next blackness and darkness envelop us around the cloud of adversity bursts upon our devoted heads and we are overwhelmed by the storm it was so with my father and of course the misfortune was entailed on me the disturbance which took place at boston was at first considered only a riot but it shortly began to assume a more formidable aspect the insurgents were soon embodied throughout all the colonies and the insurrection became general between them and the loyal party no neutrality was allowed and every man was finally under the necessity of joining one side or the other for some time indeed my father strove to avoid taking an active part but he was soon convinced that this was totally impossible many of his early friends had embraced the cause of the revolutionists and were very anxious that he should join their party to incite him to this several advantageous offers were made to him and when this expedient failed threats were resorted to exercising the right which belongs to every man in politics as well as in religion i mean the right of private judgment he in conjunction with a number of his neighbors enrolled himself in a corps of volunteers for the joint purpose of defending private property and supporting the royal cause it would indeed be painful to me to enter minutely into the sufferings of my parents at this eventful period suffice it to say they were stripped of their all and were left destitute and forlorn down to the period of which i am now speaking no political question had ever given rise to more controversy than the american war it is not my business to enter into a discussion of the subject all that remains necessary for me to say is a word or two in relation to my father's political conduct that man who would not rejoice in being able to speak well of a departed parent is not entitled to the name of man and cannot be characterized by the feelings common to our nature it affords me then a degree of pleasure to reflect that my father must have acted throughout from principle on this point i am perfectly satisfied when i consider him rejecting emolument despising threats volunteering in the royal cause forsaking his own home and thereby leaving his family and property exposed braving every danger serving during five campaigns and continuing active in the cause he had espoused as long as he could be useful to it being attached to that part of the army under the immediate command of lord cornwallis he was taken prisoner when that gallant general was compelled to surrender to a superior force his health during these disasters was much impaired and on being liberated he thought of returning to europe in hopes that the air of his native country would restore him to his wonted state of health and vigor my mother was now residing near new york in the house of a friend and thither he directed his steps there he abode for a year and found his health so much improved that he determined to lose no more time in america and so prepared to recross the atlantic and anxious to review his native shore upon the roaring waves embarked once more bound for liverpool under the guidance of captain smith the vessel set sail and my parents bade a final adieu to the shores of columbia what his feelings were at this crisis it would be difficult to describe separated from that country in which his best hopes centered cut off from the enjoyment of his legal possessions without a probability of ever regaining them impaired in his constitution and crossed in all his former prospects we may view him 
mourning over his misfortunes and devising plans for his future exertions it is true he might have consoled himself with the pleasing reflection that he was now about to revisit his native land to meet with his nearest relations and best friends and to spend the remainder of his days in the place of his nativity in peace and safety but how vain and transient are the hopes of mortal man all his joys and sorrows hopes and fears anxious cares and premature plans were shortly to terminate with himself and i was to be left at four years of age destitute of a father they had scarcely lost sight of land when his disease returned with increased violence and twelve days after the vessel left new york he expired the reader will not consider my situation as deplorable while he thinks that still i had a mother to take care of me and to assist me in my childish years true i had a mother and a mother who survived my father but it was only for twenty minutes for she being in the last stage of pregnancy the alarm occasioned by his death brought on premature labor and terminated her existence thus on a sudden i lost both father and mother saw them sewed up in the same hammock and committed to a watery grave here my misfortunes did not end i was seized by the smallpox and for want of a mother's care and proper medical aid this most loathsome disease deprived me of my sight after a long and dangerous voyage it being a hurricane almost all the time the captain was obliged to put into belfast harbor as the ship had suffered much in her masts rigging etc and the crew were nearly exhausted when we arrived there i had not recovered from the effects of my late illness the symptoms of which were at one period so violent as to threaten instant dissolution to make me the more comfortable i was sent immediately to belfast there was no time lost by captain smith in applying to the churchwarden in my behalf and in order to prevent me from becoming a charge to the parish he deposited in his hands a sum of money sufficient to pay the expense of supporting me for five years i was soon provided with a nurse the ship being now completely repaired the benevolent captain and kind-hearted crew left me in belfast a total stranger no one knew me nor had ever heard anything of my family my situation at this time was truly pitiable as i was deprived of my parents at the time i most required their care still however i was under the protection of a merciful providence who can temper the wind to the shorn lamb in his word he has promised to be a father to the fatherless and to me this gracious saying has certainly been fulfilled many of the first families in the kingdom i can rank among my kindest friends and to nothing can i attribute this but to the influence of his providence who inclines the hearts of men to that which is pleasing in his sight my nurse was a good-natured old woman and the anxiety which she showed for my recovery was much greater than could be expected from a stranger night after night she sat by me attended to my calls and administered to my wants with all that maternal tenderness which a fond mother manifests to the child of her bosom the prayers which she offered up in my behalf and the tears of sympathy which stole down her aged cheek bespoke a heart that could feel for the miseries of a fellow creature contrary to all expectation i recovered and in the course of a few months i was able to grope my way through the house alone shortly after this my right eye was couched by the late surgeon wilson and in consequence of this operation i could soon discern the surrounding objects and their various colors this was certainly a great mercy 
for though the enjoyment did not continue long yet the recollection of it affords me pleasure even to the present day one day when about seven years of age as i crossed the street i was attacked and dreadfully mangled by an ill-natured cow this accident nearly cost me my life and deprived me of that sight which was in a great degree restored and which i have never since enjoyed thus it was the will of providence to baffle the efforts of human ingenuity and to doom me to perpetual blindness and this reflection enables me to bear my misfortunes without repining a few years after this event my foster mother died and again i was left forlorn and without a friend in this precarious state the only means i had of obtaining subsistence were apparently ill-suited to my situation the reader may perhaps smile when i inform him that at this time i was considered by many as a man of letters and that i earned my bread in consequence of my practical engagements in relation to them this indeed was the case for i was employed to carry letters to and from the offices of the different merchants in the town and neighborhood my punctuality and dispatch in this respect were much in my favor so that i was generally employed in preference to those who enjoyed the use of all their senses in the course of time my sphere was enlarged and often on important business i have borne dispatches to the distance of thirty or forty miles this was certainly not a little extraordinary in a place where the confusion and bustle of business subjected me to many dangers being advised to attempt the study of music i made an almost fruitless effort as i had no person to instruct me but although i could only scrape a few tunes which i had learned by ear this did not prevent me from being called on occasionally to officiate at dances for no matter how despicable the musician or insignificant his instrument the sound operates like an invisible charm elevates the passions of the lower orders makes them shake their grief and their cares off at their heels and moving on the light fantastic toe causes them to forget the bitterness of the past and prevents them from brooding over the prospect of future evils and happy though my harsh touch faltering still but mocked all time and marred the dancer's skill yet would the village praise my wondrous power and dance forgetful of the noontide hour i soon found in consequence of this avocation that i was exposed to numerous vices i was obliged to associate with the dregs of society to witness many scenes of folly and great wickedness to stay out late at nights and thus expose myself to dangers of different kinds as my feelings were continually at variance with this occupation which i adopted more from necessity than choice i soon gave it up and composed a farewell address to my fiddle the family in which i lived was both poor and illiterate not one among them could spell their own name and hence i was a considerable time before i acquired any taste for knowledge it was painful indeed both in towns and villages to behold the ignorance and wickedness which prevailed among children of both sexes swearing lying and throwing stones and the feelings of the passengers while walking along were not only hurt by the profane language of these culprits but their personal safety was always in danger from the stones which were carelessly and mischievously flung around them but thanks be to god this evil is at length disappearing the remedy applied has been successful and that remedy is the sunday schools in the districts where these institutions are established the children both in their appearance and manners have undergone a great change for the better instead of injuring their neighbors and breaking the lord's day they are now taught to read the scriptures which under the divine blessing qualifies them to fill the various situations in society 
they are also taught to honor their parents that they may obtain the blessing which god has promised unto the children of obedience that their days may be long in the land which the lord their god giveth them these doctrines may be lightly looked upon by some but it is in a breach of these laws a disregard for these truths that originate all the crimes which disgrace the character of man and degrade him below the brutes of the field i present these circumstances to the reader that he may know the kind of society in which i mingled during the first fifteen years of my life it cannot be imagined that much information could be derived from such a source as this about this time i began to pay some attention to books but my first course of reading was indeed of a very indifferent description i was obliged to listen to what was most convenient however i made the best of what i heard and in a short time in conjunction with a boy of my own age who read to me i was master of the principal circumstances in jack the giant killer valentine and orson robinson crusoe and gulliver's travels the subject matter of these formed my taste was swallowed with avidity and inspired me with a degree of enthusiasm which awakes even at the present day on hearing a new and interesting work read these however were soon laid aside for novels and romances several hundred volumes of which i procured and got read in the course of three years but although there are few passages out of all i heard then which i think worth a place in my recollection now yet at that time i was well acquainted with the most interesting characters and events contained in these works my present dislike to this kind of reading i do not entertain without reason for first a great deal of precious time is thereby spent that might be more usefully employed secondly the judgment is left without exercise while the passions are inflamed and thirdly those who are much in the habit of novel reading seldom have a taste for books of any other kind and hence their judgments of men and things must differ as far from his who has seen the world as most novels differ from real life i am well aware that some of them are well written and display ability in the author have the circumstances well disposed the characters ably delineated and the effect preserved till the final close of the last scene which generally proves interesting and affecting but to what does all this tend except in recording the customs and manners of the times which they represent only to mislead the imagination to foster a morbid sensibility to fictitious woe and a romantic admiration of ideal and unattainable perfection without strengthening the judgment cultivating active benevolence or a just appreciation of real life in contrasting the characters of tom jones and sir charles grandison with those of the duke of sully and lord clarendon we observe a striking difference between the real and fictitious personages yet the mere novel reader is neither improved nor amused in reading the lives of these illustrious characters while the tear of sympathy steals down the cheek as he pours over the imaginary sufferings of his heroes and heroines there are i know many novels to which the above observations do not apply particularly some of modern date which are very superior to those above mentioned but still the best even of these present overcharged pictures of real life and in proportion as they are fascinating they indispose the mind to more serious reading at this time the french revolution gave a sudden turn to the posture of affairs in europe and every mail which arrived brought an account of some important change in the political state of that unhappy country all the powers of the continent now armed against france and she on her part received them with a firmness which reflected honor upon her arms 
the public mind at this period was much agitated and wisest politicians of the day were filled with alarm and dreaded the consequences which were likely to result from a revolution that threatened every government in europe with a total overthrow for my part i had little to lose as an individual and the only concern i felt was for the safety of my country politics therefore became my favorite study and i soon got acquainted with the passing news of the day a late writer in speaking of memory calls it the storehouse of the mind but it has often been compared to a well-constructed arch on which the more weight is laid the stronger it becomes this i found to be the case with mine for the more i committed to it the more i found it was capable of receiving and retaining in what manner ideas of extrinsic objects and notions of certain relations can be preserved in the mind it is impossible to determine but of this we are sure that the thing is so though the manner be unknown to us as ideas and recollections are merely immaterial things which can in no wise partake of the known properties of matter so the receptacle in which they lodge must be of a similar nature that matter and spirit are united we have no reason to doubt for the pleasures which arise from memory in the moment of reflection are evidently operative on the body inasmuch as its motions and gestures are expressive of the inward feelings of the mind as the memory therefore is more or less capacious as the store of ideas laid up there is great or little and as those ideas are pleasing or unpleasing in themselves so the recollection of them is either powerful or weak either pleasing or painful as my taste always inclined to literature and the knowledge of things valuable in themselves consequently the remembrance of them is a never failing source of amusement to me whether i be found in the void waste or in the city full it was now indeed that i was able to appreciate the pleasures of memory in a superior degree i knew the names stations and admirals of almost all the ships in the navy and was also acquainted with the number facing and name of every regiment in the army according to their respective towns cities or shires from which they were raised i served of course as an army and navy list for the poor in the neighborhood who had relations in either of these departments and was capable of informing them of all the general news the following anecdote shows the powers of my memory at that period being invited by a friend to spend an evening at his house i had scarcely sat down when three gentlemen entered the conversation turned on the news of the day i was requested by my friend to repeat the names of as many of the ships of the british navy as i could recollect telling me that he had a particular reason for making the request i commenced and my friend marked them down as i went along until i had repeated six hundred and twenty when he stopped me saying i had gone far enough the cause of the request was then explained one of the gentlemen had wagered a supper that i could not mention five hundred he however expressed himself much pleased at his loss having been as he acknowledged highly entertained by the experiment although at this time i had little relish for any other kind of reading but newspapers and novels yet i was not wholly insensible to the charms of poetry i amused myself with making verses at intervals but i could never produce anything in that way which pleased myself my acquaintances particularly the young people gave me sufficient employment in composing epigrams love songs epistles and acrostics in praise of their sweethearts many of those juvenile productions are still extant and though miserable in themselves continue to find admirers among the classes for whom they were composed the first of my productions which met the public eye was an elegy on the death of an unfortunate female 
this poor maniac was known for more than twenty years in the neighborhood of belfast by the appellation of mad mary she was found dead in the ruins of an old house where she had taken refuge during a stormy winter night this little piece being much noticed on account of the subject having excited a general interest i was advised to collect my best productions and give them to the public encouraged by the patronage of a few generous individuals i set about the work which in a few months made its appearance in the early part of life i prided myself much on my activity as a pedestrian i have frequently travelled through a part of the country with which i was totally unacquainted at the rate of thirty miles in a day but this was only in case of emergency for my usual rate was from fifteen to twenty miles this however is too much for a person in my situation for supposing a blind man sets out to travel on foot alone to a distance of twenty miles he will experience much more fatigue and go over more ground than he who has his sight will do in a journey twice that length this is evident from the zigzag manner in which he traverses the road and as hammond says in his description of the drunken man staggering home quote, from the serpentine manner in which he goes he makes as much of a mile as possible end quote. in the summer time the blind man subjects his whole frame to a shock by trampling in the cart ruts that are dried upon the roads and in winter he travels through thick and thin it is impossible for him to choose his steps and at this season of the year the water is collected into puddles on the road which he cannot avoid and hence in walking to a distance he is sure to wet both his feet and legs which is not only disagreeable but frequently injurious to his health at one time he bruises his foot against a stone at another he sprains his ankle and frequently when stepping out quickly his foot comes in contact with something unexpectedly by which he is thrown on his face thus in travelling on foot he labours under various disadvantages unknown to those who are blessed with a sense of sight the above accidents however are not the only misfortunes connected with the state of the blind in walking alone he often wanders out of his direct way sometimes into fields and sometimes into by-paths so that the greater part of the day may be spent before he can rectify his mistake often have i been in this predicament myself and frequently have i sat a considerable part of the day listening by the wayside for a passing foot or the joyful sound of the human voice and sometimes have i been obliged in the evening to retrace the ground i had gone over in the morning and thus endured much fatigue of body and mind before i could regain the road from which i had wandered how different then is my situation from the person who is possessed of sight from the impediments which cause me so much pain he is happily exempt while he pursues his journey he can trace the various beauties of the surrounding scenery the picturesque landscape the spreading oak the flowing brook the towering mountain that hides its blue summit in the clouds the majestic ocean dashing upon the shelly shore and the vast expansive arch of heaven bespangled with innumerable stars have all for him their respective beauties and fail not to awaken pleasing and agreeable sensations but to the blind these pleasures are unknown the charms of nature are concealed under an impenetrable veil and the god of light has placed between him and silent but animated nature an insuperable barrier a blind person always inclines to the hand in which his staff is carried and this often has a tendency to lead him astray when he travels on a road with which he is unacquainted but were there no danger arising from this still from his situation he is liable to imminent dangers on his way from which nothing can preserve him but an all directing providence and this i have frequently experienced in a cold winter's evening as i travelled to lisburn i happened to wander from the direct road into a lane 
which led immediately to the canal unconscious of the danger to which i was exposed i was stepping on pretty freely when my attention was suddenly arrested by a cry of stop stop of the first or second call i took no notice as i judged some other person was addressed but at the third warning i stopped when a woman came running up almost breathless and asked me where i was going i replied to lisburn no said she you are going directly to the canal and three or four steps more would have plunged you into it my heart glowed with thankfulness to the all-wise disposer of events and to the female who was made the instrument of my preservation she said she happened to come to the door to throw out some slops when she saw me posting on and thinking from my manner of walking that i was intoxicated she became alarmed for my safety as a person had been drowned in the very same place not many days before about three miles from strabane at the little village of cloddy there is a bridge across the finn i had just passed along it on my way to strabane when a man inquired if i had been conducted over by any person i replied in the negative it was a fortunate circumstance then indeed said he that you kept the left side for the range wall is broken down on the right side just above the center arch and the river there is very rapid and the bank on each side steep had you fallen in you must have been inevitably lost the following instance of providential preservation is still more singular than either of the preceding from ballymena i was one day going out to the rev robert stewart's at the end of the town the road divides and one branch leads to ballymena and the other to browshane in the fork an old well was opened for the purpose of sinking a pump it being one o'clock in the day the workmen were all at dinner i was groping about with my staff to ascertain the turn of the road when a man bawled out to me to stand still and not move a single step i did so when he came forward and told me that two steps more would have hurried me into a well eighty feet deep and half full of water he held me by the arm and made me put forth my staff to feel and be convinced of my danger and when i found that i was actually not more than two yards from the edge the blood ran cold in my veins these are but a few of the numerous instances of hair breath escapes which i have experienced in my peregrinations through life in the year eighteen hundred there was an institution established in belfast for the purpose of instructing those who were deprived of sight in such employments as were suited to their unfortunate situation this was styled the asylum for the blind i entered myself on the books of the institution as an apprentice and continued until within a few months of its dissolution when i left the asylum i proposed working on my own account and having acquired a partial knowledge of the upholstery business i was soon employed my friends exerted themselves on this occasion to promote my interest and though there were several individuals who had learned the business in the same asylum and who could work better than i yet i generally got the preference many of my friends went so far as even to contrive work for me for which they had not immediate use merely to keep me employed although my pecuniary circumstances were not much improved yet i now experienced a greater share of mental happiness than i had ever enjoyed before i was in a situation that offered me better opportunities of acquiring knowledge than i had ever possessed previous to this time in eighteen thirty three a number of young men formed a reading society in belfast and although they were all mechanics yet were they also men of taste and some of them were possessed of considerable talents into this society i was admitted a member at the same time i was kindly exempted from the expense attending its regulations one of the members was a man of the most extraordinary character i had ever known and therefore i attached myself to him to good nature he united an original genius 
a good taste and extreme sensibility and had an early education been his lot or had his mind been sufficiently expanded by study he would have become an ornament to society this man proposed to read to me if i would procure books our stated hour for this employment was from nine o'clock in the evening until one in the morning in the winter season and from seven until eleven in the summer when i was not particularly engaged i frequently attended him at other intervals at breakfast he had half an hour allotted to him at dinner a whole hour every minute of this was filled up for he generally read to me between every cup of tea and by this means i committed to memory a vast collection of pieces both in prose and verse which i still retain and which have been until the present hour a never failing source of amusement to me the more i heard the more my desire for knowledge increased while i learned at the same time that the more a man knows he finds he knows the less so ardent and steady was my desire for knowledge at that time that i could never bear to be absent a single night from my friend and often when working in the country where i could have been comfortably accommodated i have travelled three or four miles in a severe winter's night to be at my post in time pinched with cold and drenched with rain i have many a time sat down and listened for several hours together to the writings of plutarch roland or clarendon for seven or eight years we continued this course of reading but to give a catalogue of the authors we perused in that time would be foreign to my present purpose suffice it to say that every book in the english language which we could procure was read with avidity ancient and modern history poetry biography essays magazines voyages travels etc were among our studies the persons to whom i had entrusted the management of my little domestic concerns did not hesitate to take advantage of my ignorance of such affairs as well as of my situation many of my friends felt for me and advised me strongly to marry as i should be more comfortable and out of the power of these unprincipled people they said that could i meet with a sober steady woman who would be likely to make a good wife the change would be advantageous to me in more respects than one i objected to this proposal on the grounds of my inability to provide for a family the precarious manner of earning my subsistence put such an idea beyond my expectations it was enough for me to suffer alone i could not think of entailing misery upon others this they could not deny but then they put the question in this way they thought no one required the kind assistance of an affectionate wife more than a blind man they said i had not one friend one relative to look after me what would become of me in my old age i should be helpless in the extreme these and many other arguments were used to induce me to assent to a measure which they thought would finally conduce to my happiness their ideas have been fully justified i am happy i had the pleasure of being known for some time to a young woman who lived in the neighborhood i had met her occasionally at the house of a friend where i used to visit her plain and unassuming manners recommended her to my notice but what endeared her to me most was her filial piety she lived with her aged mother and they were respected by all who knew them without any other dependence than the work of her own hands she supported herself and her parent i thought that she who was such an attentive and feeling daughter must necessarily make an affectionate wife and in this opinion i was not disappointed filial affection is so endearing a virtue that whenever we meet with an instance of it whether in an exalted or humble station the exercise of it must to the benevolent mind be a source of the highest gratification it is a duty which our gracious and kind creator 
has enjoined us to fulfill commanding in his holy word to honor our father and mother as an inducement or motive to the performance of which he has promised that our days shall be long in the land and he who has promised this is able and willing to perform i addressed a copy of verses to her who had now become the object of my affection which were printed in the first collection of my poems they had the desired effect they produced an impression which has never been and i may venture to say never will be effaced after the expiration of two years our correspondence happily terminated and we were married on the twenty seventh of november eighteen o two and though she could boast of no high descent no personal accomplishments nor of having brought me any fortune yet she was possessed of such qualities as every virtuous mind will admire she was sober chaste and unassuming and though her education was not according to the rules laid down by miss hamilton yet she understood in her own way the principles of domestic economy prudence and frugality well has the wise man described a virtuous woman when he says who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies we have now lived thirty-two years together happy in each other's society and though we have had many trials in the course of that time such as the loss of children bad health and distressed circumstances a murmur never escaped her lips in our pilgrimage here below these little crosses are necessary they teach us to know ourselves were we to pass the little time which is allotted to us in this world without trials and afflictions we should soon forget that we are dependent creatures but a merciful providence has wisely guarded us against these dangers by letting us know our infirmities and how little we can do for ourselves we are assured in the word of god that he never afflicts his creatures but for their good and when these visitations are sanctified by his holy spirit they then become profitable to us they wean us as it were from the world and we become sick of its flimsy joys and imaginary pleasures we learn from them that here we have no abiding city but we seek one to come we have had eleven children six of whom are still alive and with the exception of those diseases which are common to their years they are all healthy and stout it is certainly one of the greatest blessings which parents can enjoy to see a vigorous offspring rise around them and listen to their innocent prattle how often have i been struck with the force and beauty of that passage in holy writ where jesus in order to teach humility unto his disciples called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them to descend from the divine author of our religion to creatures like ourselves we read in cox's life of that pious reformer melanchthon that he was particularly fond of his children and notwithstanding the multiplicity of his engagements the discharge of which in those perilous times was attended with difficulties and danger yet would he often descend from that lofty station where genius and public opinion had enthroned him to the more endearing scenes of domestic retirement a frenchman one day found him holding a book in one hand and with the other rocking his child's cradle upon his manifesting considerable surprise melanchthon took occasion from this incident to converse with his visitor on the duties of parents and on the regard of heaven for little children in such a pious and affectionate manner that his astonishment was quickly transformed into admiration january eighteen thirty five end of james wilson blind biographer seventeen seventy five eighteen forty five wilson's introduction to the 1835 edition of his biography of the blind or lives of such as have distinguished themselves as poets philosophers artists etc 
as well as a few particulars of the life of the author read for librivox by sue anderson letter to lord chesterfield by samuel johnson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org to the right honourable the earl of chesterfield february 1755 my lord I have been lately informed by the proprietor of the world that two papers in which my dictionary is recommended to the public were written by your lordship. To be so distinguished is an honour which, being very little accustomed to favours from the great, I know not well how to receive or in what terms to acknowledge. When upon some slight encouragement I first visited your lordship, I was overpowered, like the rest of mankind, by the enchantment of your dress, and could not forbear to wish that I might boast myself le vainqueur du vainqueur de la terre, that I might obtain that regard for which I saw the world contending. But I found my attendance so little encouraged that neither pride nor modesty would suffer me to continue it. When I had once addressed your lordship in public, I had exhausted all the art of pleasing which a retired and uncourtly scholar can possess. I had done all that I could, and no man is well pleased to have his all neglected, be it ever so little. Seven years, my lord, have now passed since I waited in your outward rooms, or was repulsed from your door, during which time I have been pushing on my work through difficulties of which it is useless to complain, and have brought it at last to the verge of publication without one act of assistance, one word of encouragement, or one smile of favour. Such treatment I did not expect, for I had never had a patron before. The shepherd in Virgil grew at last acquainted with love, and found him a native of the rocks. Is not a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern on a man struggling for life in the water, and when he has reached ground, encumbers him with help? The notice which you have been pleased to take of my labours, had it been early, had been kind, but it has been delayed till I am indifferent and cannot enjoy it, till I am solitary and cannot impart it, till I am known and do not want it. I hope it is no very cynical asperity not to confess obligations where no benefit has been received, or to be unwilling that the public should consider me as owing that to a patron which Providence has enabled me to do for myself. Having carried on my work thus far with so little obligation to any favour of learning, I shall not be disappointed, though I should conclude it, if less be possible, with less. For I have been long wakened from that dream of hope in which I once boasted myself with so much exultation. My lord, your lordship's most humble, most obedient servant, Sam Johnson. End of the letter to Lord Chesterfield by Samuel Johnson. Read by Daniel Davison. Lincoln Day Address by Booker T. Washington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. An address by Booker T. Washington, Principal, Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, Tuskegee, Alabama, delivered under the auspices of the Armstrong Association Lincoln Day Exercises at the Madison Square Garden Concert Hall, New York, New York, February 12, 1898. Not long ago, said an old colored man in Alabama to me, I's done quit living in de ashes. 
I's got my second freedom. That remark meant that this old man, by economy, hard work, and proper guidance, after twenty years of severe struggle, had freed himself from debt, had paid for fifty acres of land, and built a comfortable house, was a taxpayer, that his two sons had been educated in academic and agricultural branches, and that his daughter had received mental training in connection with sewing and cooking. With a few limitations, here was an American Christian home, the results of individual effort and philanthropy. This Negro had been given a chance to get upon his feet. That is all which any Negro in America asks for. What position in state, letters, or commerce the offspring of his family is to occupy must be left to the future and the capacity of the race. That race may have a new birth, a new freedom in habits of thrift, economy, and industrial development I take to be the meaning of this meeting. If this be true, I believe that the second birth, this new baptism of the race into the best methods of agriculture, mechanical and commercial life, and respect for labor, will bring blessings not less than those given us by our great emancipator, whose birthday we celebrate. Freedom from debt, comfortable homes, profitable employment, intelligence, bring a self-respect and confidence without which no race can get on its feet. During the years of slavery, we were shielded from competition. Today, unless we prepare to compete with the outside world, we shall go to the wall as a race. Despite the curse of slavery during those dark and bitter days, God was preparing the way for the solution of the race problem along the line of industrial training. The slave master who wanted a house built or a suit of clothes made went to a Negro carpenter or tailor. Every large slave plantation was, in a limited sense, an industrial school. On these plantations, thousands were taught common farming, others carpentry, others brick masonry, others sewing and cooking. Thus, at the beginning of our freedom, we found ourselves in possession of the common and skilled labor of the South. For twenty years after freedom, except in the case of General Armstrong, our patron saint, whose name will go down in history linked with that of the immortal Lincoln, we overlooked what had been taking place on these plantations for more than two centuries. We were educated in the book, which was all right. But gradually, those who learned to be skilled laborers during slavery disappeared by death. Then it was that we began to realize that we were training no colored youths to take their places. Then it was that another race from foreign lands began to take from us our birthright. This legacy in the form of skilled labor that was purchased by our forefathers at the price of 250 years of slavery. That we may hold our own in the industrial and business world, we must learn to put brains and skill into the common occupations about our doors, and we must learn to dignify common labor. It is an easy matter to project the mental development of a race beyond its ability to supply the wants thereby increased. In all parts of the country there should be a more vital and practical connection between the Negro's educated brain and his opportunity for earning his daily living. In the present condition of my race, that knowledge of chemistry will mean most which will make forty bushels of corn grow where only twenty bushels have grown. That knowledge of mathematics will be most helpful that will construct a three-room cottage to replace the one-room cabin. That literature most potent, which will make the girl the thorough mistress of modern household economy. The race sees it. The race wants it. You must push the button, and we will do the rest. All this is not as an end, but as a means to the higher life. It is beyond our duty to set meets and bounds upon the aspirations and achievements of any race. But it is our duty to see that the foundation is fitly laid. It is a hard thing to put much Christianity into a hungry man. There is one thing in which my race excels yours. When it comes to thinking, you can excel us. In feeling, we can excel you. I would not have my race change much in this respect, but I would have the man who likes to sing, shout, and get happy in church on Sunday, 
taught to mix in during the week with his religious zeal and fervor habits of thrift economy and with land in a house or two or three rooms a little bank account just as the white man does industrial development coupled with religious and mental development will bring a change in the civil and political status of the south and this if for no other reason should enlist the active aid and sympathy of every patriotic citizen in the north those who revere the name of lincoln should see to it that we do not fail in the reaping of the full fruit of his life and martyrdom in this matter let us take high ground a negro that has learned to respect a white man is tenfold greater than a white man who hates a negro i propose that the negro shall take his place upon the high and undisputed ground of usefulness and generosity and that he invite the white man to step up and occupy this position with him from this position i would have the negro forgive the past and adjust himself to the present from this position i would have him teach that no race can wrong another race without himself being dragged down so long as my race is submerged in poverty and ignorance so long as with hooks of steel will we drag down and retard the upward growth of the white man in the south if the negro's degradation tempts one to steal his ballot remember that it is the one who commits the theft that is permanently injured you owe it not less to yourselves than to your white brethren in the south that this load be lifted from their shoulders industrial training will help to do it strike a common interest in the affairs of life and prejudice melts away a few weeks ago a black man of brains and skill in alabama produced two hundred sixty one bushels of sweet potatoes on a single acre of land twice as much as any white man in that community had produced and every one of the dozen white men who came to see how it was done was ready to take off his hat to this black man not a bit of prejudice against those two hundred sixty one bushels of sweet potatoes it is along this line that we are to settle this problem and along this line it is slowly but surely working itself out but let us not be deceived it is not settled yet a recent close investigation teaches me that in the black belt of the south we have not more than touched the edges says the great teacher i will draw all men unto me how not by force not by law not by superficial ornamentation following in the footsteps of the lowly nazarene we will continue with your help to work and wait till by the exercise of the higher virtues by the products of our brains and hands we shall make ourselves so important to the american people that they will accord us all the rights of manhood and citizenship by reason of our intrinsic worth end of lincoln day address by booker t washington Madame Yukio Ozaki, a biographical sketch by Mrs. Hugh Fraser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Yukio Ozaki. In the attempt to describe a character, it is wise to begin, if possible, with its distinguishing attribute the one which will leave its mark on the time after the popularity of definite achievements may have passed away. So I will say, before going any further into the subject of this sketch, that if I were asked to single out the person who, today, most truly apprehends the points of contact and divergence in the thought of East and West, I would name the gentle, dark-eyed lady who is the light of an ancient house in the loveliest part of Tokyo, a spot where, as she sits under the great pines of her garden, she can hear the long Pacific rollers breaking on the white beaches of Japan, and listen to the wind as it murmurs its haunting songs of other homes in distant lands where she is known and loved. For though Yei Theodora Ozaki is a daughter of the East in heart and soul and parentage, one to whom all the fine ways and thoughts of it come by nature, she is also a child of the West in training, in culture in the intellectual justice which enables her to discern the greatnesses and smile indulgently at the littlenesses of both her father baron saburo ozaki the descendant of a kyoto samurai family a member of the house of peers and a privy councillor 
was one of the first Japanese who went to England to study its language and institutions. While there, he made the acquaintance of Miss Bathia Catherine Morrison, and shortly afterwards she became his wife. This lady was the daughter of William Morrison Esquire, a profound scholar and linguist, who would have been more famous had not his attainments, great as they were, been overshadowed by those of his brother, the Reverend Alexander Morrison, whose translations of the works of German philosophers and historians placed much valuable material at the disposal of English readers. William Morrison's name, however, was known and loved in Japan many years before his little granddaughter Ye, the illustrious flower petal, was born, for he was the instructor of most of the Japanese great men who went to England to learn the ways and speech of modern enlightenment. Prince Mori, Marquis Inoue, Baron Suyematsu, and many others who afterwards rose to eminence were among his pupils, and when Baron Ozaki became his son-in-law, it would have been natural to conclude that Miss Morrison was fairly familiar already with many sides of the complex Japanese character. But the union was not a happy one, and when several years later I made her acquaintance, I thought I could divine the reason. She was a charming and intelligent woman, but she was English to the backbone, and it was impossible for her to appreciate or sympathize with anything that was not British, and Saburo Ozaki was as fundamentally Japanese. Five years after their marriage, they separated by mutual consent. Three little girls, of whom Ye Theodora was the second, remained in England with their mother and received a very thorough English education. Mr. Morrison took great interest in Oye and brought her many books, which she devoured greedily, having inherited all his love of literature and learning. I have often heard her say that whatever ability she possesses in that direction is due to her English grandfather. She was just 16 when Baron Ozaki insisted upon her coming out to live with him in Japan, and she gladly complied with his wishes. On meeting her after their long separation, he was delighted with her charming grace, and pleasantly surprised to find that in appearance she was quite a Japanese maiden, small and slender, with dark eyes, pale complexion, and a mass of glossy black hair. Accustomed to rule as an autocrat over his household, he decreed that henceforth she was to be only Japanese. She was quite willing to please him in this, so far as she could. The pretty, picturesque ways of her new home appealed to her artistic instinct, and the traditions and ideals of Japanese life at once claimed her for their own. Her mental inheritance responded to them joyfully. But this was not quite enough for her father. His duty, from his point of view, was to arrange a suitable marriage for her as soon as possible. But here he met with unexpected difficulty. The example of her parents' estrangement had inspired the girl with something like terror of the married state, and she had grown up with the resolve not to run the risk of contracting a like ill-assorted union. In consequence, she found herself in opposition to her father, an impossible situation in a Japanese family, and especially undesirable where there were younger children growing up, as in this case, for Baron Ozaki had married again after his return to his own country. Various other circumstances also combined to make her decide at this time to become independent. Her knowledge of English qualified her to give instruction in that language, and her superior education and well-known social position brought her many pupils in a land where teaching is looked upon as the highest of all professions. In this way, many interesting friendships were formed with Japanese girls, one of whom opened for her the doors of that treasure house of story, the ancient lore and romance of Japan. Here the ardent, sensitive mind was in its element. She says, During those early years I loved the heroes and heroines of my country with passionate and romantic devotion. They were the companions of my solitude, royal and remote, yet near and potential as the white fire of girlhood's idealisms. They peopled my visions with beautiful images, tender and brave and loyal. In those days I was often reproached with being a dreamer, but my dreams were all of fair and noble things. The old stories had taken possession of me. They were a wonder, a joy, an exaltation, though I little imagined that I would ever write them down. It was during this period of her life that there came a temporary parting of the ways, and Europe again claimed Oye for a time. My husband was the British minister in Tokyo, and we proposed to Baron Ozaki's daughter that she should come and live with us, acting as my secretary and companion. She accepted and became not only a dearly loved friend, but an invaluable assistant to me, contributing very materially to the success of my various books on Japan by her profound knowledge of the country and the people. 
When I returned to Europe, she followed me and remained with us in Italy for about two years. A part of this time she spent in the house of my brother, Marion Crawford, acting as his amanuensis and cataloguing his great library with such precision and intelligence that he remarked to me, Miss Ozaki is a very exceptional person. I had not imagined that the work could be so well done. My brother discerned her literary talent and first suggested to her that she should write and publish the stories of old Japan, which she used to tell in the family circle to the delight of old and young. You have the gifts of imagination and of language, he said to her. You really ought to lecture on those stories. You would have a great success. Italy was a revelation to Oye. Her love of color and romance was satisfied there, and the never-silent music of the South, the gay yet haunting songs of the people, found a ready echo in her sweet voice, her delicate guitar playing. But her heart had always turned faithfully to her English mother, and when I went to live in London she passed some time there, contributing her first stories and articles to the English magazines. Then she returned to Japan, where the famous educator, Mr. Fukuzawa, had offered her a post in his school. Of all her varied experiences, this was the strangest. The slight, shy girl had a class of 200 young men and boys to instruct and keep in order, but from the crowded classroom she returned to the eeriest and loneliest of dwellings. She says, I lived in the upper story of an old Buddhist temple, really enjoying the queerness and out-of-the-worldness of it. Under my windows was a graveyard, where on summer nights I used to look for ghosts, but I had a terrible time with the cold and the drafts and the rats in winter. Sometimes I was awakened at dawn by the sound of gongs and bells, and would look out of my window to see a funeral procession marshaled in the courtyard. In her spare time she continued to write, and various articles and fairy stories of hers appeared in The Wide World, The Girl's Realm, and The Lady's Realm. At last her health broke down and she gave up her post at the school and devoted herself more closely to literary work, which resulted in 1903 in the publication of the Japanese fairy book, a work which has now become a classic. At the same time, she belonged to several of the societies, patriotic, educational, and charitable, by which the Japanese ladies so quietly yet so efficiently aid the cause of true progress in their country. Indeed, it was in the interests of Japanese womanhood that she first took up her pen, resolved to dispel the hopeless misconceptions which existed in regard to it in Western minds. To use her own words, when I was last in England and Europe, and found by the questions asked me that very mistaken notions about Japan, and especially about its women, existed generally, I determined, if possible, to write so as to dispel these wrong conceptions. Hence my stories of Japanese heroines, Eoyagi and Keisa Gozen in the 19th century, and Tomae Gozen last year, Ladies Pictorial. It has been my hope, too, that the ancient tales and legends retold in English may show to the West some of the good old ideals and sentiments for which the Japanese lived and died. But other than purely studious interests entered into Oye's life, she had many friends in the court and diplomatic circles, and they drew her more and more into society where she was always a welcome addition to any gathering. She saw every side of the national existence, imperial, official, scholastic, and was equally intimate with the small but brilliant foreign society. Her single state was a mystery to all except her closest friends. They knew that she had resolved never to marry until she met a man who should fulfill all her ideals. She met him at last. In 1904, she made the acquaintance of Yukio Ozaki, the mayor of Tokyo. Each had long known of the other, and various amusing complications had occurred through mistakes of the postman, who, owing to identity of name, there was no connection of family, sometimes got hopelessly confused and delivered the mayor's letters to the young lady and the young lady's correspondence to the mayor, from the moment when the two first met at a big dinner party and laughed together over the postman's mistakes, the result was a foregone conclusion. Mr. Ozaki had already learned all that his friends could tell him about the intellectual, attractive girl whose independent, resolute spirit had in no way marred her gentle womanliness. She knew him equally well by reputation, and to hear of Yukio Ozaki in Japan is to admire and respect him. Many were the parents, both wealthy and noble, who after his first wife's death would gladly have had him for a son-in-law. His irreproachable morals and elevated character earned for him during this period the title Nihon no Daiichi no Omusoko-san, 
the first best bridegroom in all Japan. But he too nursed an ideal, and was not to be drawn into new ties until he had found it. Given two such beings, it needed but one kindly touch of fate's wand to bring them together. The result was a marriage happy in its perfect romance, and blessed with the deep sympathy of tastes and interests, which forms the surest foundation for married felicity. I returned to Japan a few weeks before the wedding took place, and counted myself fortunate in gaining the friendship of Yukio Ozaki. My first impressions of him could be summed up in a very few words, strength, calmness, largeness of heart. The fearless glance of his eyes, the noble carriage of his fine dark head, the quiet voice and direct yet eloquent speech, all this was the fitting index to a character which, through many long years of public stress and strain, has never let even a passing shadow flit over its crystal sincerity and loyalty. Political corruption, temptations of personal ambition, lures of advancement, popular feeling, the outcries of opponents, and the applause of adherents, all these have assailed him in vain, have fallen like broken arrows from the shield of his spotless integrity. A Japanese writer says of him, Mr. Yukio Ozaki has had a wonderful political career. He is a born orator, the most powerful debater and the ablest writer in Japan, a staunch fighter for the cause of liberty and the interests of the people, one of the political magnates and a potent factor in the introduction of the Meiji civilization, a man who is above every form of political corruption, once the Minister for Education and now the highly renowned mayor of Tokyo, who has never missed a single election for the 25 sessions of the Diet of Japan. Mr. Ozaki is a strenuous and untiring worker. In his character of mayor, no detail is too small for him to go into patiently. Drainage, street cleaning, water supply, market regulations, everything that can conduce to the health and morals of the city passes under his watchful eyes, and Tokyo is governed marvelously well. His scrupulous conscientiousness leads him to take upon himself a thousand minutiae, which another man would hand over to his subordinates. I shall never forget the searching orders that were promulgated to prepare the capital for the return of the troops from Manchuria. Hundreds of thousands of men, war-worn and ragged, with all their invalids, were to be arriving for months together, and no one could tell what germs of disease might come with them. So before the first detachment reached Shimbashi, a house-to-house -house visitation was made, the most thorough cleaning and clearing away of rubbish was insisted upon, and the entire foundations of the dwellings, as well as the outhouses and gateways, were copiously sprinkled with chloride of lime. Tokyo sneezed, Tokyo wept, but Tokyo had no epidemics. Besides all his responsibilities as mayor, a post which he has filled for seven years, Mr. Ozaki has great political duties to occupy his time. He has steadily refused to attach himself to any party in particular, and, though he has many supporters in the Diet, is an absolutely independent statesman, judging all measures from his only standpoints, right and wrong, and the best interests of the country. This uncompromising attitude has made many enemies for him, but even they admire and respect him, knowing that he is a man who is said to evil, Stand thou on that side, for on this am I. There is another side to his character, the love of all that is beautiful and inspiring. No one who saw the triumphal return of Admiral Togo can forget the splendid scene of that imposing ceremony, attended by half a million people, and so deftly organized that all could see the hero and the man who welcomed him in the country's name. The welcome came from the nation's heart and found adequate expression in Yukio Ozaki's magnificent address, delivered in the voice whose clear tones had ever sounded in the cause of true patriotism. The thrill of deepest feeling was in them that day, and I, who stood near the speaker, saw that his hand trembled and his eyes were suffused with emotion as he welcomed the beloved old sailor back in glory to the country he had saved. One more superb pageant, one where Yukio Ozaki and his bride were host and hostess, returns to my memory, the fete given to Prince Arthur of Connaught in 1906. This was the largest social reunion that has ever taken place in the East, and most regally was the illustrious visitor entertained. In the beautifully wooded park, a banqueting pavilion had been erected in the purest style of ancient Japanese architecture, severely harmonious in outline and detail. The interior contained, among other decorations, 
a great collection of rare Japanese flowers, shrubs, and dwarf trees, pines and maples hundreds of years old, and, from hoary trunk to newborn feathery branch tip, perfect miniatures of their spreading, towering brethren of the forest. The crowning feature of the day was the daimyo's procession, a mile long, which defiled before our eyes across the great lawns in the open air. For this, the last survivors of the feudal epoch had been brought out and brought in from every part of Japan, old samurai who had accompanied their imperious masters in many a famous progress, and had cut down all and any who had the temerity to cross their path. In joyful arrogance they came to show a degenerate world the martial splendors of their younger days, and the sight was enough to make one overlook the wrongs and dangers of the dead time and only regret that so much color and fire had to be swept away to make room for the nation's new life. For things like these, all art lovers are grateful to Yukio Ozaki, but his two or three intimate friends have more exquisite moments to thank him for. Let me take you to my favorite garden, he said one day when I was with him and his wife, the Garden of the Seven Flowers of Autumn. The sun was setting as we drove for miles beside the river bank, Leaving the city far behind, we came, through leafy lanes, to a half-hidden gate through which we passed into a dreamland of misty beauty, all shadowy and subdued in the late October twilight. Great pale moonflowers swung like scarce-lit lamps from tree and trellis. Feathery autumn grasses waved their plumes below. The dark, velvety paths led to dim monuments on whose gray stones we could feel rather than read the deep-cut characters of classic poems. All was imbued with the tender melancholy which brings repose, not pain. And even now, in hours of stress and weariness, my memory returns to the starlit peace that reigns o' nights in the spirit-haunted garden of the seven flowers of autumn. Things like these mean more to Yukio Ozaki and his wife than all the social and public side of their existence. Both have the proud, delicate reserves of the aristocrat of mind and soul, and escape whenever they can from the publicity which has been forced upon them. It required much persuasion to obtain their permission for this sketch to be published. Madame Ozaki's last words on the subject were, It is true that my life is varied and exceedingly interesting. One night I may dine at a state banquet with cabinet ministers and foreign ambassadors, or with distinguished visitors like Mr. and Mrs. Taft, who recently visited this country. The next will find me with a purely Japanese party at the Maple Club. I assist at the court functions, the imperial wedding receptions. I act as sponsor or go-between at Japanese marriage ceremonies. I see all the ins and outs of Japanese life. I seem to live in the heart of two distinct civilizations, those of the East and the West, but the East is my spirit's fatherland. My mind still turns for companionship to the great ones of the past, the heroines of my country's history. I find no greater pleasure in the old classical drama of the No with its Buddhist teachings and ideals, its human tragedies of chivalry and of sorrow, than in all the sensational and spectacular modern drama. But my greatest happiness is in my home life, in the companionship of my baby daughter, in the few short hours that my husband can snatch from his work to devote to me. If you must write about us, tell people about Yukio. He is so good and great. I have no wish to be mentioned apart from him. Mary Crawford Fraser Note. Mr. Ozaki's collected works have just been published in Japan. They include many essays on public and literary topics, original poems, and a translation into Japanese of the life of Lord Beaconsfield. Madame Ozaki's writings include The Shinto Firewalking, The Hot Water Ordeal, Nikko Festival, Singing Insects of Japan, and many articles on travel and folklore, The Japanese Fairy Book, Japanese in Time of War, Japanese Peeresses in Tableau, Stories of Japanese Heroines, Buddha's Crystal in 1908, and Japanese Girls' Home Accomplishments in 1909. End of Madame Yukio Ozaki, a biographical sketch by Mrs. Hugh Fraser. Read by Colleen McMahon. On Some Mental Effects of the Earthquake by William James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Some Mental Effects of the Earthquake 
by William James. When I departed from Harvard for Stanford University last December, almost the last goodbye I got was that of my old Californian friend B. I hope they give you a touch of the earthquake while you're there, so that you may also become acquainted with that California institution. Accordingly, when lying awake at about half past five on the morning of April 18 in my little flat on the campus of Stanford, I felt the bed begin to waggle. My first consciousness was one of gleeful recognition of the nature of the movement. By Jove, I said to myself, here's B's old earthquake after all. And then, as it went crescendo, and a jolly good one it is, too, I said. Sitting up involuntarily and taking a kneeling position, I was thrown down on my face as it went fortier, shaking the room exactly as a terrier shakes a rat. Then everything that was on anything else slid off to the floor. Over went bureau and chiffonier with a crash. As the fortissimo was reached, plaster cracked. An awful roaring noise seemed to fill the outer air, and in an instant all was still again, save the soft babble of human voices from far and near that soon began to make itself heard as the inhabitants in costumes, negligees, and various degrees sought the greater safety of the street and yielded to the passionate desire for sympathetic communication. The thing was over, as I understand the Lick Observatory to have declared, in 48 seconds. To me it felt as if about that length of time, although I have heard others say that it seemed to them longer. In my case, sensation and emotion were so strong that little thought and no reflection or volition were possible in the short time consumed by the phenomenon. The emotion consisted wholly of glee and admiration. Glee at the vividness which such an abstract idea or verbal term as earthquake could put on when translated into sensible reality and verified concretely, an admiration at the way in which the frail little wooden house could hold itself together in spite of such a shaking. I felt no trace whatever of fear. It was pure delight and welcome. Go it, I almost cried aloud, and go it stronger. I ran into my wife's room and found that she, although awakened from sound sleep, had felt no fear either. Of all the persons whom I later interrogated, very few had felt any fear while the shaking lasted, although many had a turn as they realized their narrow escapes from bookcases or bricks from chimney breasts falling on their beds and pillows an instant after they had left them. As soon as I could think, I discerned retrospectively certain peculiar ways in which my consciousness had taken in the phenomenon. These ways were quite spontaneous and, so to speak, inevitable and irresistible. First, I personified the earthquake as a permanent individual entity. It was the earthquake of my friend B's augury, which had been lying low and holding itself back during all the intervening months in order on that lustrous April morning to invade my room and energize the more intensely and triumphantly. It came, moreover, directly to me. It stole in behind my back and once inside the room had me all to itself and could manifest itself convincingly. Animus and intent were never more present in any human action, nor did any human activity ever more definitively point back to a living agent as its source and origin. All whom I consulted on the point agreed as to this feature in their experience. It expressed intention. It was vicious. It was bent on destruction. It wanted to show its power, or what not. To me, it wanted simply to manifest the full meaning of its name. But what was this it? To some, apparently, a vague demonic power. To me, an individualized being. B's earthquake, namely. One informant interpreted it as the end of the world and the beginning of the final judgment. This was a lady in a San Francisco hotel who did not think of it as being an earthquake until after she had gotten into the street and someone had explained it to her. She told me that the theological interpretation had kept fear from her mind and made her take the shaking calmly. For science, when the tensions in the earth crust reach the breaking point and strata fall into an altered equilibrium, earthquake is simply the collective name of all the cracks and shakings and disturbances that happen. They are the earthquake. But for me, the earthquake was the cause of the disturbances, and the perception of it as a living agent was irresistible. It had an overpowering, dramatic convincingness. 
I realize now, better than ever, how inevitable were men's earlier mythological versions of such catastrophes, and how artificial and against the grain of our spontaneous perceiving are the later habits in which science educates us. It was simply impossible for untutored men to take earthquakes into their minds as anything but supernatural warnings or retributions. A good instance of the way in which the tremendousness of a catastrophe may banish fear was given me by a Stanford student. He was in the fourth story of Encina Hall, an immense stone dormitory building. Awakened from sleep, he recognized what the disturbance was and sprang from the bed, but was thrown off his feet in a moment while his books and furniture fell around him. Then, with an awful, sinister, grinding roar, everything gave way, and with chimneys, floor beams, walls, and all, he descended through the three lower stories of the building into the basement. This is my end, this is my death, he felt, but all the while no trace of fear. The experience was too overwhelming for anything but passive surrender to it. Certain heavy chimneys had fallen in, carrying the whole center of the building with them. Arrived at the bottom, he found himself with rafters and debris around him, but not pinned in or crushed. He saw daylight and crept toward it through the obstacles. Then realizing that he was in his nightgown and feeling no pain anywhere, his first thought was to get back to his room and find some more presentable clothing. The stairways at Encino Hall are at the ends of the building. He made his way to one of them and went up the four flights, only to find his room no longer extant. Then he noticed pain in his feet, which had been injured, and came down the stairs with difficulty. When he talked with me ten days later, he had been in hospital a week, was very thin and pale, and went on crutches, and was dressed in borrowed clothing. So much for Stanford, where all our experiences seemed to have been very similar. Nearly all our chimneys went down, some of them disintegrating from top to bottom. Parlor floors were covered with bricks, plaster strewed the floors, furniture was everywhere upset and dislocated. But the wooden dwellings sprang back to their original position, and in house after house not a window stuck or a door scraped at top or bottom. Wood architecture was triumphant. Everyone was excited, but the excitement, at first at any rate, seemed to be almost joyous. Here at last was a real earthquake, after so many years of harmless waggle. Above all, there was an irresistible desire to talk about it and exchange experiences. Most people slept outdoors for several subsequent nights, partly to be safer in case of recurrence, but also to work off their emotion and get the full unusualness out of the experience. The vocal babble of early waking girls and boys from the gardens of the campus Mingling with the bird songs and the exquisite weather was for three or four days delightful sunrise phenomenon. Now turn to San Francisco, 35 miles distant, from which an automobile ere long brought us the dire news of a city in ruins, with fires beginning at various points and the water supply interrupted. I was fortunate enough to board the only train of cars, a very small one, that got up to the city. Fortunate enough also to escape in the evening by the only train that left it. This gave me and my valiant feminine escort some four hours of observation. My business is with subjective phenomena exclusively, so I will say nothing of the material ruin that greeted us on every hand. The daily papers and the weekly journals have done full justice to that topic. By midday, when we reached the city, the pall of smoke was vast and the dynamite detonations had begun, but the troops, the police, and the firemen seemed to have established order. Dangerous neighborhoods were roped off everywhere and picketed, saloons closed, vehicles impressed, and everyone at work who could work. It was indeed a strange sight to see an entire population in the streets, busy as ants in an uncovered anthill, scurrying to save their eggs and larvae. Every horse and everything on wheels in the city, from hucksters' wagons to automobiles, was being loaded with what effects could be scraped together from houses which the advancing flames were threatening. The sidewalks were covered with well-dressed men and women, carrying baskets, bundles, valises, or dragging trunks to spots of greater temporary safety, soon to be dragged farther as the fire kept spreading. In the safer quarters, every doorstep was covered with the dwelling's tenants, sitting surrounded with their more indispensable chattels, and ready to leave at a minute's notice. I think every one must have fasted on that day, for I saw no one eating. There was no appearance of general dismay, and little of chatter or incoordinated excitement. 
Everyone seemed doggedly bent on achieving the job which he had set himself to perform, and the faces, although somewhat tense and set and grave, were inexpressive of emotion. I noticed only three persons overcome. Two Italian women, very poor, embracing an aged fellow countrywoman, and all weeping. Physical fatigue and seriousness were the only inner states that one could read on countenances. With lights forbidden in the houses, and the streets lighted only by the conflagration, it was apprehended that the criminals of San Francisco would hold high carnival on the ensuing night. But whether they feared the disciplinary methods of the United States troops, who were visible everywhere, or whether they were themselves solemnized by the immensity of the disaster, they lay low and did not manifest, either then or subsequently. The only very discreditable thing to human nature that occurred was later, when hundreds of lazy bummers found that they could keep camping in the parks and make alimentary storage batteries of their stomachs, even in some cases getting enough of the free rations in their huts or tents to last them well into the summer. This charm of pulperized vagabondage seems all along to have been Satan's most serious bait to human nature. There was theft from the outset, but confined, I believe, to petty pilfering. Cash in hand was the only money and millionaires and their families were no better off in this respect than anyone. Whoever got a vehicle could have the use of it, but the richest often went without and spent the first two nights on rugs on the bare ground with nothing but what their own arms had rescued. Fortunately, those nights were dry and comparatively warm, and Californians are accustomed to camping conditions in the summer, so suffering from exposure was less great than it would have been elsewhere. By the fourth night, which was rainy, tents and huts had brought most campers under cover. I went through the city again, eight days later. The fire was out, and about a quarter of the area stood unconsumed. Intact skyscrapers dominated the smoking level majestically and superbly, they and a few walls that had survived the overthrow. Thus, as the courage of our architects and builders received triumphant vindication, the inert elements of the population had mostly got away, and those that remained seemed what Mr. H. G. Wells calls efficients. Sheds were already going up as temporary starting points of business. Everyone looked cheerful, in spite of the awful discontinuity of past and future, with every familiar association of material things dissevered, and the discipline and order were practically perfect. As these notes of mine must be short, I had better turn to my more generalized reflections. Two things in retrospect strike me especially, and are the most emphatic of all my impressions. Both are reassuring as to human nature. The first of these was the rapidity of the improvisation of order out of chaos. It is clear that, just as in every thousand human beings, there will be statistically so many artists, so many athletes, so many thinkers, and so many potentially good soldiers, so there will be so many potential organizers in times of emergency. In point of fact, not only in the great city, but in the outlying towns, these natural order-makers, whether amateurs or officials, came to the front immediately. There seemed to be no possibility which there was not someone there to think of, or which within twenty-four hours was not in some way provided for. A good illustration is this. Mr. Keith is the great landscape painter of the Pacific Slope, and his pictures, which are many, are artistically and pecuniarily precious. Two citizens, lovers of his work, early in the day diverted their attention from all other interests, their own private ones included, and made it their duty to visit every place which they knew to contain a Keith painting. They cut them from their frames, rolled them up, and in this way got all the more important ones into a place of safety. When they then sought Mr. Keith to convey the joyous news to him, they found him still in his studio, which was remote from the fire, beginning a new painting. Having given up his previous work for lost, he had resolved to lose no time in making what amends he could for the disaster. The completeness of organization of Palo Alto, a town of 10,000 inhabitants close to Stanford University, was almost comical. People feared exodus on a great scale of the rowdy elements of San Francisco. In point of fact, very few refugees came to Palo Alto. But within twenty-four hours, rations, clothing, hospital, quarantine, disinfection, washing, police, military, quarters in camp and in houses, printed information, employment, all were provided for under the care of so many volunteer committees. Much of this readiness was American, much of it Californian. 
But I believe that every country in a similar crisis would have displayed it in a way to astonish the spectators. Like soldiering, it lies always latent in human nature. The second thing that struck me was the universal equanimity. We soon got letters from the East, ringing with anxiety and pathos, but I now know fully what I have always believed, that the pathetic way of feeling great disasters belongs rather to the point of view of people at a distance than to the immediate victims. I heard not a single really pathetic or sentimental word in California expressed by anyone. The terms awful, dreadful, fell often enough from people's lips, but always with a sort of abstract meaning, and with a face that seemed to admire the vastness of the catastrophe as much as it bewailed its cuttingness. When talk was not directly practical, I might almost say that it expressed, at any rate in the nine days I was there, a tendency more toward nervous excitement than toward grief. The hearts concealed private bitterness enough, no doubt, but the tongues disdained to dwell on the misfortunes of self, when almost anybody one spoke to had suffered equally. Surely the cutting edge of all our usual misfortunes comes from their character of loneliness. We lose our health, our wife or children die, our house burns down, or our money is made away with, and the world goes on rejoicing, leaving us on one side and counting us out from all its business. In California, everyone to some degree was suffering, and one's private miseries were merged in the vast general sum of privation and in the all-absorbing practical problem of general recuperation. The cheerfulness, or at any rate the steadfastness of tone, was universal. Not a single whine or plaintive word did I hear from the hundred losers whom I spoke to. Instead of that, there was a temper of helpfulness beyond the counting. It is easy to glorify this as something characteristically American, or especially Californian. Californian education has, of course, made the thought of all possible recuperations easy. In an exhausted country with no marginal resources, the outlook on the future would be much darker. But I like to think that what I write of is a normal and universal trait of human nature. In our drawing rooms and offices, we wonder how people ever go through battles, sieges, and shipwrecks. We quiver and sicken in imagination and think those heroes superhuman. Physical pain, whether suffered alone or in company, is always more or less unnerving and intolerable, but mental pathos and anguish, I fancy, are usually effects of distance. At the place of action, where all are concerned together, healthy animal insensibility and hardiness take their place. At San Francisco, the need will continue to be awful, and there will doubtless be a crop of nervous wrecks before the weeks and months are over. But meanwhile, the commonest men, simply because they are men, will go on, singly and collectively, showing this admirable fortitude of temper. End of Some Mental Effects of the Earthquake by William James Recording by Winston Tharp Original People by Anna Cora Mollett Ritchie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Put forth an original book, an original play, an original achievement in art an original invention of science, and what a clamorous welcome echoes throughout Vanity Fair. What a grand eloquent praises are trumpeted from the lips of its graceful boothkeepers. Taking their cue from some outside oracle, what enthusiasm, what powers of appreciation, what critical acumen they display. But, usher into the presence of good society, the presiding genius of that polite mart, an original person, oh, that is quite different, an intolerable innovation, a social nuisance. Good society is shocked that the intruder bears so little resemblance to the charming creatures whom she has stamped and molded and curtailed of too luxuriant physical and mental proportion. 
She scans the singular individual with questioning and disapproving eyes, and of what a number of crimes, according to her code, she finds him guilty. His fervid nature has melted the smooth, waxed mask of polished simulation and reveals strongly marked lineaments, deep lines, and uncompromising coloring. He has sought out the stature of his own soul and found it was not just the measure of any other man's. He has burst the straitjacket of cramping conventionality that his vigorous faculties might have free play. He has walked out of the verdureless, even-trotted path leading to nothing, which myriads of feet are trampling with unprogressive treadmill motion. He has rent asunder what Aurora Lee calls the violet bands of social figments. He has dared to think for himself, to judge for himself, to act for himself, and not by the arbitrary law some feebler spirit has established. Convicted of these delinquencies, good society brands him with the terrible stigma of eccentric, odd, mad, and how quickly her handmaiden ridicule points at him her scornful finger, greets him with her dread laugh, and pursues him with her caustic jest. Eccentricity is such a fair subject for merriment, such an offense to good taste, such a parlor monster. Let us have none of it in these mincing kid glove dancing shoe days. They are not at all dull, then, those stereotyped transcripts of commonplace humanity whom we encounter at every turn of this popular vanity fair. They are not at all wearisome, then, those men and women led by the tinkling of custom's weather bell, those fashion plate patterns of one another in dress, those etiquette book copies of each other in manners, those living illustrations of propriety who have been taught to move with the same motion, speak in the same tone, think the same thoughts, crowd down their souls into the same narrow actual, and shut the door against the contemplation of any high possible. Then, too, we must account them very wise in their conclusion that, although an act may be good, may be of importance to mankind, may be a deed which justice or honor dictates, yet if it would look singular, if it has not been done by some other of their set before, oh, shocking! It is to be shunned and denounced. What pleasant, profitable companions they make, these repetition people! What great actions, great benefits, and great examples the world may hope from them. They have escaped the dreadful imputation of eccentricity. Is not that the summum bonum of a man or woman's existence? Shall we venture to remind them that not as a tree, not as a leaf, not a flower, not a blade of grass is fashioned by the divine hand precisely similar to any other. Not a single human being is created without distinctive features and characteristics, and that by the attempt of those servile copyists to conceal or obliterate the wonderful spiritual and physical individuality given to each, they tacitly rebuke the infinite diversity of the Creator's works? Shall we also dare to hint to them that as the eccentricities of genius is a common expression, it may possibly suggest the inference that where there is most genius, there is usually most originality of thought, consequentially originality or eccentricity of expression, manner, and action? Thus may we not arrive at the potential deduction that original or eccentric people are usually persons endowed with uncommon capacities, if not gifted with positive genius? For ourselves, we have the bad taste to avow the contact with thoroughly original spirits is to us refreshing and enlivening in the highest degree how their presence awakens, stirs up a sluggish, dead-alive coterie, 
how they infuse new ideas, new pulses, new vitality into lower, duller, more torpid organizations, how they reinvigorate the great social artery by a process which resembles the physical practice patent in other days of injecting buoyant, healthy blood into the flaccid veins of the feeble and dying. These original minds force us to think, startle us into feeling, make us ashamed of our own insignificance, inspire us to search out the purposes of our being, cried Excelsior in our ears, impel us onward in the path of progress, and so we bid them all hail. We would not exchange one hour in the society of these strong and strengthening natures for a lifetime wasted, basking in the meaningless smiles, listening to the pretty nothings of the most charming duplicate, of the most perfect model good society ever stamped with her superlative praise of uneccentric, unexceptionable. End of Original People by Anna Cora Mollett Read by Kelly Taylor Reflections of a Stained Glass Master Chapter 20 of Stained Glass Work A Textbook for Students and Workers in Glass by Christopher Wall, 1905 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 20. A String of Beads Is there anything more to say? A whole world full, of course, for every single thing is a part of all things. But I have said most of my say, and I could now wish that you were here, that you might ask me aught else you want. A few threads remain that might be gathered up, parting words, hints that cannot be classified. I must string them together like a row of beads, big and little mixed. We will try to get the big ones more or less in the middle if we can. Grow everything from seed. All seeds that are living, and therefore worth growing, have the power in them to grow but so many people miss the fact that on the other hand nothing else will grow and that it is useless in art to transplant full-grown trees this is the key to great and little miseries great and little mistakes were you sorry to be the lowest step of the ladder be glad for all your hopes of climbing are in that and this applies in all things from conditions of success and methods of getting work up to the highest questions of art and the steps to parnassus by which i reach the very loftiest of ideals i must not linger over the former of these two things or do more than sum it up in the advice to take anything you can get and to be glad not sorry if it is small and comes to you but slowly simple things and little things and many things are more needed in the arts today than complex things and great and isolated achievements if you have nothing to do for others do some little thing for yourself it is a seed presently it will send out a shoot of your first commission and that will probably lead to two others or to a larger one but pray to be led by small steps and make sure of firm footing as you go for there is such a thing as trying to take a leap on the ladder and leaping off it so much for the seed of success but though i said that nothing will grow but seed it does not of course follow that every seed will grow or if it does that you yourself will reap the exact harvest you expect or even recognize it in its fruitage as the growth of what you have sown expect to give much for little to lose sight of the bread cast on the waters 
not even sure that you will know it again even if you find it after many days you never know and therefore do not count your scalps too carefully or try to number your israel and judah neither on the other hand allow your seed to be forced by the hothouse of advertising or business pushing or anything which will distract or distort that quiet gaze upon the work by which you love it for its own sake and judge it on its merits all such sidelights are misleading since you do not know whether it is intended that this or that shall prosper or both be alike good how many a man one sees earnest and sincere at starting led aside off the track by the false lights of publicity and a first success art is peace do things because you love them if purple is your favorite color put purple in your window if green green if yellow yellow flowers and leaves and buds because you love them glass because you love it it is not that you are to despise either fame or wealth honestly acquired both are good but you must bear in mind that the pursuit of these separately by any other means than perfecting your work is a thing requiring great outlay of time and you cannot afford to withdraw any time from your work in order to acquire them in these days and in our huge cities there are so many avenues open to celebrity through society the press exhibition and so forth that a man once led to spend time on them is in danger of finding half his working life run away with by them before he is aware while even if they are successful the success won by them is a poor thing compared to that which might have been earned by the work which was sacrificed for them it becomes almost a profession in itself to keep oneself notorious to spend large slices out of one's time in the mere putting forward of one's work showing it apart from doing it necessary as this sometimes is is a thing to be done grudgingly still more so should one grudge to be called from one's work here there and everywhere by the social claims which crowd round the position of a public man there are strenuous things enough for you in the work itself without wasting your strength on these we will speak of them presently but a word first upon originality don't strive to be original no one ever got heaven's gift of invention by saying i must have it and since i don't feel it i must assume it and pretend it follow rather your master patiently and lovingly for a long time give and take echo his habits as botticelli echoed filippo lippi's but improve upon them add something to them if you can as he also did and pass them on as he also did to the little filippo filippino making him a truer and sweeter heart than his father out of the well of truth and sweetness with which botticelli's own heart was brimming do this but at the same time expect with happy patience as a boy longs for his manhood yet does not try to hasten it and does not pretend to forestall it the time when some fresh idea in imagination some fresh method in design some fresh process in craftsmanship will come to you as a reward of patient working and come by accident as all such things do lest you should think it your own and miss the joy of knowing that it is not yours but heaven's and when this comes guard it and mature it carefully do not throw it out too lavishly broadcast with the ostentation of a generous genius having gifts to spare share it with proved and worthy friends when they notice it and ask you about it but in the meanwhile develop and cultivate it as a gardener does a tree 
and this leads me to the most important point of all namely the value the all-sufficing value of one new step on the road of beauty if such is really granted you consider it enough for your lifetime one such thing in the history of the arts has generally been enough for a century how much more then for a generation for indeed there is only one rule for fine work in art that you should put your whole strength all the powers of mind and body into every touch nothing less will do than that you must face it in drawing from the life try it in its acutest form not from the posed professional model who will sit like a stone try it with children two years old or so the despair of it the exhaustion and then in a flash when you thought you had really done somewhat a still more captivating fascinating gesture which makes all you have done look like lead can you screw your exhaustion up again sacrifice all you have done and face the labor of wrestling with the new idea and if you do you are sick with doubt between the new and the old you ask your friends you probably choose wrong your judgment is clouded from the fatigue of your previous toil but you have gained strength that is the real point of the thing it is not what you have done in this instance but what you have become in doing it next time fresh and strong you will dash the beautiful sudden thought upon the paper and leave it happy to make others happy but only through the pains you took before which are a small price to pay for the joy of the strength you have gained this is the rule of great work puzzle and hesitation and compromise can only occur because you have left some factor of the problem out of count and this should never be your business is to take all into account and to sacrifice everything however fascinating and tempting it may be in itself if it does not fit in as a part of a harmonious whole remember in this case when loath to make such sacrifice the old saying that there's as good fish in the sea as ever came out brace yourself to try for something still better recast your composition if it is defective the defect all comes from some want of strenuousness as you went along it is like getting a bit of your figure out of drawing because your eye only measured some portion of it with one or two portions of the rest and not with the whole figure and attitude every student knows the feeling so in your composition you may get impossible levels impossible relations between the subject and the surrounding canopy perhaps one coming in front of the other at one point and the reverse at another point you drew the thing dreamily you were not alert enough and now you must waste what you had got to love because though it's so pretty it is not fitting but sometimes it will happen that some line of your composition is thus hacked off by no fault of yours by some mismeasurement of a bar by your builder or some change of mind or whim of your client who likes it all but some vital feature as we have said this is not quite a fair demand to be made upon the artist but it will sometimes occur whatever we do pull yourself together and before you stand out about it and refuse to change consider try the modification and try it in such an aroused and angry spirit as shall flame out against the difficulty with force and heat let the whole thing be as fuel of fire and the reward will be given the chief difficulty may become it is more than an even chance that it does become the chief glory and that the composition will be like the newborn phoenix sprung from the ashes of the old and thrice as fair then also strike while the iron is hot and work while you're warm to it 
when you have done the main figure study and slain its difficulty you feel braced up your mind clear and you see your way to link it in with the surroundings will you let it all get cold because it is towards evening and you are physically tired when another hour would set the whole problem right for next day's work now while you are warm while the beauty of the model you have drawn from is still glowing in you with a thousand suggestions and possibilities you will do in another hour now what would take you days to do when the fire has died down if you ever do it at all it is after a day's work such as this that one feels the true delight of the balm of nature for conquered difficulty brings new insight through the feeling of new power and new beauties are seen because they are felt to be attainable and by virtue of the assurance that one has got distinctly a step nearer to the veil that hides the inner heart of things which is our destined home it is after work like this feeling the stirrings of some real strength within you promising power to deal with nature's secrets by and by that you see as never before the beauty of things the keen eyes that have been so busy turn gratefully to the silver of the sky with the gray quiet trees against it and the watery gleam of sunset like pale gold low down behind the boughs or the robin half seen is flitting from place to place choosing his rest and twittering his good night and you think with good hope of your life that is coming and of all your aspirations and your dreams and in the stillness and the coolness and the peace you can dwell with confidence upon the thought of all the unknown that is moving onward towards you as the glow which is fading renews itself day by day in the east bringing the daily task with it you feel that you are able to meet it and that all is well that there are quiet and good things in store and that this constant renewal of the glories of day and night this constant procession of morning and evening as the world rolls round has become almost a special possession to you to which only those who pay the price have entrance an inheritance of your own as a reward of your endeavor and acquired power and leading to some purposed end that will be peace stained glass stained glass stained glass at night in the lofty church windows the bits glow and gloam and talk to one another in their places and the pictured angels and saints look down peopling the empty aisles and companioning the lamp of the sanctuary End of Reflections of a Stained Glass Master Chapter 20 of Stained Glass Work A Textbook for Students and Workers in Glass By Christopher Wall, 1905 Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson What to See in America, Rhode Island By Clifton Johnson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rhode Island. Little Rhodey is the smallest state in the Union, and it is the most thickly populated. There are more than 500 persons to the square mile, while Nevada has less than one to the square mile. The settlement of the state was begun in 1636 by that famous puritan preacher roger williams whose preaching at salem had aroused such opposition that he had been banished from the colony to escape his persecutors he left home at night in midwinter and fled alone through the deep snow to his indian friend massasoit with whom he stayed until spring then he and five of his salem flock made their way to rhode island and started a settlement which they called providence this is now the capital of the state and the largest city in new england except boston 
the sea cuts deeply into rhode island and there are good harbors near the falls on the streams that empty into the upper end of narragansett bay the combination of abundant water power and a convenient situation for sending and receiving goods both by water and by land has resulted in developing a manufacturing community that for its size is unrivaled in the value of its product the first successful cotton mill in america was started at pawtucket in 1790 in the same vicinity are now some of the largest cotton mills in the world among the leaders in the revolution the general who next to washington did his country the greatest service was nathaniel green he was born in 1742 at warwick ten miles south of providence twenty miles farther down the shore of the bay at north kingston was born in 1756 gilbert stuart one of the greatest of american painters whose portraits of washington and other distinguished americans could hardly be surpassed in lifelikeness and charm of color south kingston was the birthplace of oliver hazard perry commander of our fleet in the famous battle of lake erie in the war of eighteen twelve among rhode island's important summer resorts are newport narragansett pier watch hill and block island the first is the most famous fashionable resort in america it is on an island in narragansett bay the indian name for the island was aquidneck which means the isle of peace it is about fifteen miles long but for the most part very narrow the early settlers called it rhode island probably because it was in a bay that furnished good anchorages the word road or road as it is more correctly spelled is used by sailors to designate just such an anchoring place a quidneck's first settlers came in sixteen thirty six as the result of a violent theological dispute in boston caused by the teachings of mrs anne hutchinson newport first won fame as a slave port the greatest in america for a long time its ships carried eighteen hundred hogsheads of rum annually to africa to be exchanged for negroes gold dust and ivory slaves were owned for domestic servants by every well-to-do family in the town at the beginning of the revolution newport was commercially more important than new york the british occupied it for three years and left it only a shadow of its former self nor did it recover until the middle of the next century when a wave of fashion swept into the old place its attractions were a salubrious climate without extremes of heat or cold the year through wide ocean prospects from its cliffs extensive bathing beaches and a delightful historic afterglow in one of the city parks is the famous old stone mill which was probably a windmill erected by an early governor about sixteen seventy five but which some claim was built by the norsemen hundreds of years before columbus discovered america longfellow in his well-known poem the skeleton in armor makes it the home of a bold norse sailor and his bride when the lady died the husband buried her under the stone tower and killed himself by falling on his spear a little beyond the north end of aquidneck on a mainland peninsula is mount hope the dwelling place of that most famous of new england indians king philip his village was at the foot of a rude crag where there was a good spring and where it was sheltered from the rough northwest winds he began his war against the whites in sixteen seventy five and many an exposed english village was wiped out and hundreds of settlers lives were sacrificed late that year the greatest battle of the war was fought in the southern part of rhode island not far from kingston where nearly two thousand indians including women and children had taken refuge on a palisaded piece of rising ground in the middle of a hideous swamp there they were assailed by one thousand one hundred whites and one hundred fifty friendly indians in a snowstorm on december nineteenth the stronghold was destroyed many of the savages were killed or perished in the flames and the rest were fugitives in the winter woods the next summer while philip with a few followers was encamped near mount hope the whites surprised and slew him and the spot where he fell has been marked by a stone twelve miles off the coast is that popular resort 
block island about eight miles long and three wide it gets its name from adrian block a dutch navigator who visited it in 1614 when the first english families settled on the island a half century later there were about 400 indian inhabitants the island has one great pond and 99 small ones the largest stream is only a rivulet a curious tradition of the island is that of the dancing mortar this mortar was a section of a tree 14 inches long and 10 in diameter and hollowed out at one end so that corn could be pounded into meal with a stone pestle after the original owner died the mortar won fame by dancing around the room it would throw itself on its side and roll to and fro then right itself and hop up from the floor several times in succession and perform various other strange antics the first block island hotel was opened in eighteen forty two but not until thirty years later did the island develop into the popular summering place it has now become the highest point in rhode island is durfee hill which rises eight hundred and five feet above the sea level on the northwestern border of the state the people are popularly called gunflints a name applied because of the common use of gunflint muskets taken from garrets in the door rebellion of eighteen forty two end of what to see in america rhode island by clifton johnson read by betty b the salt mines of vilichka eighteen fifty by bayard taylor from the world's story a history of the world in story song and art edited by eva march tappan volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by piotr natter in company with a professor from st petersburg we left cracow in the morning crossed the vistula and drove eastward through a low undulating country covered with fields of rye oats and potatoes the village of Vilichka occupies a charming situation on the northern slope of a long wood-crowned hill the large storehouses for the salt the governmental offices and the residences of the superintendents on a slight eminence near the foot first strike the eye after procuring a permit from the proper official we presented ourselves at the office over the mouth of the mine in company with five prussian travellers two of them ladies and a wandering german mechanic who had tramped out from Krakow in hope of seeing the place we were all enveloped in long coarse blouses of white linen and having bespoken a supply of bengal lights a door was opened and we commenced descending into the bowels of the earth by an easy staircase in a square shaft six boys carrying flaming lamps were distributed among our party and one of the superintendents assumed the office of conductor after descending two hundred and ten feet we saw the first veins of rock salt in a bed of clay and crumbled sandstone thirty feet more and we were in a world of salt level galleries branched off from the foot of the staircase overhead ceiling of solid salt underfoot a floor of salt and on either side dark grey walls of salt sparkling here and there with minute crystals lights glimmered ahead and on turning a corner we came upon a gang of workmen some hacking away at the solid floor others trundling wheelbarrows full of the precious cubes here was the chapel of saint anthony the oldest in the mines a byzantine excavation supported by columns with altar crucifix and life-size statues of saints apparently in black marble but all as sold as lot's wife as i discovered by putting my tongue to the nose of john the baptist the humid air of this upper story of the mine had damaged some of the saints francis especially is running away like a dip candle and all of his head is gone except his chin the limbs of joseph are dropping off as if he had the norwegian leprosy and lawrence has deeper scars than his gridion could have made running up and down his back a bengal light burned at the altar brought into sudden life this strange temple which presently vanished into utter darkness as if it had never been 
I cannot follow, step by step, our journey of two hours through the labyrinths of this wonderful mine. It is a bewildering maze of galleries, grand halls, staircases, and vaulted chambers, where one soon loses all sense of distance or direction, and drifts along blindly in the wake of his conductor. Everything was solid salt, except where great piers of hewn logs had been built to support some threatening roof, or vast chasm left in quarrying had been bridged across. As we descended to lower regions, the air became more dry and agreeable, and the saline wall more pure and brilliant. One hall, one hundred and eight feet in height, resembled a Grecian theatre. The traces of blocks taken out in regular layers representing the seats for the spectators. Out of this single hall, one million hundred weight of salt had been taken, or enough to supply the forty million inhabitants of Austria for one year. Two obelisks of salt commemorated the visit of Francis I and his empress in another spacious irregular vault, through which we passed by means of a wooden bridge resting on piers of the crystalline rock. After we had descended to the bottom of this chamber, a boy ran along the bridge above with a burning Bengal light, throwing flashes of blue luster on the obelisks, on the scarred walls, vast arches, the entrances to deeper halls, and the far roof fretted with the picks of the workmen. The effect was magical, wonderful. Even the old Prussian, who had the face of an exchange broker, exclaimed, as he pointed upward, It is like a sky full of cloud lampkins. Presently we entered another and loftier chamber, yawning downwards like the mouth of hell, with cavernous tunnels opening out on the farther end. In these tunnels the workmen, half naked, with torches in their hands, wild cries, fireworks, and the firing of guns, which here so reverberates in the imprisoned air that one can feel every wave of sound, gave a rough representation of the infernal regions for the benefit of the crowned heads who visit the mines. The effect must be indeed diabolical. Even we, unexceptionable characters as we were, looked truly uncanny in our ghostly garments amid the livid glare of the fireworks. A little farther we struck upon a lake four fathoms deep, upon which we embarked in a heavy square boat and entered a gloomy tunnel over the entrance of which was inscribed in salt letters, Good luck to you! In such a place the motto seemed ironical abandoned hope all ye who enter here would have been more appropriate midway in the tunnel the holes at either end were suddenly illuminated and a crash as of a hundred cannon bellowing through the hollow vaults shook the air and water in such wise that our boat had not ceased trembling when we landed in the farther hall read tasso treman le spaziose atre caverne e l'er cieco in quel rumor rimbomba if you want to hear the sound of it. A tablet inscribed, Heartily Welcome, saluted us in landing. Finally, at the depth of 450 feet, our journey ceased, although we were but halfway to the bottom. The remainder is a wilderness of shafts, galleries, and smaller chambers, the extent of which we could only conjecture. We then returned through scores of tortuous passages to some vaults where a lot of gnomes, naked to the hips, were busy with pick, mullet and wedge blocking out and separating the solid pavement the process is quite primitive scarcely differing from that of the ancient egyptians in quarrying granite the blocks are first marked out on the surface by a series of grooves one side is then deepened to the required thickness and wedges being inserted under the block it is soon split off it is then split transversely into pieces of one hundred weight each in which form it is ready for sale those intended for Russia are rounded on the edges and corners until they acquire the shape of large cocoons, for the convenience of transportation into the interior of the country. The number of workmen employed in the mines is 1,500, all of whom belong to the upper crust, that is, they live on the outside of the world. They are divided into gangs and relieve each other every six hours. Each gang quarries out, on an average, a little more than one thousand hundred weight of salt in that space of time, making the annual yield one million five hundred thousand hundredweight. 
The men we saw were fine, muscular, healthy looking fellows, and the officer, in answer to my questions, stated that their sanitary condition was quite equal to that of field labourers. Scurvy does not occur among them, and the equality of the temperature of the mines, which stands at 54 degrees Fahrenheit all the year round, has a favourable effect upon such as are predisposed to disease of the lungs. He was not aware of any peculiar form of disease induced by the substance in which they work, notwithstanding where the air is humid, salt crystals form upon the woodwork. The wood, I may here remark, never rots, and where untouched, retains its quality for centuries. The officer explicitly denied the story of man having been born in these mines and having gone through life without ever mounting to the upper world. So there goes another interesting fiction of our youth. It requires a stretch of imagination to conceive the extent of this salt bed. As far as explored, its length is two and a half English miles, its breadth a little over half a mile, and its solid depth six hundred and ninety feet. It commences about two hundred feet below the surface, and is then uninterrupted to the bottom, where it rests on a bed of compact sandstone, such as forms the peaks of the Carpathian Mountains. Below this there is no probability that it again reappears. The general direction is east and west, dipping rapidly at its western extremity, so that it may no doubt be pushed much farther in that direction. Notwithstanding the immense amount already quarried, and it will be better understood when I state that the aggregate length of the shafts and galleries amounts to 420 miles, it is estimated that, at the present rate of exploitation, the known supply cannot be exhausted under 300 years. The tripartite treaty on the partition of Poland limits Austria to the production of the present amount, 1,500,000 hundredweight annually, of which she is bound to furnish 300,000 hundredweight to Prussia and 800,000 to Russia, leaving 400,000 for herself. This sum yields her a net revenue from the mines of two millions of florins, one million dollars, annually. It is not known how this wonderful deposit, more precious than gold itself, was originally discovered. We know that it was worked in the twelfth century, and perhaps much earlier. The popular faith has invented several miracles to account for it, giving the merit to favorite saints. One which is gravely published in the history of Krakow, states that a Polish king, who wooed a princess Elizabeth of Hungary, not the saint of the Wartburg, in the tenth century, asked what she would choose as a bridal gift from him, to which she replied, something that would most benefit his people. The marriage ceremony was performed in a chapel in one of the salt mines of Transylvania. Soon after being transferred to Krakow, Elizabeth went out to Wieliczka, surveyed the ground, and after choosing a spot, commanded the people to dig. In the course of a few days they found a salt crystal, which the queen caused to be set in her wedding ring, and wore until the day of her death. She must have been a wonderful geologist for those days. The bed actually follows the Carpathians, appearing at intervals in small deposits into Transylvania, where there are extensive mines. It is believed also that it stretches northward into Russian Poland. Some years ago the Bank of Warsaw expanded large sums in boring for salt near the Austrian frontier. There was much excitement and speculation for a time, but although the mineral was found, the cost of quarrying it was too great, and the enterprise was dropped. On our return we visited Franz Joseph's Hall, a large salt ballroom with well-executed statues of Vulcan and Neptune. Six large chandeliers, apparently of cut glass, but really of salt, illuminated on festive occasions, and hundreds of dancers perspire themselves into a pretty pickle. When we had reached the upper galleries, we decided to ascend to daylight by means of windlass. The Prussian party went first, and the ladies were not a little alarmed at finding themselves seated in rope slings, only supported by a band under the arms. All five swung together in a heap. The ladies screamed and would have loosened themselves, but at that moment the windlass began to move, and up they went, dangling towards the little star of daylight, two hundred feet above. Under them hung one of the boys, to steady the wearing mass, and the little scamp amused himself by swinging his lamp, cracking his heels together, and rattling his stick along the sides of the shaft. 
when our turn came, I found, in spite of myself, that such pastime was not calculated to steady my nerves. The sound of the stick was very much like that of snapping ropes, and my brain swam a little at finding my feet dangling over what seemed a bottomless abyss of darkness. The arrival at the top was like a douche of lightning. It was just noon, and the hot, white, blinding day poured full upon us, stinging our eyes like needles, and almost taking away our breath. We were at once beset with a crowd of beggars and salt vendors. The latter proffered a multitude of small articles, crosses, stars, images, books, cups, dishes, etc., cut from the native crystal, and not distinguishable from glass in appearance. I purchased a salt cellar, which has the property of furnishing salt when it is empty, but it seemed to me that I should not need to use it for some days. I felt myself so thoroughly impregnated with salt that I conceived the idea of seasoning my soup by stirring it with my fingers, and half expecting that the fresh roast would turn to corned beef in my mouth. End of The Salt Mines of Vielichka, 1850, by Bayard Taylor The Second Epistle of Clement, from the Anti-Nicene Fathers Collection, Volume 9, by Alan Mendez, translated by John Keith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. We Ought to Think Highly of Christ Brethren, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus Christ as of God as the judge of the living and the dead. And it does not become us to think lightly of our salvation. For if we think little of him, we shall also hope but to obtain little from him. And those of us who hear carelessly of these things, as if they were of small importance, commit sin, not knowing whence we have been called and by whom, and to what place, and how much Jesus Christ submitted to suffer for our sakes. What return, then, shall we make to him? Are what fruits that we shall be worthy of that which he has given to us? For indeed, how great are the benefits which we owe to him! He has graciously given us light as a father. He has called us sons. He has saved us when we were ready to perish. What praise, then, shall we give to him? Or what return shall we make for the things which we have received? We were deficient in understanding, worshipping stones and wood and gold and silver and brass, the works of men's hands, and our whole life was nothing else than death, involved in blindness and with such darkness before our eyes. We have received sight, and through his will have laid aside that cloud by which we were enveloped. For he had compassion on us and mercifully saved us, observing the many errors in which we were entangled, as well as the destruction to which we were exposed, and that we had no hope of salvation except it came to us from him. For he called us when we were not and willed that out of nothing we should attain a real existence. Chapter 2. The Church, formerly barren, is now fruitful. Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that has travailest not. For she that is desolate hath many more children than she that hath an husband. In that he said, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. He referred to us, for our church was barren before that children were given to her. But when he said, Cry out, thou that travailest not, he means this, that we should sincerely offer up our prayers to God, and should not, like women in travail, show signs of weakness. And in that he said, For she that is desolate hath many more children, than she that hath a husband. He means that our people seem to be outcast from God, but now, through believing, have become more numerous than those who are reckoned to possess God. And another scripture saith, 
I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This means that those who are perishing must be saved, for it is indeed a great and admirable thing to establish not the things which are standing, but these that are falling. Thus also did Christ desire to save the things which were perishing, and has saved many by coming and calling us when hastening to destruction. Chapter 3. The Duty of Confessing Christ Since then, he has displayed so great mercy towards us, and especially in this respect, that we who are living should not offer sacrifices to gods that are dead, or pay them worship, but should attain through him to the knowledge of the true Father, whereby shall we show that we do indeed know him, but by not denying him through whom this knowledge has been attained. For he himself declares, Whosoever shall confess me before men, I will confess him before my Father. This then is our reward, if we shall confess him by whom we have been saved. But in what way shall we confess him? By doing what he says, and not transgressing his commandments, and by honoring him, not with our lips only, but with all our heart and all our mind. For he says in Isaiah, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Chapter 4. True Confession of Christ Let us then not only call him Lord, for that will not save us. For he saith, Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved, but he that worketh righteousness. Wherefore, brethren, let us confess him by our works, by loving one another, by not committing adultery, or speaking evil of one another, or cherishing envy, but being continent, compassionate, and good. We ought also to sympathize with one another, and not be avaricious. By such works let us confess him, and not by those that are of the opposite kind. And it is not fitting that we should fear men, but rather God. For this reason, if we should do such wicked things, the Lord has said, Even though ye were gathered t together to me in my very bosom, yet if ye were not to keep my commandments, I would cast you off, and would say unto you, Depart from me, I know not whence ye are, ye workers of iniquity. Chapter 5 this world should be despised. Wherefore, brethren, leaving willingly our sojourn in this present world, let us do the will of him that called us, and not fear to depart out of this world. For the Lord saith, Ye shall be as lambs in the midst of wolves. And Peter answered and said unto him, What then, if the wolves shall tear in pieces the lambs? Jesus said unto Peter, The lambs have no cause after they are dead to fear the wolves, and in like manner fear not ye them that kill you, and could do nothing more unto you, but fear him who, after you are dead, has power over both soul and body to cast them into the hell fire. And consider, brethren, that the sojourning in the flesh in this world is but brief and transient, but the promise of Christ is great and wonderful, even the rest of the kingdom to come and of life everlasting. By what course of conduct, then, shall we attain these things, but by leading a holy and righteous life, and by deeming these worldly things as not belonging to us, and not fixing our desires upon them? For if we desire to possess them, we fall away from the path of righteousness. Chapter 6 The present and future worlds are enemies to each other. Now the Lord declares, No servant can serve two masters. If we desire then to serve both God and mammon, it will be unprofitable for us. For what will it profit if a man gain 
the whole world, and lose his own soul. This world and the next are two enemies. The one urges to adultery and corruption, avarice and deceit. The other bids farewell to these things. We cannot, therefore, be the friends of both. It behooves us, by renouncing the one, to make sure of the other. Let us reckon that it is better to hate the things present, since they are trifling and transient and corruptible, and to love those which are to come, as being good and incorruptible. For if we do the will of Christ, we shall find rest. Otherwise, nothing shall deliver us from eternal punishment. If we disobey his commandments, for thus also saith the scripture in Ezekiel, If Noah, Job, and Daniel should rise up, they should not deliver their children in captivity. Now, if men so eminently righteous were not able by their righteousness to deliver their children, how can we hope to enter into the royal residence of God unless we keep our baptism holy and undefiled? Or who shall be our advocate unless we be found possessed of works of holiness and righteousness? Chapter 7 We must strive in order to be crowned. Wherefore then, my brethren, let us struggle with all earnestness, knowing that the contest is, in our case, close at hand, that many undertake long voyages to strive for a corruptible reward. Yet all are not crowned, but those only that have labored hard and striven gloriously. Let us therefore so strive that we may all be crowned. Let us run the straight course, even the race that is incorruptible, and let us in great numbers set out for it and strive that we may be crowned. And should we not all be able to obtain the crown, let us at least come near to it. We must remember that he who strives in the corruptible contest, if he be found acting unfairly, is taken away and scourged, and cast forth from the lists. What then think ye, if one does anything unseemly in an incorruptible contest, what shall he have to bear? For of those who do not preserve the seal unbroken, the scripture saith, their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be a spectacle to all flesh. Chapter 8. The Necessity of Repentance While We Are on Earth As long, therefore, as we are upon earth, let us practice repentance, for we are as clay in the hand of the artificer. For as the potter, if he make a vessel, and it be distorted or broken in his hands, fashions it over again. But if he have before this cast it into the furnace of fire, can no longer find any help for it. So let us also, while we are in this world, repent with our whole hearts of the evil deeds we have done in the flesh, that we may be saved by the Lord, while we have yet an opportunity of repentance. For after we have gone out of the world, no further power of confessing or repenting will there belong to us. Wherefore, brethren, by doing the will of the Father, and keeping the flesh holy, and observing the commandments of the Lord, we shall obtain eternal life. For the Lord saith in the Gospel, If ye have not kept that which was small, who will commit to you the great? For I say unto you, that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. This, then, is what he means. Keep the flesh holy and the seal undefiled, that ye may receive eternal life. Chapter 9 We Shall Be Judged in the Flesh Let no one of you say that this very flesh shall not be judged nor rise again. Consider ye in what state ye were saved, in what ye received sight, if not while ye were in the flesh. We must therefore preserve the flesh as the temple of God, for as ye were called in the flesh, 
ye shall also come to be judged in the flesh. As Christ the Lord who saved us, though he was first a spirit, became flesh, and thus called us, so shall we also receive the, re the reward in this flesh. Let us therefore love one another, that we may all attain to the kingdom of God. While we have an opportunity of being healed, let us yield ourselves to God that healeth us, and give to him a recompense. Of what sort? Repentance out of a sincere heart, for he knows all things beforehand, and is acquainted with what is in our hearts. Let us therefore give him praise, not with the mouth only, but also with the heart, that he may accept us as sons. For the Lord has said, Those are my brethren who do the will of my Father. Chapter 10 Vice is to be forsaken, and virtue followed. Wherefore, my brethren, let us do the will of the Father who called us, that we may live. And let us earnestly follow after virtue, but forsake every wicked tendency which would lead to transgression, and flee from ungodliness, lest evils overtake us. For if we are diligent in doing good, peace will follow. On this account, such men cannot find it, i.e. peace, as are influenced by human terrors, and prefer rather present enjoyment to the promise which shall afterwards be fulfilled. And they know not what torment present enjoyment incurs, or what felicity is involved in the future promise. And if indeed they themselves only did such things, it would be the more tolerable. But now they persist in imbuing innocent souls with their pernicious doctrines, not knowing that they shall receive a double condemnation, both they and those that hear them. Chapter 11 We ought to serve God, trusting in his promises. Let us therefore serve God with a pure heart, and we shall be righteous. But if we do not serve him, because we believe not the promise of God, we shall be miserable. For the prophetic word also declares, Wretched are those of a double mind, and who doubt in their heart, who say, All these things have we heard, even in the times of our fathers. But though we have waited day by day, we have seen none of them accomplished. Ye fools, compare yourselves to a tree. Take, for instance, the vine. First of all, it sheds its leaves. Then the bud appears. After that, the sour grape and then the fully ripened fruit. So likewise, my people have borne disturbances and afflictions, but afterwards shall they receive their good things. Wherefore, my brethren, let us not be of a double mind, but let us hope and endure that we may obtain the reward. For he is faithful who has promised that he will bestow on every one a reward according to his works. If, therefore, we shall do righteousness in the sight of God. We shall enter into his kingdom and shall receive the promises, which ear hath not heard, nor eye seen, nor have entered into the heart of man. Chapter 12. We are constantly to look for the kingdom of God. Let us expect, therefore, hour by hour, the kingdom of God in love and righteousness, since we know not the day of the appearing of God. For the Lord himself, being asked by one when his kingdom would come, replied, When two shall be one, that which is without as that which is within, and the male with the female, neither male nor female. Now two are one when we speak the truth one to another, and there is unfeignedly one soul in two bodies, and that which is without as that which is within meaneth this. He calls the soul that which is within, and the body that which is without. As then thy body is visible to sight, so also let thy soul be manifest by good works. And the male 
with the female, neither male nor female. This he saith, that brother seeing sister may have no thought concerning her as female, that she may have no thought concerning him as male. If ye do these things, saith he, the kingdom of my father shall come. Chapter 13 God's Name Not to be Blasphemed Brethren, then, let us now at length repent. Let us soberly turn to that which is good, for we are full of abundant folly and wickedness. Let us wipe out from us our former sins, and repenting from the heart be saved. Let us not be men-pleasers, nor be willing to please one another, but also the men without, for righteousness' sake, that the name may not be because of us blasphemed. For the Lord saith, Continually my name is blasphemed among all nations, and wherefore my name is blasphemed. Blasphemed in what? In your not doing the things which I wish. For the nations hearing from our mouth the oracles of God marvel at their excellence and worth. Thereafter, learning that our deeds are not worthy of the words which we speak, receiving this occasion, they turn to blasphemy, saying that they are a fable and a delusion. For whenever they hear from us that God saith, No thank have ye, if ye <coughs> love them which love you, but ye have thank if ye love your enemies and them which hate you. Whenever they hear these words, they marvel at the surpassing measure of their goodness. But when they see that not only do we not love those who hate, but we love not even those who love, they laugh us to scorn, and the name is blasphemed. Chapter 14, The Church Spiritual So then, brethren, if we do the will of our Father God, we shall be members of the first church, the spiritual, that which was created before the sun and moon. But if we shall not do the will of the Lord, we shall come under the scripture which saith, My house became a den of robbers. So then, let us elect to belong to the church of life, that we may be saved. I think not that ye are ignorant that the living church is the body of Christ. For the scripture saith, God created man, male and female. The male is Christ, the female the church. And that the books and the apostle teach that the church is not of the present, but from the beginning. For it was spiritual, as was also our Jesus, and was made manifest at the end of days in order to save us. The church being spiritual was made manifest in the flesh of Christ, signifying to us that if any one of us shall preserve it in the flesh and corrupt it not, he shall receive it in the Holy Spirit. For this flesh is the type of the Spirit. No one, therefore, having corrupted the type, will receive afterwards the antitype. Therefore it is, then, that he saith, Brethren, preserve ye the flesh, that ye may become partakers of the Spirit. If we say that the flesh is the Church, and the Spirit Christ, then it follows that he who shall offer outrage to the flesh is guilty of outrage on the Church. Such in one, therefore, will not partake of the Spirit, which is Christ. Such is the life in immortality, which this flesh may afterwards receive, the Holy Spirit cleaving to it. And no one can ex either express or utter what things the Lord hath prepared for his elect. Chapter 15 He who saves and he who is saved I think not that I counted trivial counsel concerning continence. Following it, a man will not repent thereof but will save both himself and me who counseled. For it is no small reward to turn back a wandering and perishing soul for its salvation. For this recompense we are able to render to God who created us. For he who speaks and hears both speak and hear with faith and love. Let us therefore continue in that course in which we, righteous and holy, believed. With that confidence we may ask God who saith, Whilst thou art still speaking, I will say, Here I am. For these words are a token of a great promise. For the Lord saith that he is more ready to give than he who asks. So great then, being the goodness of which we are partakers, let us not grudge one another under the attainment of so great blessings. For in proportion to the pleasure with which these words are fraught to those who shall follow them, 
and that proportion is the condemnation with which they are fraught to those who shall refuse to hear. Chapter 16. Preparation for the Day of Judgment. So then, brethren, having received no small occasion to repent, while we have opportunity, let us turn to God who called us, while yet we have one to receive us. For if we renounce these indulgences and conquer the soul by not fulfilling its wicked desires, we shall be partakers of the mercy of Jesus. Know ye that the day of judgment draweth nigh like a burning oven, and certain of the heavens and all the earth will melt, like lead melting in fire, and then will appear the hidden and manifest deeds of men. Good then is alms as repentance from sin. Better is fasting than prayer, and alms than both. Charity covereth a multitude of sins, and prayer out of a good conscience delivereth from death. Blessed is every one that shall be found complete in these, for alms lightens the burden of sin. Chapter 17, same subject continued. Let us then repent with our whole heart, that no one of us may perish in this. For if we have commands and engage in withdrawing from idols and instructing others, how much more ought a soul already knowing God not to perish? Rendering therefore mutual help, let us raise the weak also in that which is good, that all of us may be saved and convert one another and admonish. And not only now let us seem to believe and give heed when we are admonished by the elders, but also when we take our departure home. Let us remember the commandments of the Lord and not be allured back by worldly lusts. Let us often and often draw near and try to make progress in the Lord's commands, that we all having the same mind may be gathered together for life. For the Lord said, I come to gather all nations, kindreds, and tongues. This means the day of his appearing, when he will come and redeem us, each one according to his works. And the unbelievers will see his glory and might. And when they see the empire of the world in Jesus, they will be surprised, saying, Woe to us, because thou wast, and we knew not, and believed not, and obeyed not the elders, who show us plainly of our salvation. And their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be a spectacle unto all flesh. It is of the great day of judgment, he speaks, when they shall see those among us who were guilty of ungodliness and erred in their estimate of the commands of Jesus Christ. The righteous, having succeeded both in enduring the trials and hating the indulgences of the soul, whenever they witness how those who have swerved and denied Jesus by words or deeds are punished with grievous torments and fire unquenchable, will give glory to their God and say, there will be hope for him who has served God with his whole heart. Chapter 18, The Author Sinful Yet Pursuing And let us then be of the number of those who give thanks, who have served God, and not the ungodly who are judged. For I myself, though a sinner every wit, and not yet fleeing temptation, but continuing in the midst of the tools of the devil, study to follow after righteousness, that I may make be it only some approach to it, fearing the judgment to come. Chapter 19, The Lord of the Righteous, Although They May Suffer. So then, brothers and sisters, after the God of truth, I address to you an appeal that ye may give heed to the words written, that ye may save both yourselves and him who reads an address in your midst. For as a reward, I ask of you repentance with a whole heart, while ye bestow upon yourselves salvation and life. For by so doing, we shall set a mark for all the young who wish to be diligent in godliness and the goodness of God. And let not us in our folly feel displeasure and indignation. Whenever any one admonishes us and turns us from unrighteousness to righteousness, for there are some wicked deeds which we commit and know it not, because of the double-mindedness and unbelief present in our breasts and our understanding is darkened by vain desires. Let us therefore work righteousness, that we may be saved to the end. Blessed are they who obey these commands, even if for a brief space they suffer in this world, and they will gather the imperishable fruit of the resurrection. Let not the godly man therefore grieve, if for the present he suffer affliction. Blessed is the time that awaits him there, rising up to life again, with the fathers, he will rejoice forever without a grief. 
Chapter 20. Godliness not gain the true riches. But let it not even trouble your mind that we see the unrighteous possessed of riches and the servants of God straightened. Let us therefore, brothers and sisters, believe. In a trial of the living God, we strive and are exercised in the present life, that we may obtain the crown in that which is to come. No one of the righteous received fruit speedily, but waiteth for it. For if God tendered the reward of the righteous in a trice, straightway were it commerce that we practice, and not godliness. For it were as if we were righteous by following after not godliness but gain. And for this reason the divine judgment baffled the spirit that is unrighteous, and heavily weighed the fetter. To the only God, invisible, Father of truth, who sent forth to us the Savior and author of immortality, through whom he also manifested to us the truth and the heavenly life, to him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of the second epistle of Clement from the Anti Nicene's Father's Collection, Volume 9, by Alan Menes, translated by John Keith. Spinoza and the Bible by Matthew Arnold, Part 1, read by Daniel Davison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Spinoza and the Bible By the sentence of the angels, by the decree of the saints, we anathematize, cut off, curse, and execrate. Baruch Spinoza, in the presence of these sacred books, with the six hundred and thirteen precepts which are written therein, with the anathema wherewith Joshua anathematized Jericho, with the cursing wherewith Elisha cursed the children, and with all the cursings which are written in the book of the law. Cursed be he by day, and cursed by night. Cursed when he lieth down, and cursed when he riseth up. Cursed when he goeth out, and cursed when he cometh in. The Lord pardon him never. The wrath and fury of the Lord burn upon this man, and bring upon him all the curses which are written in the book of the law. The Lord blot out his name under heaven. The Lord set him apart for destruction from all the tribes of Israel, with all the curses of the firmament which are written in the book of this law. There shall no man speak to him, no man write to him, no man show him any kindness, no man stay under the same roof with him, no man come nigh him. With these amenities, the current compliments of theological parting, the Jews of the Portuguese synagogue at Amsterdam took in 1656 and not in 1660, as has till now been commonly supposed, their leave of their erring brother, Baruch or Benedict Spinoza. They remained children of Israel, and he became a child of modern Europe. That was in 1656, and Spinoza died in 1677 at the early age of 44. Glory had not found him out. His short life, a life of unbroken diligence, kindliness, and purity, was passed in seclusion. But in spite of that seclusion, in spite of the shortness of his career, in spite of the hostility of the dispensers of renown in the 18th century, of Voltaire's disparagement and Bale's detraction, in spite of the repellent form which he has given to his principal work, in spite of the exterior semblance of a rigid dogmatism alien to the most essential tendencies of modern philosophy, in spite, finally, of the immense weight of disfavor cast upon him by the long-repeated charge of atheism, Spinoza's name has silently risen in importance. The man and his work have attracted a steadily increasing notice, and bid fair to become soon what they deserve to become in the history of modern philosophy, the central point of interest. An avowed translation of one of his works, his Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, has at last made its appearance in English. It is the principal work which Spinoza published in his lifetime. His book on ethics, the work on which his fame rests, 
is posthumous. The English translator has not done his task well. Of the character of his version, there can, I am afraid, be no doubt. One such passage as the following is decisive. I confess that while with them, the theologians, I have never been able sufficiently to admire the unfathomed mysteries of Scripture, I have still found them giving utterance to nothing but Aristotelian and Platonic speculations, artfully dressed up and cunningly accommodated to holy writ, lest the speakers should show themselves too plainly to belong to the sect of the Grecian heathens. Nor was it enough for these men to discourse with the Greeks they have further taken to raving with the Hebrew prophets. This professes to be a translation of these words of Spinoza, Fateo eos non quam satis mirare potuisi scripturae profondissima mysteria, at tamen praetor Aristotelicorum vel platonicorum speculationes nihil docuisse video, atque his ne gentilis sectare viderentur scripturon accomoda verun, non satis his fuit cum graecis insanere, sed profetus cum istem deliravisse voluerunt. After one such specimen of a translator's force, the experienced reader has a sort of instinct that he may as well close the book at once with a smile or a sigh according as he happens to be a follower of the weeping or of the laughing philosopher. If in spite of this instinct he persists in going on with the English version of the Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, he will find many more such specimens. It is not, however, my intention to fill my space with these, or with strictures upon their author. I prefer to remark that he renders a service to literary history by pointing out in his preface how to bail may be traced the disfavor in which the name of Spinoza was so long held, that in his observations on the system of the Church of England he shows a laudable freedom from the prejudices of ordinary English liberals of that advanced school to which he clearly belonged, and lastly, that, though he manifests little familiarity with Latin, he seems to have considerable familiarity with philosophy, and to be well able to follow and comprehend speculative reasoning. Let me advise him to unite his forces with those of some one who has that accurate knowledge of Latin which he himself has not, and then, perhaps, of that union, a really good translation of Spinoza will be the result. And having given him this advice, let me again turn for a little to the Tractatus Theologico-Politicus itself. This work, as I have already said, is a work on the interpretation of Scripture. It treats of the Bible. What was it exactly which Spinoza thought about the Bible and its inspiration? That will be at the present moment the central point of interest for the English readers of his treatise. Now it is to be observed that just on this very point the treatise, interesting and remarkable as it is, will fail to satisfy the reader. It is important to seize this notion quite firmly and not to quit hold of it while one is reading Spinoza's work. The scope of that work is this. Spinoza sees that the life and practice of Christian nations professing the religion of the Bible are not the due fruits of the religion of the Bible. He sees only hatred, bitterness, and strife where he might have expected to see love, joy, and peace in believing. And he asks himself the reason of this. The reason is, he says, that these people misunderstand their Bible. Well, then, is his conclusion, and I will write a Tractatus Theologico-Politicus. I will show these people that taking the Bible for granted, taking it to be all which it asserts itself to be, taking it to have all the authority which it claims, it is not what they imagine it to be. It does not say what they imagine it to say. I will show them what it really does say, 
and I will show them that they will do well to accept this real teaching of the Bible instead of the phantom with which they have so long been cheated. I will show their governments that they will do well to remodel the national churches, to make of them institutions informed with the spirit of the true Bible instead of institutions informed with the spirit of this false phantom. The comments of men, Spinoza said, had been foisted into the Christian religion. The pure teaching of God had been lost sight of. He determined, therefore, to go again to the Bible, to read it over and over with a perfectly unprejudiced mind, and to accept nothing as its teaching which it did not clearly teach. He began by constructing a method or set of conditions indispensable for the adequate interpretation of Scripture. These conditions are such, he points out, that a perfectly adequate interpretation of Scripture is now impossible. For example, to understand any prophet thoroughly, we ought to know the life, character, and pursuits of that prophet under what circumstances his book was composed and in what state and through what hands it has come down to us and in general most of this we cannot now know still the main sense of the books of scripture may be clearly seized by us himself a jew with all the learning of his nation and a man of the highest natural powers spinoza had in the difficult task of seizing this sense every aid which special knowledge or preeminent faculties could supply in what then he asked does scripture interpreted by its own aid and not by the aid of rabbinical traditions or greek philosophy allege its own divinity to consist in a revelation given by god to the prophets now all knowledge is a divine revelation but prophecy, as represented in Scripture, is one of which the laws of human nature, considered in themselves alone, cannot be the cause. Therefore nothing must be asserted about it except what is clearly declared by the prophets themselves, for they are our only source of knowledge on a matter which does not fall within the scope of our ordinary knowing faculties. But ignorant people, not knowing the Hebrew genius and phraseology, and not attending to the circumstances of the speaker, often imagine the prophets to assert things which they do not. The prophets clearly declare themselves to have received the revelation of God through the means of words and images, not as Christ through immediate communication of the mind with the mind of God. Therefore the prophets excelled other men by the power and vividness of their representing and imagining faculty, not by perfection of their mind. This is why they perceived almost everything through figures and expressed themselves so variously and so improperly concerning the nature of God. Moses imagined that God could be seen and attributed to him the passions of anger and jealousy. Micaiah imagined him sitting on a throne with the host of heaven on his right and left hand. Daniel, as an old man with a white garment and white hair, Ezekiel as fire, the disciples of Christ thought they saw the Spirit of God in the form of a dove, the apostles in the form of fiery tongues. Whence then could the prophets be certain of the truth of a revelation which they received through the imagination and not by a mental process? For only an idea can carry the sense of its own certainty along with it, not an imagination. To make them certain of the truth of what was revealed to them, a reasoning process came in. They had to rely on the testimony of a sign, and above all on the testimony of their own conscience that they were good men and spoke for God's sake. Either testimony was incomplete without the other. Even the good prophet needed for his message the confirmation of a sign, but the bad prophet, the utter of an immoral doctrine, had no certainty for his doctrine, no truth in it, even though he confirmed it by a sign. The testimony of a good conscience was therefore the prophet's grand source of certitude. Even this, however, was only a moral certitude, not a mathematical one. 
for no man can be perfectly sure of his own goodness. The power of imagining, the power of feeling what goodness is, and the habit of practicing goodness were therefore the sole essential qualifications of a true prophet. But for the purpose of the message, the revelation which God designed him to convey, these qualifications were enough. The sum and substance of this revelation was simply believe in God and lead a good life. To be the organ of this revelation did not make a man more learned. It left his scientific knowledge as it found it. This explains the contradictory and speculatively false opinions about God and the laws of nature which the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles entertained. Abraham and the patriarchs knew God only as El Shaddai, the power which gives to every man that which suffices him. Moses knew him as Jehovah, a self-existent being, but imagined him with the passions of a man. Samuel imagined that God could not repent of his sentences, Jeremiah that he could. Joshua, on a day of great victory, the ground being white with hail, seeing the daylight last longer than usual, and imaginatively seizing this as a special sign of the help divinely promised to him, declared that the sun was standing still. To be obeyers of God themselves and inspired leaders of others to obedience and good life did not make Abraham and Moses metaphysicians or Joshua a natural philosopher. His revelation no more changed the speculative opinions of each prophet than it changed his temperament or style. The wrathful Elisha required the natural sedative of music before he could be the messenger of good fortune to Yehoram. The high-bred Isaiah and Nahum have the style proper to their condition and the rustic Ezekiel and Amos the style proper to theirs. We are not therefore bound to pay heed to the speculative opinions of this or that prophet, for in uttering these he spoke as a mere man, only in exhorting his hearers to obey God and lead a good life was he the organ of a divine revelation. To know and love God is the highest blessedness of man, and of all men alike. To this all mankind are called, and not any one nation in particular. The divine law, properly so named, is the method of life for attaining this height of human blessedness. This law is universal, written in the heart, and one for all mankind. Human law is the method of life for attaining and preserving temporal security and prosperity. This law is dictated by a lawgiver, and every nation has its own. In the case of the Jews, this law was dictated by revelation through the prophets. Its fundamental precept was to obey God and to keep his commandments, and it is therefore in a secondary sense called divine. But it was nevertheless framed in respect of temporal things only. Even the truly moral and divine precept of this law to practice for God's sake justice and mercy towards one's neighbor meant for the Hebrew of the Old Testament his Hebrew neighbor only and had respect to the concord and stability of the Hebrew commonwealth. The Jews were to obey God and to keep his commandments, that they might continue long in the land given to them, and that it might be well with them there. Their election was a temporal one, and lasted only so long as their state. It is now over, and the only election the Jews now have is that of the pious, the remnant, which takes place and has always taken place in every other nation also. Scripture itself teaches that there is a universal divine law, that this is common to all nations alike, and is the law which truly confers eternal blessedness. Solomon, the wisest of the Jews, knew this law, as the few wisest men in all nations have ever known it. But for the mass of the Jews, as for the mass of mankind everywhere, this law was hidden, and they had no notion of its moral action, its vera vita, which conducts to eternal blessedness except so far as this action was enjoined upon them by the prescriptions of their temporal law. When the ruin of their state brought with it the ruin of their temporal law, they would have lost altogether their only clue 
to eternal blessedness. Christ came when that fabric of the Jewish state, for the sake of which the Jewish law existed, was about to fall, and he proclaimed the universal divine law. A certain moral action is prescribed by this law, as a certain moral action was prescribed by the Jewish law. But he who truly conceives the universal divine law conceives God's decrees adequately as eternal truths. And for him, moral action has liberty and self-knowledge, while the prophets of the Jewish law inadequately conceived God's decrees as mere rules and commands, and for them moral action had no liberty and no self-knowledge. Christ, who beheld the decrees of God as God himself beholds them, as eternal truths, proclaimed the love of God and the love of our neighbor as commands, only because of the ignorance of the multitude to those to whom it was given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, he announced them as he himself perceived them as eternal truths. And the apostles, like Christ, spoke to many of their hearers as unto carnal, not spiritual, presented to them, that is, the love of God and their neighbor as a divine command authenticated by the life and death of Christ, not as an eternal idea of reason carrying its own warrant along with it. The presentation of it as this latter their hearers were not able to bear. The apostles, moreover, though they preached and confirmed their doctrine by signs as prophets, wrote their epistles not as prophets, but as doctors and reasoners. The essentials of their doctrine, indeed, they took not from reason, but like the prophets, from fact and revelation. They preached belief in God and goodness of life as a Catholic religion existing by virtue of the passion of Christ, as the prophets had preached belief in God and goodness of life as a national religion existing by virtue of the Mosaic Covenant. But while the prophets announced their message in a form purely dogmatical, the apostles developed theirs with the forms of reasoning and argumentation, according to each apostle's ability and way of thinking, and as they might best commend their message to their hearers, and for their reasonings they themselves claim no divine authority, submitting them to the judgment of their hearers. Thus each apostle built essential religion on a non-essential foundation of his own, and as St. Paul says, avoided building on the foundations of another apostle which might be quite different from his own. Hence the discrepancies between the doctrine of one apostle and another, between that of St. Paul, for example, and that of St. James. But these discrepancies are in the non-essentials not given to them by revelation and not in essentials. Human churches, seizing these discrepant non-essentials as essentials, one maintaining one of them, another another, have filled the world with unprofitable disputes, have Turn the church into an academy and religion into a science, or rather a wrangling, and have fallen into endless schism. What then are the essentials of religion according to both the Old and the New Testament? Very few and very simple. The precept to love God and our neighbor. The precepts of the first chapter of Isaiah. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. The precepts of the Sermon on the Mount, which add to the foregoing the injunction that we should cease to do evil and learn to do well, not to our brethren and fellow citizens only, but to all mankind. It is by following these precepts that belief in God is to be shown. If we believe in him, we shall keep his commandment, and this is his commandment, that we love one another. It is because it contains these precepts that the Bible is properly called the Word of God, in spite of its containing much that is mere history. And like all history, sometimes true, sometimes false, in spite of its containing much that is mere reasoning, and like all reasoning, sometimes sound, sometimes hollow. These precepts are also the precepts of the universal divine law written in our hearts, and it is only by this that the divinity of Scripture is established. 
by its containing, namely, precepts identical with those of this inly written and self-proving law. This law was in the world, as St. John says, before the doctrine of Moses or the doctrine of Christ. And what need was there, then, for these doctrines? Because the world at large knew not this original divine law, in which precepts are ideas and the belief in God, the knowledge and contemplation of him. Reason gives us this law. Reason tells us that it leads to eternal blessedness, and that those who follow it have no need of any other. But reason could not have told us that the moral action of the universal divine law followed not from a sense of its intrinsic goodness, truth, and necessity, but simply in proof of obedience, for both the Old and New Testament are but one long discipline of obedience, simply because it is so commanded by Moses in virtue of the covenant, simply because it is so commanded by Christ in virtue of his life and passion, can lead to eternal blessedness, which means, for reason, eternal knowledge. Reason could not have told us this, and this is what the Bible tells us. This is that thing which had been kept secret since the foundation of the world. It is thus that by means of the foolishness of the world, God confounds the wise, and with things that are not, brings to naught things that are. Of the truth of the promise thus made to obedience without knowledge, we can have no mathematical certainty, for we can have a mathematical certainty only of things deduced by reason from elements which she in herself possesses. But we can have a moral certainty of it, a certainty such as the prophets had themselves, arising out of the goodness and pureness of those to whom this revelation has been made and rendered possible for us by its contradicting no principles of reason. It is a great comfort to believe it, because as it is only the very small minority who can pursue a virtuous life by the sole guidance of reason, we should, unless we had this testimony of Scripture, be in doubt respecting the salvation of nearly the whole human race. It follows from this that philosophy has her own independent sphere and theology hers, and that neither has the right to invade and try to subdue the other. Theology demands perfect obedience, philosophy perfect knowledge. The obedience demanded by theology and the knowledge demanded by philosophy are alike saving. As speculative opinions about God, theology requires only such as are indispensable to the reality of this obedience. The belief that God is, that he is a rewarder of them that seek him, and that the proof of seeking him is a good life. These are the fundamentals of faith, and they are so clear and simple that none of the inaccuracies provable in the Bible narrative the least affect them, and they have indubitably come to us uncorrupted. He who holds them may make, as the patriarchs and prophets did, other speculations about God most erroneous, and yet their faith is complete and saving. Nay, beyond these fundamentals, speculative opinions are pious or impious, not as they are true or false, but as they confirm or shake the believer in the practice of obedience. The truest speculative opinion about the nature of God is impious if it makes its holder rebellious. The falsest speculative opinion is pious if it makes him obedient. Governments should never render themselves the tools of ecclesiastical ambition by promulgating as fundamentals of the national church's faith more than these, and should concede the fullest liberty of speculation. But the multitude, which respects only what astonishes, terrifies, and overwhelms it, by no means takes this simple view of its own religion. To the multitude, religion seems imposing only when it is subversive of reason, confirmed by miracles, conveyed in documents materially sacred and infallible, and dooming to damnation all without its pale. But this religion of the multitude is not the religion which a true interpretation of Scripture finds in Scripture. 
Reason tells us that a miracle, understanding by a miracle a breach of the laws of nature, is impossible, and that to think it possible is to dishonor God, for the laws of nature are the laws of God, and to say that God violates the laws of nature is to say that he violates his own nature. Reason sees, too, that miracles can never attain their professed object, that of bringing us to a higher knowledge of God, since our knowledge of God is raised only by perfecting and clearing our conceptions, and the alleged design of miracles is to baffle them. But neither does scripture anywhere assert as a general truth that miracles are possible. Indeed, it asserts the contrary, for Jeremiah declares that nature follows an invariable order. Scripture, however, like nature herself, does not lay down speculative propositions. Scriptura definitiones non tradit ut nec etiam natura. It relates matters in such an order and with such phraseology as a speaker, often not perfectly instructed himself, who wanted to impress the hearers with a lively sense of God's greatness and goodness, would naturally employ. As Moses, for instance, relates to the Israelites the passage of the Red Sea without any mention of the east wind which attended it, and which is brought accidentally to our knowledge in another place, so that to know exactly what Scripture means means in the relation of each seeming miracle we ought to know besides the tropes and phrases of the Hebrew language, the circumstances, and also, since every one is swayed in the manner of presenting facts by his own preconceived opinions, and we have seen what those of the prophets were, the preconceived opinions of each speaker. But this mode of interpreting scripture is fatal to the vulgar notion of its verbal inspiration, of a sanctity and absolute truth in all the words and sentences of which it is composed. This vulgar notion is indeed a palpable error. It is demonstrable from the internal testimony of the scriptures themselves that the books from the first of the Pentateuch to the last of kings were put together after the first destruction of Jerusalem by a compiler, probably Ezra, who designed to relate the history of the Jewish people from its origins to that destruction. It is demonstrable, moreover, that the compiler did not put his last hand to the work, but left it with its extracts from the various and conflicting sources, sometimes unreconciled, left it with airs of text and unsettled readings. The prophetic books are mere fragments of the prophets collected by the rabbins, where they could find them, and inserted in the canon according to their discretion. They at first proposed to admit neither the book of Proverbs nor the book of Ecclesiastes into the canon, and only admitted them because there were found in them passages which commended the law of Moses. Ezekiel also they had determined to exclude but one of their number remodeled him so as to procure his admission. The books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Daniel are the work of a single author, and were not written till after Judas Maccabeus had restored the worship of the temple. The book of Psalms was collected and arranged at the same time. Before this time there was no canon of the sacred writings, and the great synagogue by which the canon was fixed was first convened after the Macedonian conquest of Asia. Of that synagogue none of the prophets were members. The learned men who composed it were guided by their own fallible judgment. In like manner, the uninspired judgment of human counsels determine the canon of the New Testament. End of Spinoza and the Bible by Matthew Arnold, Part 1《Spinoza and the Bible by Matthew Arnold, Part 2, read by Daniel Davison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Spinoza and the Bible Such, reduced to the briefest and plainest terms possible, stripped of the developments and proofs with which he delivers it, and divested of the metaphysical language in which much of it is clothed by him, is the doctrine of Spinoza's treatise on the interpretation of Scripture. By the whole scope and drift of its argument, by the spirit in which the subject is throughout treated, 
His work undeniably is most interesting and stimulating to the general culture of Europe. There are alleged contradictions in Scripture, and the question which the general culture of Europe, informed of this, asks with real interest is, what then? Spinoza addresses himself to this question. All secondary points of criticism he touches with the utmost possible brevity. He points out that Moses could never have written, and the Canaanite was then in the land because the Canaanite was in the land still at the death of Moses. He points out that Moses could never have written, There arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. He points out how such a passage as, These are the kings that reigned in Adam before there reigned any king over the children of Israel, clearly indicates an author writing not before the times of the kings. He points out how the account of Og's iron bedstead, only Og the king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Probably indicates an author writing after David had taken Rabath and found there abundance of spoil amongst it, the iron bedstead, the gigantic relic of another age. He points out how the language of this passage and of such a passage as that in the book of Samuel, before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer, for he that is now called prophet was aforetime called seer, is certainly the language of a writer describing the events of a long past age, and not the language of a contemporary. But he devotes to all this no more space than is absolutely necessary. He apologizes for delaying over such matters so long. Non est cor circa haec diu detinear, nolo tadiosa lectione lectorum detinere. For him, the interesting question is not whether the fanatical devotee of the letter is to continue for a longer or for a shorter time to believe that Moses sat in the land of Moab writing the description of his own death, but what he is to believe when he does not believe this. Is he to take for the guidance of his life a great gloss put upon the Bible by theologians who, not content with going mad themselves with Plato and Aristotle, want to make Christ and the prophets go mad with them too? Or the Bible itself? Is he to be presented by his national church with metaphysical formularies for his creed, or with the real fundamentals of Christianity? If with the former, religion will never produce its due fruits. A few elect will still be saved, but the vast majority of mankind will remain without grace and without good works, hateful and hating one another. Therefore he calls urgently upon governments to make the national church what it should be. This is the conclusion of the whole matter for him, a fervent appeal to the state to save us from the untoward generation of metaphysical article-makers. And therefore, anticipating Mr. Gladstone, he called his book The Church in Its Relations with the State. Such is really the scope of Spinoza's work. He pursues a great object and pursues it with signal ability. But it is important to observe that he nowhere gives his opinion about the Bible's fundamental character. He takes the Bible as it stands, as he might take the phenomena of nature, and he discusses it as he finds it. Revelation differs from natural knowledge, he says, not by being more divine or more certain than natural knowledge, but by being conveyed in a different way. It differs from it because it is a knowledge of which the laws of human nature considered in themselves alone cannot be the cause. What is really its cause, he says, we need not here inquire. Verum nec nobis iam opus des propheticae cognitionis causam scire. For we take scripture which contains this revelation as it stands and do not ask how it arose. Documentorum causus nihil curamus. Proceeding on this principle, Spinoza leaves the attentive reader somewhat baffled and disappointed. Clear as is his way of treating his subject, and remarkable as are the conclusions with which he presents us, he starts, we feel, from what is to him a hypothesis, and we want to know what he really thinks about this hypothesis. His greatest novelties are all within limits fixed for him by this hypothesis. 
He says that the voice which called Samuel was an imaginary voice. He says that the waters of the Red Sea retreated before a strong wind. He says that the Shunammite sun was revived by the natural heat of Elisha's body. He says that the rainbow, which was made a sign to Noah, appeared in the ordinary course of nature. Scripture itself rightly interpreted, says he, affirms all this. But he asserts that the divine voice which uttered the commandments on Mount Sinai was a real voice, a vera vox. He says indeed that this voice could not really give to the Israelites that proof which they imagined it gave to them of the existence of God, and that God on Sinai was dealing with the Israelites only according to their imperfect knowledge. Still, he asserts the divine voice to have been a real one. And for this reason, that we do violence to Scripture if we do not admit it to have been a real one. Nisi scripturae vim infere verimus, omnino concedendum est Israelitas verum vocem audivisse. The attentive reader wants to know what Spinoza himself thought about this vera vox and its possibility. He is much more interested in knowing this than in knowing what Spinoza considered scripture to affirm about the matter. The feeling of perplexity thus caused is not diminished by the language of the chapter on miracles. In this chapter Spinoza broadly affirms a miracle to be an impossibility but he himself contrasts the method of demonstration a priori by which he claims to have established this proposition with the method which he has pursued in treating of prophetic revelation. This revelation, he says, is a matter out of human reach, and therefore I was bound to take it as I found it. Monere volo me alia prosus methodo circa miracula pro cessisse, quam circa profetiam, quod etiam consulto feci, quia de profetia, quando quidem ipsa captum humanum superat, et quaestio mere theologica est, nihil affermare neque etiam scire poteram, in quo ipsa potissimum constiteret, nisi ex fundamentis revelatis. The reader feels that Spinoza, proceeding on the hypothesis, has presented him with the assertion of a miracle, and afterwards, proceeding a priori, has presented him with the assertion that a miracle is impossible. He feels that Spinoza does not adequately reconcile these two assertions by declaring that any event really miraculous, if found recorded in Scripture, must be a spurious addition made to Scripture by sacrilegious men. Is then, he asks, the vera vox of Mount Sinai, in Spinoza's opinion, a spurious addition made to scripture by sacrilegious men, or if not, how is it not miraculous? Spinoza, in his own mind, regarded the Bible as a vast collection of miscellaneous documents, many of them quite disparate, and not at all to be harmonized with others. Documents of unequal value and of varying applicability, some of them conveying ideas salutary for one time, others for another. But in the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, he by no means always deals in this free spirit with the Bible. Sometimes he chooses to deal with it in the spirit of the veriest worshipper of the letter. Sometimes he chooses to treat the Bible as if all its parts were, so to speak, equipolent to snatch an isolated text which suits his purpose, without caring whether it is annulled by the context, by the general drift of Scripture, or by other passages of more weight and authority. The great critic thus becomes voluntarily as uncritical as Exeter Hall. The Epicurean Solomon, whose Ecclesiastes, the Hebrew doctors, even after they had received it into the canon, forbade the young and weak-minded among their community to read, Spinoza quotes as of the same authority with the severe Moses. He uses promiscuously as documents of identical force, without discriminating between their essentially different character, the softened cosmopolitan teaching of the prophets of the captivity and the rigid national teaching of the instructors of Israel's youth. He is capable of extracting from a chance expression of Jeremiah the assertion of a speculative idea which Jeremiah certainly never entertained, and from which he would have recoiled in dismay, the idea, namely, that miracles are impossible, 
just as the ordinary Englishman can extract from God's words to Noah, be fruitful and multiply, an exhortation to himself to have a large family. Spinoza, I repeat, knew perfectly well what this verbal mode of dealing with a Bible was worth, but he sometimes uses it because of the hypothesis from which he set out, because of his having agreed to take Scripture as it stands and not to ask how it arose. No doubt the sagacity of Spinoza's rules for biblical interpretation, the power of his analysis of the contents of the Bible, the interest of his reflections on Jewish history are, in spite of this, very great and have an absolute worth of their own, independent of the silence or ambiguity of their author upon a point of cardinal importance. Few candid people will read his rules of interpretation without exclaiming that they are the very dictates of good sense that they have always believed in them, and without adding, after a moment's reflection, that they have passed their lives in violating them. And what can be more interesting than to find that perhaps the main cause of the decay of the Jewish polity was one of which, from our English Bible, which entirely mistranslates the 26th verse of the 20th chapter of Ezekiel, we hear nothing, the perpetual reproach of impurity and rejection cast upon the priesthood of the tribe of Levi? What can be more suggestive after Mr. Mill and Dr. Stanley have been telling us how great an element of strength to the Hebrew nation was the institution of prophets than to hear from the ablest of Hebrews how this institution seems to him to have been to his nation one of her main elements of weakness? No intelligent man can read the Tractatus Theologico Politicus without being profoundly instructed by it, but neither can he read it without feeling that, as a speculative work it is, to use a French military expression, in the air, that in a certain sense it is in want of a base and in want of supports, that this base and these supports are, at any rate, not to be found in the work itself, and, if they exist, must be sought for in other works of the author. The genuine speculative opinions of Spinoza, which the Tractatus Theologico Politicus but imperfectly reveals, may in his ethics and in his letters be found set forth clearly. It is, however, the business of criticism to deal with every independent work as with an independent whole, and instead of establishing between the Tractatus Theologico Politicus and the Ethics of Spinoza, a relation which Spinoza himself has not established, to seize in dealing with the Tractatus Theologico Politicus the important fact that this work has its source not in the axioms and definitions of the ethics, but in a hypothesis. The ethics are not yet translated into English, and I have not here to speak of them. Then will be the right time for criticism to try and seize the special character and tendencies of that remarkable work when it is dealing with it directly. The criticism of the ethics is far too serious a task to be undertaken incidentally, and merely as a supplement to the criticism of the Tractatus Theologico Politicus. Nevertheless, on certain governing ideas of Spinoza, which receive their systematic expression, indeed, in the ethics, and on which the Tractatus Theologico Politicus is not formally based, but which are yet never absent from Spinoza's mind in the composition of any work, which breathe through all his works, and fill them with a peculiar effect and power, I have a word or two to say. A philosopher's real power over mankind resides not in his metaphysical formulas, but in the spirit and tendencies which have led him to adopt those formulas. Spinoza's critic, therefore, has rather to bring to light that spirit and those tendencies of his author than to exhibit his metaphysical formulas. Propositions about substance pass by mankind at large like the idle wind, which mankind at large regards not. It will not even listen to a word about these propositions unless it first learns what their author was driving at with them, and finds that this object of his is one with which it sympathizes, one at any rate which commands its attention. And mankind is so far right that the object of the author is really, as has been said, that which is most important, that which sets all his work in motion, that which is the secret of his attraction for other minds, which, by different ways, pursue the same object. Mr. Moore, seeking for the cause of Goethe's great admiration for Spinoza, 
thinks that he finds it in Spinoza's Hebrew genius. He spoke of God, says Mr. Morris, as an actual being, to those who had fancied him a name in a book. The child of the circumcision had a message for Lessing and Goethe, which the pagan schools of philosophy could not bring. This seems to me, I confess, fanciful. An intensity and impressiveness which came to him from his Hebrew nature, Spinoza no doubt has, but the two things which are most remarkable about him, and by which, as I think, he chiefly impressed Goethe, seem to me not to come to him from his Hebrew nature at all. I mean his denial of final causes, and his Stoicism, a Stoicism not passive but active. For mine, like Goethe's, a mind profoundly impartial and passionately aspiring after the science, not of men only but of universal nature, the popular philosophy which explains all things by reference to man and regards universal nature as existing for the sake of man and even of certain classes of men was utterly repulsive. Unchecked, this philosophy would gladly maintain that the donkey exists in order that the invalid Christian may have donkey's milk before breakfast, and such such views of nature as this were exactly what Goethe's whole soul abhorred. Creation, he thought, should be made of sterner stuff. He desired to rest the donkey's existence on larger grounds. More than any philosopher who has ever lived, Spinoza satisfied him here. The full exposition of the counter-doctrine to the popular doctrine of final causes is to be found in the ethics but this denial of final causes was so essential an element of all Spinoza's thinking that we shall, as has been said already, find it in the work with which we are here concerned, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, and indeed permeating that work and all his works. From the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, one may take as good a general statement of this denial as any which is to be found in the ethics. Deus natorum de regit, Pro ut eius leges universales, non autem pro ut humanae naturae particulares leges exigunt, edioque deus non solius humane generis, sed totius naturae rationum habet. God directs nature according as the universal laws of nature, but not according as the particular laws of human nature require, and so God has regard not of the human race only, but of entire nature. And as a pendant to this denial by Spinoza of final causes comes his Stoicism. Non studemus ut natura nobis, sed contra ut nos naturae pareamus. Our desire is not that nature may obey us, but on the contrary, that we may obey nature. Here is a second source of his attractiveness for Goethe and Goethe is but the eminent representative of a whole order of minds whose admiration has made Spinoza's fame. Spinoza first impresses Goethe, and any man like Goethe, and then he composes him. First he fills and satisfies his imagination by the width and grandeur of his view of nature, and then he fortifies and stills his mobile, straining, passionate, poetic temperament by the moral lesson he draws from his view of nature, and a moral lesson not of mere resigned acquiescence, not of melancholy quietism, but of joyful activity within the limits of man's true sphere. Ipsa hominus essentia esconatus quo unus quisque suum esse conservare conator, virtus hominus est ipsa hominus essentia, quatenus a solo conatu suum esse conservande definitor, felicita seneo consistit quod homo suum esse conservare potest, laetitia est hominis transitio ad maiorum perfectionum, tristitia est hominis transitio ad minorum perfectionum. Man's very essence is the effort wherewith each man strives to maintain his own being. Man's virtue is this very essence, so far as it is defined by the single effort to maintain his own being. Happiness consists in a man's being able to maintain his own being. Joy is man's passage to a greater perfection, 
sorrow is man's passage to a lesser perfection. It seems to me that by neither of these his grand characteristic doctrines is Spinoza truly Hebrew or truly Christian. His denial of final causes is essentially alien to the spirit of the Old Testament, and his cheerful and self-sufficing Stoicism is essentially alien to the spirit of the New. The doctrine that God directs nature not according as the particular laws of human nature, but according as the universal laws of nature require, is at utter variance with that Hebrew mode of representing God's dealings, which make the locusts visit Egypt to punish Pharaoh's hardness of heart, and the falling dew avert itself from the fleece of Gideon. The doctrine that all sorrow is a passage to a lesser perfection is at utter variance with the Christian recognition of the blessedness of sorrow, working repentance to salvation not to be repented of, of sorrow which, in Dante's words, remarries us to God. Spinoza's repeated and earnest assertions that the love of God is man's summum bonum do not remove the fundamental diversity between his doctrine and the Hebrew and Christian doctrines. By the love of God, he does not mean the same thing which the Hebrew and Christian religions mean by the love of God. He makes the love of God to consist in the knowledge of God, and as we know God only through his manifestation of himself in the laws of all nature, it is by knowing these laws that we love God, and the more we know them, the more we love him. This may be true, but this is not what the Christian means by the love of God. Spinoza's ideal is the intellectual life. The Christian's ideal is the religious life. Between the two conditions there is all the difference which there is between the being in love and the following with delighted comprehension a reasoning of Plato. For Spinoza, undoubtedly the crown of the intellectual life is a transport, as for the saint the crown of the religious life is a transport. But the two transports are not the same. This is true, yet it is true also that by thus crowning the intellectual life with a sacred transport, by thus retaining in philosophy amid the discontented murmurs of all the army of atheism, the name of God, Spinoza maintains, a profound affinity with that which is truest in religion, and inspires an indestructible interest. One of his admirers, M. van Vlotten, has recently published at Amsterdam a supplementary volume to Spinoza's works containing the interesting document of Spinoza's sentence of excommunication from which I have already quoted, and containing besides several lately found works alleged to be Spinoza's which seem to me to be of doubtful authenticity, and even if authentic, of no great importance. M. van Vlotten, who let me be permitted to say in passing, writes a Latin which would make one think that the art of writing Latin must be now a lost art in the country of Lipsius, is very anxious that Spinoza's unscientific retention of the name of God should not afflict his readers with any doubts as to his perfect scientific orthodoxy. It is a great mistake, he cries, to disparage Spinoza as merely one of the dogmatists before Kant. By keeping the name of God, while he did away with his person and character, he has done himself an injustice. Those who look to the bottom of things will see that, long ago as he lived, he had even then reached the point to which the post-Hegelian philosophy and the study of natural science has only just brought our own times. Leibniz expressed his apprehension lest those who did away with final causes should do away with God at the same time. But it is in his having done away with final causes, and with God along with them, that Spinoza's true merit consists. Now it must be remarked that to use Spinoza's denial of final causes in order to identify him with the Corifae of atheism is to make a false use of Spinoza's denial of final causes, just as to use his assertion of the all-importance of loving God to identify him with the saints would be to make a false use of his assertion of the all-importance of loving God. He is no more to be identified with the post-Hegelian philosophers than he is to be identified with St. Augustine. Unction, indeed, Spinoza's writings have not. 
that name does not precisely fit any quality which they exhibit. And yet, so all-important in the sphere of religious thought is the power of edification, that in this sphere a great fame like Spinoza's can never be founded without it. A court of literature can never be very severe to Voltaire. With that inimitable wit and clear sense of his, he cannot write a page in which the fullest head may not find something suggestive. Still, because handling religious ideas, he yet, with all his wit and clear sense, handles them wholly without the power of edification, his fame as a great man is equivocal. Strauss, has treated the question of scripture miracles with an acuteness and fullness which even to the most informed minds is instructive, but because he treats it wholly without the power of edification, his fame as a serious thinker is equivocal. But in Spinoza there is not a trace either of Voltaire's passion for mockery or of Strauss's passion for demolition. His whole soul was filled with desire of the love and knowledge of God, and of that only. Philosophy always proclaims herself on the way to the summum bonum, but too often on the road she seems to forget her destination, and suffers her hearers to forget it also. Spinoza never forgets his destination. The love of God is man's highest happiness and blessedness, and the final end and aim of all human actions— the supreme reward for keeping God's word is that word itself, namely, to know him and with free will and pure and constant heart love him. These sentences are the keynote to all he produced and were the inspiration of all his labors. This is why he turns so sternly upon the worshippers of the letter, the editors of the Masera, the editor of the record, because their doctrine imperils our love and knowledge of God. What, he cries, our knowledge of God to depend upon these perishable things, which Moses can dash to the ground and break to pieces like the first tables of stone, or of which the originals can be lost like the original book of the covenant, like the original book of the law of God, like the book of the wars of God, which can come to us confused, imperfect, miswritten by copyists, tampered with by doctors, and you accuse others of impiety. It is you who are impious, to believe that God would commit the treasure of the true record of himself to any substance less enduring than the heart. And Spinoza's life was not unworthy of this elevated strain. A philosopher who professed that knowledge was its own reward, a devotee who professed that the love of God was its own reward, this philosopher and this devotee believed in what he said. Spinoza led a life, the most spotless perhaps to be found among the lives of the philosophers. He lived simple, studious, even-tempered, kind, declining honors, declining riches, declining notoriety. He was poor, and his admirer, Simon de Vries, sent him two thousand florins. He refused them. The same friend left him his fortune. He returned it to the heir. He was asked to dedicate one of his works to the magnificent patron of letters in his century, Louis the Fourteenth. He declined. His great work, his ethics, published after his death, he gave injunctions to his friends to publish anonymously, for fear he should give his name to a school. Truth, he thought, should bear no man's name. And finally, unless, he said, I had known that my writings would in the end advance the cause of true religion, I would have suppressed them. Tacuissem. It was in this spirit that he lived, and this spirit gives to all he writes not exactly unction, I have already said so, but a kind of sacred solemnity. Not of the same order as the saints, he yet follows the same service. Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Therefore he has been, in a certain sphere, edifying, and has inspired in many powerful minds an interest and an admiration such as no other philosopher has inspired since Plato. The lonely precursor of German philosophy, he still shines when the light of his successors is fading away. They had celebrity. Spinoza has fame, not because his peculiar system of philosophy has had more adherents than theirs. On the contrary, it has had fewer. But schools of philosophy arise and fall. Their bands of adherents inevitably dwindle. 
No master can long persuade a large body of disciples that they give to themselves just the same account of the world as he does. It is only the very young and the very enthusiastic who can think themselves sure that they possess the whole mind of Plato or Spinoza or Hegel at all. The very mature and the very sober can even hardly believe that these philosophers possessed it themselves enough to put it all into their works and to let us know entirely how the world seemed to them. What a remarkable philosopher really does for human thought is to throw into circulation a certain number of new and striking ideas and expressions and to stimulate with them the thought and imagination of his century or of after times. So Spinoza has made his distinction between adequate and inadequate ideas a current notion for educated Europe. So Hegel seized a single pregnant sentence of Heraclitus and cast it with a thousand striking applications into the world of modern thought. But to do this is only enough to make a philosopher noteworthy. It is not enough to make him great. To be great he must have something in him which can influence character, which is edifying, he must, in short, have a noble and lofty character himself, a character to recur to that much-criticized expression of mine in the grand style. This is what Spinoza had, and because he had it, he stands out from the multitude of philosophers and has been able to inspire in powerful minds a feeling which the most remarkable philosophers, without this grandiose character, could not inspire. There is no possible view of life but Spinoza's, said Lessing. Goethe has told us how he was calmed and edified by him in his youth, and how he again went to him for support in his maturity. Heine, the man in spite of his faults, of truest genius that Germany has produced since Goethe, a man with faults, as I have said, immense faults, the greatest of them being that he could reverence so little, reverence Spinoza, Hegel's influence ran off him like water. I have seen Hegel, he cries, seated with his doleful air of a hatching hen upon his unhappy eggs, and I have heard his dismal clucking. How easily one can cheat oneself into thinking that one understands everything when one has learnt only how to construct dialectical formulas. But of Spinoza, Heine said, his life was a copy of the life of his divine kinsman, Jesus Christ. And therefore, when M. van Floten violently presses the parallel with the post-Hegelians, one feels that the parallel with St. Augustine is the far truer one. Compared with the soldier of ill religion, M. van Floten would have him to be Spinoza is religious. It is true, one may say to the wise and devout Christian, Spinoza's conception of beatitude is not yours and cannot satisfy you. But whose conception of beatitude would you accept as satisfying? Not even that of the devoutest of your fellow Christians. Fra Angelico, the sweetest and most inspired of devout souls, has given us, in his great picture of the Last Judgment, his conception of beatitude. The elect are going round in a ring on long grass under laden fruit trees. Two of them, more restless than the others, are flying up a battlemented street, a street blank, with all the ennui of the Middle Ages. Across a gulf is visible for the delectation of the saints a blazing cauldron in which Beelzebub is sousing the damned. This is hardly more your conception of beatitude than Spinoza's is. But in my father's house are many mansions. Only to reach any one of these mansions there are needed the wings of a genuine sacred transport of an immortal longing. These wings Spinoza had, and because he had them, his own language about himself, about his aspirations and his course are true. His foot is in the vera vita, his eye on the beatific vision. End of Spinoza and the Bible by Matthew Arnold This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Story of Crisco from A Calendar of Dinners with 615 Recipes by Marion Harris Neal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction The word fat is one of the most interesting in food chemistry. It is the great energy producer. John C. Olson, A.M., Ph.D., in his book, Pure Food, states that fats furnish half the total energy obtained by human beings from their food. The three primary, solid cooking fats today are butter, lard, crisco. There are numbers of substitutes for these, such as butterine, oleomargarine, and lard compounds. The following pages contain a story of unusual interest to you, for you eat. The Story of Crisco The culinary world is revising its entire cookbook on account of the advent of Crisco, a new and altogether different cooking fat. Many wonder that any product could gain the favor of cooking experts so quickly. A few months after the first package was marketed, practically every grocer of the better class in the United States was supplying women with the new product. This was largely because four classes of people, housewives, chefs, doctors, dietitians, were glad to be shown a product which at once would make for more digestible foods, more economical foods, and better tasting foods. Cooking and History Cooking methods have undergone a marked change during the past few years. The nation's food is becoming more and more wholesome as a result of different discoveries, new sources of supply, and the intelligent weighing of values. Domestic science is better understood and more appreciated. People of the present century are fairer to their stomachs, realizing that their health largely depends upon this faithful and long-suffering servant. Digestion and disposition sound much the same, but a good disposition often is wrecked by a poor digestion. America has been termed a country of dyspeptics. It is being changed to a land of healthy eaters, consequently happier individuals. Every agent responsible for this national digestive improvement must be gratefully recognized. It seems strange to many that there can be anything better than butter for cooking, or of greater utility than lard, and the advent of Crisco has been a shock to the older generation, born in an age less progressive than our own, and prone to contend that the old-fashioned things are good enough. But these good folk, when convinced, are the greatest enthusiasts. Grandmother was glad to give up the fatiguing spinning wheel. So the modern woman is glad to stop cooking with expensive butter, animal lard, and their inadequate substitutes. And so, the nation's cookbook has been hauled out and is being revised. Upon thousands of pages, the words lard and butter have been crossed out and the word Crisco written in their place. A Need Anticipated Great foresight was shown in the making of Crisco. The quality, as well as the quantity, of lard was diminishing steadily in the face of a growing population. Prices were rising. The high cost of living was an oft-repeated phrase. Also, our country was outgrowing its supply of butter. What was needed, therefore, was not a substitute, but something better than these fats, some product which not only would accomplish as much in cookery, but a great deal more. When, therefore, Crisco was perfected, and it was shown that here finally was an altogether new and better fat, cookery experts were quick to show their appreciation. In reading the following pages, think of Crisco as a primary cooking fat or shortening, with even more individuality, because it does greater things, than all others. Man's Most Important Food, Fat no other food supplies our bodies with the drive, the vigor, which fat gives. No other food has been given so little study in proportion to its importance. Here are some interesting facts, yet few housewives are acquainted with them. Fat contains more than twice the amount of energy-yielding power, or calorific value, of proteids, or carbohydrates. One half our physical energy is from the fat we eat in different forms. The excellent book, 
Food and Cookery for the Sick and Convalescent, by Fanny Merritt Farmer, states, quote, In the diet of children, at least, a deficiency of fat cannot be replaced by an excess of carbohydrates and that fat seems to play some part in the formation of young tissues which cannot be undertaken by any other constituent of food. End quote. The book entitled The Chemistry of Cooking and Cleaning by the two authorities, Ellen H. Richards and S. Maria Elliott, states that the diet of school children should be regulated carefully with the fat supply in view. Girls especially show at times a dislike for fat. It therefore is necessary that the fat which supplies their growing bodies with energy should be in the purest and most inviting form, and should be one that their digestions welcome, rather than repel. The first step in the digestion of fat is its melting. Crisco melts at a lower degree of heat than body temperature. Because of its low melting point, thus allowing the digestive juices to mix with it, and because of its vegetable origin and its purity, Crisco is the easiest of all cooking fats to digest. When a fat smokes in frying, it breaks down, that is, its chemical composition is changed. Part of its altered composition becomes a non-digestible and irritating substance. The best fat for digestion is one which does not decompose or break down at frying temperature. Crisco does not break down until a degree of heat is reached above the frying point. In other words, Crisco does not break down at all in normal frying, because it is not necessary to have it smoking hot for frying. No part of it, therefore, has been transformed in cooking into an irritant. That is one reason why the stomach welcomes Crisco and carries forward its digestion with ease. Working Towards an Ideal a part of the preliminary work done in connection with the development of Crisco, described in these pages, consisted of the study of the older cooking fats. The objectionable features of each were considered. The good was weighed against the bad. The strength and weakness of each was determined. Thus was found what the ideal fat should possess and what it should not possess. It must have every good quality and no bad one. After years of study, a process was discovered which made possible the ideal fat. The process involved the changing of the composition of vegetable food oils and the making of the richest fat or solid cream. The Crisco process at the first stage of its development gave at least the basis of the ideal fat, namely a pure vegetable product differing from all others in that absolutely no animal fat had to be added to the vegetable oil to produce the proper stiffness. This was but one of the many distinctive advantages sought and found. Not marketed until perfect. It also solved the problem of eliminating certain objectionable features of fats in general, such as rancidity, color, odor, smoking properties when heated. These weaknesses, therefore, were not a part of this new fat, which it would seem was the parent of the ideal. Then, after four years of severe tests, after each weakness was replaced with strength, the government was given this fat to analyze and classify. The report was that it answered to none of the tests for fats already existing. A Primary Fat it was neither a butter, a compound, nor a substitute, but an entirely new product, a primary fat. In 1911, it was named Crisco and placed on the market. Today you buy this rich, wholesome cream of nutritious food oils in sanitary tins. The Crisco process alone can produce this creamy white fat, no one else can manufacture Crisco because no one else holds the secret of Crisco, and because they would have no legal right to make it. Crisco is Crisco and nothing else. Finally, economical. At first, it looked very much as if Crisco must be a high-priced product. It cost its discoverers many thousands of dollars before ever a package reached the consumer's kitchen. Crisco was not offered for sale as a substitute or for housewives to buy only to save money. 
the chief point emphasized was that crisco was a richer more wholesome food fat for cooking naturally therefore it was good news to all when crisco was found also to be more economical crisco is more economical than lard in another way it makes richer pastry than lard and one-fifth less can be used furthermore it can be used over and over again in frying all manner of foods and because foods absorbs so little crisco is in reality more economical even than lard of mediocre quality the price of crisco is lower than the average price of the best pale lard throughout the year crisco's manufacture it would be difficult to imagine surroundings more appetizing than those in which crisco is manufactured it is made in a building devoted exclusively to the manufacture of this one product in sparkling bright rooms cleanly uniformed employees make and pack crisco the floors are of a special tile composition the walls are of white glazed tile which are washed regularly white enamel covers metal surfaces where nickel plating cannot be used sterilized machines handle the oil and the finished product no hand touches crisco until in your own kitchen the sanitary can is opened disclosing the smooth richness the cream-like appetizing consistency of the product the banishment of that lardy taste in foods it was the earnest aim of the makers of crisco to produce a strictly vegetable product without adding a hard and consequently indigestible animal fat there is today a pronounced partiality from a health standpoint to a vegetable fat and the lardy greasy taste of food resulting from the use of animal fat never has been in such disfavor as during the past few years so crisco is absolutely all vegetable no stearine animal or vegetable is added it possesses no taste nor odor save the delightful and characteristic aroma which identifies crisco and is suggestive of its purity explanation of hidden food flavors when the dainty shadings of taste are overshadowed by a lardy flavor the true taste of the food itself is lost we miss the hidden or natural taste of the food crisco has a peculiar power of bringing out the very best in food flavors even the simplest foods are allowed a delicacy of flavor take gingerbread for example the real ginger taste is there the true molasses and spice flavors are brought out or just plain everyday fried potatoes many never knew what the real potato taste was before eating potatoes fried in crisco fried chicken has a newness of taste not known before new users of crisco should try these simple foods first and later take up the preparation of more elaborate dishes butter ever popular for seasoning in cooking the use of butter ever will be largely a matter of taste some people have a partiality for the butter flavor which after all is largely the salt mixed with the fat close your eyes and eat some fresh unsalted butter note that it is practically tasteless crisco contains richer food elements than butter as crisco is richer containing no moisture one-fifth or one-fourth less can be used in each recipe crisco always is uniform because it is a manufactured fat whose quality and purity can be controlled it works perfectly into any dough making the crust or loaf even textured it keeps sweet and pure indefinitely in the ordinary room temperature keep your parlor and your kitchen strangers kitchen odors are out of place in the parlor when frying with crisco as before explained it is not necessary to heat the fat to smoking temperature ideal frying is accomplished without bringing crisco to its smoking point on the other hand it is necessary to heat lard smoking hot before it is of the proper frying temperature remember also that when lard smokes and fills the house with its strong odor certain constituents have been changed chemically to those which irritate the sensitive membranes of the alimentary canal 
Crisco does not smoke until it reaches 455 degrees, a heat higher than is necessary for frying. You need not wait for Crisco to smoke. Consequently, the house will not fill with smoke, nor will there be black, burnt specks in fried foods, as often there are when you use lard for frying. Crisco gives up its heat very quickly to the food submerged in it, and a tender, brown crust almost instantly forms, allowing the inside of the potatoes, croquettes, doughnuts, etc., to become baked rather than soaked. The same Crisco can be used for frying fish, onions, potatoes, or any other food. Crisco does not take up food flavors or odors. After frying each food, merely strain out the food particles. We all eat raw fats. The shortening fat in pastry or baked foods is merely distributed throughout the dough. No chemical change occurs during the baking process. So when you eat pie or hot biscuit, in which animal lard is used, you eat raw animal lard. The shortening used in all baked foods, therefore, should be just as pure and wholesome as if you were eating it like butter upon bread. Because Crisco digests with such ease, and because it is a pure vegetable fat, all those who realize the above fact regarding pastry making are now won over to Crisco. A hint as to Crisco's purity is shown by this simple test. Break open a hot biscuit in which Crisco has been used. You will note a sweet fragrance which is most inviting. A few years ago, if you had told dyspeptic men and women that they could eat pie at the evening meal and that distress would not follow, probably they would have doubted you. Hundreds of instances of Crisco's healthfulness have been given by people who at one time have been denied such foods as pastry, cake, and fried foods, but who now eat these rich yet digestible Crisco dishes. You, or any other normally healthy individual whose digestion does not relish greasy foods, can eat rich pie crust. The richness is there, but not the unpleasant after effects. Crisco digests readily. The Importance of Giving Children Crisco Foods A good digestion will mean much to the youngster's health and character. A man seldom seems to be stronger than his stomach, for indigestion handicaps him in his accomplishment of big things. As more attention is given to present feeding, less attention need be given to future doctoring. Equip your children with good stomachs by giving them wholesome Crisco foods, foods which digest with ease. They may eat the rich things they enjoy and find them just as digestible as many apparently simple foods if Crisco be used properly. They may eat Crisco donuts or pie without being chased by nightmares. Sweet dreams follow the Crisco supper. The Great Variety of Crisco Foods there are thousands of Crisco dishes. It is impossible to know the exact number because Crisco is used for practically every cooking purpose. Women daily tell us of new uses they have found for Crisco. Many women begin by using Crisco in simple ways, for frying, for baking in place of lard. Soon, however, they learn that Crisco also takes the place of butter, Butter richness without butter expense, say the thousands of Crisco users. Tasty scalloped dishes, salad dressing, rich pastry, fine-grained cake, sauces, and hundreds of other dishes, where butter formerly was used, now are prepared with Crisco. A woman can throw out more with a teaspoon than a man can bring home in a wagon. Kitchen expense comes by the spoonful. Think of the countless spoonfuls of expensive butter used daily, where economical Crisco would accomplish the same results at one-third the cost. It should be remembered that one-fifth less Crisco than butter may be used, because Crisco is richer than butter. The moisture, salt, and curd which butter contains to the extent of about 20% are not found in Crisco, which is all 100% shortening. Remember also that Crisco will average a lower price per pound throughout the year than the best pale lard. 
and you can use less Crisco than lard, which is a further saving. Brief, Interesting Facts Crisco is being used in an increasing number of the better class hotels, clubs, restaurants, dining cars, ocean liners. Crisco has been demonstrated and explained upon the Chautauqua platform by domestic science experts, these lectures being a part of the regular course. Domestic science teachers recommend Crisco to their pupils and use it in their classes and lecture demonstrations. Many high schools having domestic science departments use Crisco. Crisco has taken the place of butter and lard in a number of hospitals where purity and digestibility are of vital importance. Crisco is kosher. Rabbi Margulies of New York said that the Hebrew race had been waiting 4,000 years for Crisco. It conforms to the strict dietary laws of the Jews. It is what is known in the Hebrew language as a parava, or neutral fat. Crisco can be used with both milchig and fleichig, milk and flesh, foods. Campers find Crisco helpful in many ways. Hot climates have little effect upon its wholesomeness. It is convenient, a handy package to pack, and does not melt so quickly in transit. One can of Crisco can be used to fry fish, eggs, potatoes, and to make hot biscuits merely by straining out the food particles after each frying and pouring the Crisco back into the can to harden to proper consistency before the biscuit making. Practically every grocer who has a good trade in Crisco uses it in his own home. Crisco is sold by net weight. You pay only for the Crisco, not the can. Find the net weight of what you have been using. Bread and cake keep fresh and moist much longer when Crisco is used. Women have written that they use empty Crisco tins for canning vegetables and fruits, and as receptacles for kitchen and pantry use. Crisco's Manufacture Scientifically Explained To understand something of the Crisco process, it is necessary first to know that there are three main constituents in all the best edible oils, linoline, oleine, stearine. The chemical difference between these three components is solely in the percentage of hydrogen contained, and it is possible by the addition of hydrogen to transform one component into another. Though seemingly so much alike, there is a marked difference in the physical properties of these components. Linoline, which has the lowest percentage of hydrogen, is unstable and tends to turn rancid. Oleine is stable and has no tendency to turn rancid and is easily digested. Stearine is both hard and digestible. The Crisco process adds enough hydrogen to change almost all the linoline into nourishing digestible oleine. Mark well the difference in manufacture between Crisco and lard compounds. In producing a lard compound, to the linoline, oleine, and stearine of the original oil is added more stearine, usually animal, the hard, indigestible fat, in order to bring up the hardness of the oil. The resultant compound is indigestible and very liable to become rancid. The following pages contain 615 recipes which have been tested by domestic science authorities in the cooking departments of different colleges and other educational institutions, and by housewives in their own kitchens. Many have been originated by Marion Harris Neal, and all have been tested by her. We have undertaken to submit a comprehensive list of recipes for your use which will enable you to serve menus of wide variety. We hope that you have enjoyed reading this little volume, and that you will derive both help and satisfaction from the recipes. We will go to any length to help you in the cause of better food. We realize that women must study this product as they would any other altogether new article of cookery, and that the study and care used will be amply repaid by the palatability and healthfulness of all foods. A can of Crisco is no Aladdin's lamp, which merely need be touched by a kitchen spoon to produce magical dishes. But any woman is able to achieve excellent results 
by mixing thought with Crisco. Let us know how you progress. Yours respectfully, the Procter Gamble Distributing Company of Canada Limited. End of The Story of Crisco From A Calendar of Dinners with 615 Recipes by Marion Harris Neal